Section 13 of Celebrated Women Travelers of the 19th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Women Travelers of the 19th Century by W. H. Davenport Adams. Madame de Barbalon. We must not omit from our chronicle of female travelers the name of Madame Catherine de Bourboulon. Of her biography, we know no more than that a Scotchwoman by birth, she married a French diplomatist, who in 1860 was serving the state as French ambassador to the court of Peking. In the month of August, 1860, she was temporarily residing at Shanghai, it would be interesting to know what the Chinese people thought of this handsome and self-possessed lady, unaccustomed as they were, and are, to visits from European women, and unfamiliar as they were, and are, with the idea that a person of the Grand Monday in no wise compromises her dignity by travelling about as freely and walking as readily as servants and females of the lower classes. To see ourselves as others see us is always instructive and interesting, and a sketch of Madame de Bourboulon by the Chinese would not be less valuable than a sketch of the Chinese by Madame de Bourboulon. Fortune had not been kind to Madame de Bourboulon, in throwing her into Shanghai during the great Taiping conspiracy, and compelling her to be an eyewitness of the crimes which sullied it. Beneath her windows were carried every day the dead bodies of the poor creatures massacred by the Taipings, and she followed with reluctant gaze these sad waifs and strays as the river conveyed them seawards. Though her health was not good, she hastened on the conclusion of peace to follow her husband to Peking. From Shanghai to the Gulf of Pechili, into which the Paiho empties its waters, the distance is two hundred leagues. Our traveller embarked on board the steam dispatch boat Filong, which was escorted by a man-of-war brig. On crossing the river bar, she saw before her the celebrated Taku forts, and higher up the river the town of Peitang, with immense plains of sorghum maize and millet spreading as far as the eye could see. On the 12th of November she arrived at Tsintsin. The French legation was established in a rich Yamon, which under the presiding genius of Madame de Bourboulon soon became the highly recherche centre of European society. There, Chinese art displayed all its marvels of design and workmanship. The colours of the rainbow glittered everywhere. The walls were emblazoned with pleasant landscapes, azure seas, transparent lakes, shadowy forests, an imperial hunting party with antelopes and roebucks flying before the loud-mouthed hounds. In a word, with all the delights of a Chinese earthly paradise. But Madame de Bourboulon did not confine herself to social pleasures. Her heart and hand were ever ready for charitable labors, and the Chinese poor had ample occasion to acknowledge her beneficence. Among other works of mercy, she adopted a young orphan girl, of whom she says, my little companion eats well and sleeps well. She is full of mirth, and seems neither to remember nor to care for the terrible catastrophe which separated her from her parents, massacred at the capture of Peitang. Her feet are not yet completely deformed. However, when we remove the bandages which compresses them, she does not forget to replace them at night. It is not only in China that coquetry or fashion stimulates its victims to torture and disfigure God's handiwork. The unnaturally small feet of the Chinese women are at least not more injurious or unsightly than the unnaturally small waists of the ladies of Europe. 
what the chinese think of their women may be inferred from a characteristic incident of which madame de bourboulon is the narrator the cook of the embassy kai tsin was a man with more years than gallantry one day he went to see his wives and children who resided at some distance on his return madame de bourboulon put some questions to him respecting his family the wives he replied in his bad french and with an air of sovereign contempt pa bon pa bon bamboo bamboo the stick seems to be the only or at least the favorite argument of the chinese in their dealings with the other sex and in this contempt for women we shall probably find the cause of the moral rottenness of the celestial empire the winter of eighteen sixty to sixty one madame de bourboulon spent quietly at tientsin her health not permitting her in such rigorous weather to make the journey to pekin but on the twenty second of march the whole legation set out for the chinese capital madame de bourboulon travelling in a litter attended by her physician fortunately the change of air and scene in the easy movement gradually restored her physical energies. From Tianjin to Pekin, the distance is about thirty leagues. On the road lies Changkiawang, the scene of the treacherous outrage in 1858 on the French and English bearers of truce. And almost at the gates of Pekin, the great town of Tungqiao and the famous bridge of Palikao, where on the twenty first of september eighteen sixty the anglo-french army defeated twenty five thousand tartar horsemen this bridge a curious work of art measures one hundred and fifty yards in length and thirty in breadth the marble balustrades are skilfully carved and surmounted by marble lions in the chinese taste on arriving at Pekin, the French embassy was installed in the Tartar quarter. Five months later, the revolution broke out, which placed Prince Kung in power. The prince was well disposed towards Europeans, and under his rule, Madame de Bourboulon was able to traverse Pekin without fear. We subjoined some extracts from her journals. I set out on horseback this morning she says, accompanied by Sir Frederick Bruce and my husband, to make a tour of the Chinese town. Our escort consisted only of four European horsemen and two Ting Chai. We arrived at a populous carrefour which derived a peculiar character from the large numbers of country people who flock there to dispose of all kinds of provisions, but particularly game and vegetables heaps of cabbages and onions rise almost to the height of the doors of the houses the peasants seated on the ground smoke their pipes in peace while the aged mules and bare-skinned asses which have conveyed their wares wander about the market-place gleaning here and there some vegetable refuse at every step the townsfolk with indifferent bearing and armed with a fan to protect their wan and powdered complexion jostle against the robust copper-coloured country people whose feet are thrust into sandals and their heads covered with large straw hats not knowing how to guide our horses through the midst of this confused mob we gained the precincts of the police pavilion in the hope of enjoying a little more tranquillity we had been there a few moments only when my horse showed a determined unwillingness to remain evidently something had frightened him I raised my head mechanically, and thought I should have fainted before the horrible spectacle which struck my eyes. Behind us, close at hand, was a row of posts, to which were fixed cross-beams of wood, and in each cage were death's heads which stared at me with fixed, wide-open eyes, their jaws dislocated with a frightful grimace, their teeth set convulsively by the agony of the last moment, and the blood rolling drop by drop from their freshly severed necks. 
in a second we had spurred our horses to the gallop to get out of sight of this hideous charnel house of which i long continued to think in my sleepless nights turning to the left we entered a street which i will call in allusion to the trade of its inhabitants the toymen's but what means this noisy music and the shivery of flutes and trumpets drums and stringed instruments it is a funeral ceremony and yonder is the door of the defunct and in front of it the society of funerals there is such a one at peking has raised a triumphal arch consisting of a wooden framework covered with old mats and pieces of stuffs the family has stationed a band at the door to proclaim its grief by rending the ears of the passers-by we quicken our steps in order to avoid being delayed in the middle of the interminable procession the gala day in a chinaman's life is the day of his death he economizes he deprives himself of all the comforts of life he labors without rest or intermission that he may have a fine funeral we do not get out of this accursed street here another large crowd bars our passage some proclamations and notices have just been placarded on the door of the chief of the district police people are reading them aloud some declaim them in a tone of bombast while a thousand commentaries more satirical than the text are uttered amidst loud bursts of laughter this liberty of mockery pasquinade and caricature at the expense of the mandarins is one of the most original sides of chinese manners a band of blind beggars in a costume more than light pass along hand in hand then an itinerant smith a barber al fresco and a cheap restaurateur simultaneously ply their different trades surrounded by their customers we dismounted from our horses and by a covered passage or arcade proceeded on foot to the legation this passage much favored by vendors of bric-a-brac is simply a dark lane five hundred and fifty to six hundred feet long where two people can hardly walk abreast there are no proper shops here but collections of old planks united anyhow and supported by piles of merchandise of all kinds vases porcelain bronzes arms old clothes pipes from the whole proceeds a fetid and insupportable odor tempered by the thick pungent smoke of lamps fed with rice oil the reader may judge with what pleasure we regained the pure air the blue sky and all the comfortable appliances of our quarters at sing kung fu having made the journey from china to europe five times by sea madame de bourboulon and her husband resolved that their sixth should be by land being desirous of rendering some direct service to science by penetrating into regions of which little was known this overland route as they foresaw would involve them in many difficulties fatigues and hardships it would impose on them a journey of six thousand miles in the midst of half-savage populations and over steppes and deserts virtually pathless they would have to climb steep mountain sides to ford broad rivers and finally to sleep under no better roof than that of a tent and to live on milk butter and sea biscuit for several months madame de balusek wife of the russian minister at pekin had already accomplished this journey madame de bourboulon felt capable of an equal amount of courage and though accustomed to live amid all the luxuries and comforts of european civilization desired to encounter these privations and to brave these perils prince kung regent of the chinese empire promised the travellers full security as far as the borders he did more for he attached to their train some mandarins of high rank to ensure the execution of his orders 
a fortnight before the day fixed for departure a caravan of camels was dispatched to kiakta on the russian frontier with wine rice and all kinds of provisions intended to replace the supplies which would necessarily be exhausted during the transit of mongolia a captain of engineers monsieur bovier superintended the construction of some vehicles of transport light enough to be drawn by the nomad horsemen and yet solid enough to bear the accidents of travel in the desert bread biscuit coffee tea wine liqueurs all kinds of clothing preserved meats and vegetables were carefully packed up and stowed away in these carts which were sent forward three days in advance to Kalgan, a frontier of mongolia all these preparations being completed and every precaution taken seventeenth of may was appointed as the day of departure thenceforth and throughout the journey madame de bourboulon adapted a masculine costume that is a vest of grey cloth with velvet trimmings loose pantaloons of blue stuff spurred boots and at need a mongolian cloak with double hood of furs she mounted her favourite horse which she had taken with her to pekin and it had been her companion in all her excursions in the city and the surrounding country at six o'clock in the morning everybody was assembled in the court of the yamun of the french legation sir frederick bruce the english minister mr wade the secretary to the english legation monsieur treves a french naval lieutenant and some young french interpreters were present two chinese mandarins one with the red button the other his inferior in rank with the white gravely awaited the moment of departure to escort the travellers as far as Calgan, and to take care that upon requisition being made they were provided with everything necessary to their comfort numerous ching tai the official messengers of the legations and other indigenous domestics crowded the court gravely mounted upon foundered broken-down hacks their knees raised up to their elbows and their hands clutching at the mane of their rosinante like apes astride of dogs in the arena of the circus a couple of litters carried by mules were also prepared one was intended for madame de bourboulon in case of need the other for the conveyance of five charming little chinese dogs which she hoped to transport to europe at length the mandarin of the red button came to the ambassador's orders and gave the signal of departure at this moment the air resounded with noisy detonations fusees serpents and petards exploded in all directions at the gate in the gardens even upon the walls of the legation great confusion followed as no one was prepared for this point-blank politeness so mysteriously organized by the chinese servants in china nothing takes place without a display of fireworks about an hour was spent in reorganizing the caravan meanwhile madame de bourboulon whose frightened horse had carried her through the town waited in a great open space some distance off it was the first time she says that she had been alone in the midst of that great town she had succeeded in pulling up her horse near a pagoda which she did not know because she had never visited that quarter of pekin her masculine garb attracted curiosity and she was speedily surrounded by an immense crowd though its demeanour towards her was peaceable and respectful she found the time very long and it was with intense satisfaction she rejoined the cavalcade the members of which had begun to feel alarmed at her absence the whole company being once more reunited they passed the walled enclosure of the great city garrisoned by a body of the so-called imperial tigers and entered the northern suburb the great road of mongolia is lined on both sides with pagodas houses 
and a host of small wayside public inns painted with stripes of red green and blue and surmounted by the most attractive signs there is a constant succession of caravans of camels directed by mongols turkomans tibetans of troops of mules with clinking bells bringing salt from sichuan or tea from haupai and of immense herds of horned cattle horses and sheep in charge of the dexterous horsemen of the chakar who keep them together by the utterance of loud guttural cries and by dealing them smart cuts with their long whips about one hour afternoon the caravan arrived at shaho a village situated between the two arms of a river of the same name which means the river of sand madame de bourboulon thus describes the hospitable reception given to the travellers we knocked at the door of a tolerably spacious house situated near the entrance to the village it was an elementary school we could hear the nasal drone of the children repeating their lessons the schoolmaster a crabbed chinaman scared by my presence placed himself on the threshold and looked as if he would not allow me to enter but at the explanations made in good chinese by mr wade the sorely old fellow undergoing a sudden metamorphosis bent his lean spine in two and ushered me in with many forced obeisances into his wife's room there before i had time to recollect myself these ladies carried me off by force of arms and installed me upon a kang or couch where i had scarcely stretched my limbs before i was offered the inevitable tea i was gradually passing into a delightful dizziness when a disquieting thought suddenly restored all my energy i was lying on a heap of rags and tatters of all colours and certainly the kang possessed other inhabitants than myself i immediately arose in spite of the protestations of my chinese hostesses and took a seat in the courtyard under the galleries when i was a little rested i seated myself in my litter at about half past six in the evening we arrived at the town of cheng ping chan on the following day our travellers turned aside to visit the famous sepulchre of the mings a vast collection of monuments which the chinese regard as one of the finest specimens of the art of the seventeenth century that is the seventeenth century of their chronology and first there are gigantic monoliths crowned with twelve stones placed perpendicularly and surmounted by five roofs and varnished in gilded tiles next a monumental triumphal arch in white marble with three immense gateways through the central one may be seen a double row of gigantic monsters in enameled stone painted in dazzling colors finally you pass into an enclosure with a gigantic tortoise in front of it bearing on its back a marble obelisk covered with inscriptions at the time of madame de bourboulin's visit the entrance was closed and while the ting chai went in search of the guardians she and her companions dismounted seated themselves on the greensward in the shadow of some colossal larches and enjoyed a pleasant repast the sepulchral stones serving as tables oh she exclaims ye old emperors of the ancient dynasties if any of your seers could but have told you that one day the barbarians of the remote west whose despised name had scarcely reached your ears would come to disturb the peace of your manes with the clinking of their glasses and the report of their champagne corks but at length the keys are turned and the rusty locks the guardian of the first enclosure offers us tea and we distribute some money among the attendants in china perhaps more even than in europe this is an inevitable formula the famous principle of nothing for nothing must have been invented in the celestial empire out of respect or for some other reason the guardians left us free 
to go and come at will, dispensing with the labor of following us. At first we traversed a spacious square court, paved with white marble, planted with yews and cypresses cut into shapes as at Versailles, and peopled with an infinite number of statues. Then we climbed a superb marble staircase of thirty steps, which led to another square court, planted in the same style, and shut in on the right and left by a thick forest of huge cedars, which conceals eight temples with circular cupolas, crowned and ornamented by the grimacing gods of the Chinese trinity with their six arms and six heads. Now another staircase, leading to a circular platform in white marble, in the middle of which rises the grand mausoleum. It is of marble, a great bronze door admits to the interior. We pass under a vault, the niches of which enclose the bones of the Ming emperors. A spiral staircase with sculptured balustrades, very handsome in style, conducts to a second platform elevated some seventy feet above the ground. The view from it is magnificent, overlooking a world of mausoleums, pagodas, temples, and kiosks which the great trees had concealed from us. The mausoleum is continued into an immense cupola and terminates in a pointed pyramid covered with plates and mythological base reliefs. Finally, the pyramid is crowned by a great gilded ball. The travelers here quitted their English horses and mounted the frightful Chinese steeds which carry on the postal service. After a couple of wearisome days occupied in clearing narrow defiles, torrents, and plains of blinding dust, they reached the Lazarist mission. On entering the town, they were surrounded by an immense multitude, all silent and polite, but not the less fatiguing, genant, as Madame de Bourgelon puts it. Their eager curiosity did not fail to become very inconvenient, and we could well have dispensed with the two thousand quidnooks who accompanied us everywhere. We halted at last before the great gateway above, which figures, though only for a few days, the cross, that noble symbol of the Latin civilization. It is the standard of humanity, of generous ideas, and universal emancipation, placed throughout the extreme east under the protection of France. The English occupy themselves wholly with commerce. For them, faith and the sublime teachings of religion take but the second place. Very few French travelers seem able to avoid an occasional outbreak of splenetic patriotism. The greatness and the generosity of France are the hobby horse on which they ride, with such a fanfare of trumpets as to provoke the ridicule of the passer-by. Madame de Bourboulon, as a woman, may be excused her little bit of sarcasm, though she must have known and ought to have remembered what has been done and endured by English missionaries in the name and for the sake of the cross of Christ. The Lazarist priests gave our travellers a hearty welcome, and after a good night's rest the caravan quitted Sun Hu Pu a large town remarkable for the number of Chinese Mussulmans who inhabit it. They reached Calgan on the 23rd of May, and were greeted by Madame de Boulisset, who was to return to Europe in company with Madame de Bourboulon. Thus, as Sir Frederick Bruce was still with them, the representatives of the three greatest powers in the world met together in the remote town which previously was almost unknown to Europeans. Calgan, the frontier town of Mongolia, is not so well built as the imperial cities. It is a commercial center where bazaars abound and open stalls. The foot passengers touch the walls of the houses as they file by one after the other, and the roadway, narrow, squalid, and muddy, is thronged with chariots, camels, mules, and horses. I have been much struck, writes Madame de Bourboulon, with the extreme variety of costumes and types resulting from the presence of numerous foreign merchants. 
here as in all chinese towns the traders at every door tout for custom here porters trudge by loaded with bales of tea there under an awning of felt are encamped itinerant restaurateurs with their cooking stoves yonder the mendicant bonzes beat the tam-tam and second-hand dealers display their wares ragged tartars with their legs bare drive onward herds of cattle without thought of passers-by while tibetans display their sumptuous garb their blue caps with red topknots and their loose blowing hair farther off the camel drivers of turkestan turbaned with aquiline nose and long black beard lead along with strange airs their camels loaded with salt finally the mongolian lamas in red and yellow garments and shaven crowns gallop past on their untrained steeds in striking contrast to the calm bearing of a siberian merchant who stalks along in the thick fur-lined pelisse great boots and large felt hat behold me now in the street of the clothes merchants there are more second-hand dealers than tailors in china one has no repugnance for another's cast-off raiment and frequently one does not deign even to clean it i enter a fashionable shop the master is a natty little old man his nose armed with formidable spectacles which do but partly conceal his dull malignant eyes three young people in turn exhibit to the passer-by his different wares extolling their quality and making known their prices this is the custom and to me it seems more ingenious and better adapted to attract purchasers than the artistically arranged shop windows which one sees in europe i allowed myself to be tempted and purchased a blue silk pelisse lined with white wool this wool as soft and fine as silk comes from the celebrated race of the Angti sheep i paid for it double its value but the master of the establishment was so persuasive so irresistible that i could not refuse and then left immediately for he was quite capable of making me buy up the whole of his shop the chinese are certainly the cleverest traders in the world and i predict that they will prove formidable competitors to the dealers of london and paris if it should ever occur to them to set up their establishments in europe after dinner m de Bilisek took leave of his wife and set out on his return to pekin sir f bruce goes with us as far as borgaltai the first station in mongolia from our halting place i can perceive the ramifications of the great wall stretching northward of the town towards the crest of the mountains kaigan which has population of two hundred thousand souls is the northernmost town of china proper on the twenty fourth of may the travellers accompanied by madame de balisek departed from kaigan and crossed the great wall this colossal defensive work consists of double crenellated ramparts locked together at intervals of about a hundred yards by towers and other fortifications the ramparts are built of brickwork and ash tar cemented with lime measure twenty feet in height and twenty five to thirty feet in thickness but do not at all points preserve this solidity in the province of Kansau, there is but one line of rampart the total length of this great barrier called wan ting chang or myriad mile wall by the chinese is one thousand two hundred and fifty miles it was built about two twenty b c as a protection against the tartar marauders and extends from three degrees thirty minutes east to fifteen degrees west of pekin surmounting the highest hills descending into the deepest valleys and bridging the most formidable rivers our travellers entered borgaltai in the evening simultaneously with the caravan of camels which had started a fortnight before and were lodged in a squalid and filthy inn nothing however could disturb the cheerful temperament of madame de bourboulon who rose superior to every inconvenience or vexation and this bonhomie is the chief charm of her book 
thus speaking of the first evening in this dirty mongolian inn she says there was nothing to be done but to be content with some cold provisions and our camping out beds it was the birthday of queen victoria and as our landlord was able to put his hand upon two bottles of champagne we drank along with sir frederick bruce and mr wade her majesty's health afterwards we played a rubber at whist for we had found some cards surely never before was whist played in the mongolian deserts before accompanying our travellers into these deserts it may be convenient that we should note the personnel of their following and the organization of their expedition in addition to monsieur and madame de bourboulon the french caravan consisted of six persons captain bouvier of the engineers a sergeant and a private of the same branch of the service an artillerist a steward intendant and a young christian a native of pekin whom m de bourboulon was taking with him to france madame de balusec's suite consisted of a russian physician a french waiting maid a lama interpreter named gamboy and a cossack as escort a small carriage well hung on two wheels was provided for the two ladies the other travellers journeyed on horseback or in chinese carts these small carts with hoods of blue cloth carry only one passenger they are not hung upon springs but are solidly constructed at zayu tologoi the chinese drivers were replaced by mongolian postilions and the chinese mandarins gave up the responsibility of escort to mongolian officials the mongolian mode of harnessing is very strange a long wooden traversal bar is fastened to the end of the shafts and on each side a horseman glides under his saddle then they set off at full gallop when they halt the horsemen disappear the shafts fall abruptly to the ground and the travellers if they have not a good strong hold are projected from the vehicle the officers of the escort go in advance to prepare tents or wigwams formed of hurdles upon which is stretched a great awning of felt the whole has very much the appearance of an enormous umbrella with a hole at the top to let out the heated air and at need the smoke as the travellers carried with them a large stock of provisions and fresh meat could generally be obtained from the nomad shepherds their table was well served but owing to the absolute dearth of any kind of fuel they were compelled to kindle their fires with argols or dried cow dung in due time they entered upon the great desert of gobi where the grassy plain is covered by a countless multitude of molehills which render locomotion very difficult this apparently boundless desert notwithstanding its lack of trees and shrubs and flowers and its monotonous uniformity is not without a certain charm as many travellers have acknowledged madame de bourboulon writing of it says i grew accustomed to the desert it is only for a few days that i have had experience of tent life and yet it seems to me as if i had always lived so the desert is like the ocean the human eye plunges into the infinite and everything speaks of god the mongolian nomad loves his horse as the sailor loves his ship it is useless to ask him to be bound by the sedentary habits of the chinese to build fixed habitations and cultivate the soil this free child of nature will let you treat him as a rude barbarian but in himself he despises civilized man who creeps and crawls like a worm about the small corner of land which he calls his property the immense plain belongs to him and his herds which follow his erratic courses supply him with food and clothing what wants he more so long as the earth does not fail him there is another light in which this vast desert may be looked at unquestionably its influence on the destinies of the human race has been injurious 
It has checked the progress of the Semitic civilization. The primitive peoples of India and Tibet were civilized at an early period of the world's history, but the immense wilderness put an impassable barrier between them and the barbarous tribes of northern Asia. More than the Himalaya, more than the snow-capped peaks of Sivernagor and Gorkha, these boundless wastes, alternately withered by a tropical summer and blighted by a rigorous winter, have prevented for ages all intercommunication, all fusion between the inhabitants of northern and those of southern Asia. And it is thus that India and Tibet have remained the only regions of this part of the world which have enjoyed the benefits of civilization, of the refinement of manners, and of the genius of the arts. The barbarians who in the last agonies of the Roman Empire invaded and devastated Europe issued from the steppes and tablelands of Mongolia. As Humboldt says, if intellectual culture has directed its course from the east to the west, like the vivifying light of the sun, barbarism at a later period followed the same route when it threatened to plunge Europe again into darkness. A tawny race of shepherds, of Fan Klu, that is to say of Turkish origin, the Yungum, inhabited, living under sheepskin tents, the elevated tableland of Gobi. Long formidable to the Chinese power, a portion of the Hyungum were driven south into Central Asia. The impulse thus given uninterruptedly propagated itself to the primitive country of the Finns on the banks of the Ural, whence erupted a torrent of Huns, Avars, Chasars, and diverse mixtures of Asiatic races. The armies of the Huns first appeared on the banks of the Volga, then in Pannonia, finally on the borders of the Marne and the Po, ravaging the beautiful plains where, from the time of Antwor, the genius of man had accumulated monuments upon monuments. Thus blew from the Mongolian desert a pestilential wind, which, even as far as the Cisalpine plains, blighted the delicate flower of art, the object of cares so constant and so tender. The temperature is extremely variable in these steppes, so that Madame de Bourboulon records having experienced in the morning a frost of one degree below zero, and some hours afterward a heat of thirty degrees above zero centigrade. These changes are most numerous and most violent in the spring. The difficulty of travel is increased by the peculiar rapid trot of the Mongol horses and the formidable unevenness of the ground. The jolting is almost intolerable. However carefully the traveler's wares may have been packed, they are infallibly damaged, and Madame de Bourboulon says that they strewed the desert with the wreck of their wardrobe and their linen. Her husband laughingly averred that the very money in the iron-bound chests was broken by the violent friction, and his veracity at first impugned was confirmed by the exhibition of a handful of silver fillings. A pile of piastres was found, pared and ground down as if by a file, and had the journey been much prolonged, all would have been reduced to dust." As the travellers advanced, they observed the increasing scarcity of vegetation. Here and there might be seen a few tufts of saxifrage, lifting up amidst the stones their rose-tinted posies, a rank thorny and creeping herbage, some attenuated heaths, and in the crevices and hollows of the rocks a little couch-grass. They had taken leave of the irises, white, purple, and yellow, and the scarlet anemones, which at first had brightened the way and filled the plains with their delicious balmy odor. Madame de Bourboulon affords us a glimpse, and an interesting one, of the manners of the nomad tribes. Throughout the day a tropical heat had prevailed, and in the evening, on arriving at Halpici, where they were to pass the night, the postilions eagerly moved down among the vessels of water and camel's milk which the women and children had made ready for them, 
a violent altercation ensued because one of the haggers of the desert had allowed a stranger to drink before her husband had been supplied the latter emptied out the contents of the vessel and threw some at the head of his immodest wife amidst the shouts and laughter of the shepherds this scene reminded madame de bourboulon of the bible and the age of the patriarchs quitting the desert of the gobi our travellers entered the country of the Khalkhas, a region of great forests pasturages and crystal rivers but even this earthly paradise of bloom verdure and freshness was not without its dangers we take an extract an illustration of them from madame de bourboulon's journal i rode on horseback this morning she says enticed by the aspect of the beautiful green prairies of tyrene my horse bounded over their surface and giving him the reins i allowed myself to traverse the plain in a furious gallop lulled by the dull sounds of his hoofs which a thick carpet of grasses deadened paying no heed to anything around me and lost in a profound reverie suddenly i heard inarticulate cries behind me and as i turned to ascertain their cause i felt myself pulled by the sleeve of my vest it was a mongolian of the escort who had been sent in pursuit of me he lowered first one hand and then another imitating with his fingers the gallop of a runaway horse at length perceiving that i did not understand he pointed fixedly to the soil my presence of mind returned i had an intuition of the danger which i had escaped and i discovered that the animation of our horses was not due to the charm of green pasture but to fear the fear of being swallowed up alive the ground disappeared under their feet and if they remained still they would sink into the treacherous bogs which do not restore their victims i tremble still when i think of the peril i have escaped my horse better served by its instinct than i by my intelligence had dashed onwards while i perceived nothing a few paces more and i was lost white vapours rising from the earth gave our postilions a fantastic appearance one might have mistaken them for black shadows of gigantic proportions mounted upon transparent and microscopic horses madame de balusac and i were amusing ourselves with this grotesque mirage when our attention was attracted by a still more curious phenomenon the sun as it rose dissipating the morning mists revealed to us captain bouvier who hitherto hidden in the obscurity was galloping about a hundred yards in advance of us he had become trebled that is on each side of him a double had taken its place imitating faithfully his movements and gestures i do not remember ever before to have seen such a phenomenon and i leave it to those who are more learned than i am to decide what law of optics disclosed it to our astonished gaze we must pass more rapidly than did our travellers through the land of the Calcas, a race who nominally acknowledge the authority of the son of Herica, the great Manchu, the descendant of Genghis Khan, who governs the empire of the centre, but pay him neither tax nor tribute, and are in reality governed and administered by the Gusan Tamba, one of the divine incarnations of Buddha in the body of an eternal child who comes from the holy court of tibet at tukubinov on the frontiers of the two empires russia and china our travellers found provided for them by the governor-general of eastern siberia new means of transport he had sent them also an escort and his own aide-de-camp m de Ozerov, who was to conduct them to irkutsk the carriages supplied were tarantas or large post chaises drawn by six horses and telegas on four-wheeled wagons they speedily made their way to kiakta where they met with a most hospitable reception and were splendidly fated dinner concert ball were given in their honour nothing was wanting not even the polka 
the large number of political exiles always residing here has introduced into the midst of the siberian deserts the urbanity of the best society nearly all the ladies speak french according to madame de bourboulon siberia is more civilized than old russia so true is it that it is easier to overlay a new country with civilization than to rejuvenate an old one on reaching the bank of lake baikal our travellers were greatly disappointed to find that the steamers which navigate the lake had sustained severe injuries and were undergoing repair after some hesitation they decided upon embarking in the sailing vessels heavy lumbering and broad-beamed boats intended only for the conveyance of merchandise and terribly unclean the tarantas were hauled up on their decks and after a night of peril when a sudden hurricane put to the test their solidity and staying qualities they effected the transit of the lake in safety the holy sea as the natives call it is the third largest lake in asia about four hundred miles in length and varying in breadth from nineteen miles to seventy though fed by numerous streams it has only one outlet the angara a tributary of the yenisei lying deep among the baikal mountains an offshoot of the altai it presents some vividly colored and very striking scenery its fisheries are valuable in the great chain of communication between russia and china it holds an important place and of late years its navigation has been conducted by steamboats an interesting account of it will be found in mr t w atkinson's oriental and western siberia irkutsk was very pleasant to our travellers after their long experience of the desert once more they found themselves within the generous influences of civilization though possessing not more than twenty three thousand inhabitants it is a busy and a lively town and here as at kiakta the number of exiles gives a certain tone and elevation to the social circle here madame du balusec parted company monsieur and madame de bourboulon resuming their journey pressed forward with such alacrity that in the space of ten hours they sometimes accomplished one hundred and twenty-seven versts though this rate of speed must necessarily have told heavily on the strength of madame de bourboulon the fatigue she endured brought on the sleep of exhaustion which almost resembles catalepsy we arrived she writes at eight in the morning on the banks of the tennessee immediately the horses were taken out and forced into the ferry-boat in spite of their desperate resistance i did not stir my carriage was lifted up and hauled on board by dint of sheer physical strength fifty men being required for the work and singing their loudest to inspirit their efforts i heard nothing on the boat the ropes rattled through the pulleys and the iron chains of the capstans while the master directed the movements of his crew by sharp blasts on his whistle i continued to sleep in fine by an ordinary effect of the profoundest sleep i awakened only when silence succeeded to this uproar carlyle has a remark to this effect that from the way in which a man of some wide thing that he has witnessed will construct a narrative of what kind of picture and delineation he will give of it is the best measure we can get of the man's intellect certainly from a record of travel one can form a tolerably correct estimate of the character disposition and faculties of the traveller on every page of her book for example madame de bourboulon reveals herself as a woman of some culture of a cheerful temper a lively apprehension and refined mind her keen remarks indicate that she has been accustomed to good society speaking of the daughter of the governor of krusuviarsk she observes she would be charming if she did not wear a hat with feathers and white aigrettes 
so empanache as to have a very curious effect on her blonde and roguish spiegel head she adds wherever i have travelled i have observed that the so-called parisian modes the most eccentric things and in the worst possible taste were assumed by ladies of the most remote countries where they arrive completely made up though it is not possible for their makers to ascertain if they will be acceptable to the public hence the heterogeneous toilets of strangers who land in paris persuaded that they are dressed in the latest fashion at atchinsk which separates east from west siberia the travellers were received with graceful hospitality but made no lengthened stay onward they sped over the perpetual plains intersected by forests of firs and countless water courses at tomsk their reception was not less cordial than it had been at irkutsk next they plunged into the immense marshes of baraba into a dreary succession of lakes and pools and swamps blooming with a luxurious vegetation and a marvellous profusion of wild flowers each more beautiful than the other but swarming unhappily with a plague of insects eager to drink the blood of man or beast madame de bourboulon had a cruel proof of their activity though she had fortified her face with a mask of horsehair and thrust her hands into the thickest gloves i was seated in a corner she says wrapped up in my coverings i lift the window sash of one of the doors the air is close and warm the night dark black clouds charged with electricity roll above me and the wind brings to me the marsh odors acrid and yet flat gradually i fall asleep i have kept on my mask but the window-pane remains open a keen sensation of cold and of intolerable itchings in the hands and face awakens me day has dawned and the marshes lie before me in all their splendid colouring but i have paid dearly for my imprudence every part of my face which my mask touched in the position in which i fell asleep has been stung a thousand times through the meshes of hair by thousands of proboscis and suckers a thirst for my blood forehead and chest and chin are grotesquely swollen i do not know myself my wrist exposed between the glove and the edge of the sleeve is ornamented with a regular swelling like a bracelet all around the arm in a word wherever the enemy has been able to penetrate he has wrought indescribable ravage at the next posting-house i have the satisfaction of seeing that my travelling companions have not escaped better than myself and thanks to the vinegar and water bandages we are forced to apply we resemble as we sit at the breakfast-table an ambulatory hospital the baraba marshes measure two hundred and fifty miles in breadth and in length extend over eight degrees of latitude from the fifty-second to the sixtieth a road has been carried across them consisting of trunks of fir trees fastened together and covered with clay but it is not very substantial abandoning the steppes and forests of western siberia our travellers crossed the great ural range of mountains made their way to perm and thence to volga having disposed of all their vehicles they transformed themselves into european tourists with no other encumbrances than boxes and portamentos they traversed ryan and in due time arrived at ninji novgorod just at the season of its famous fair which in importance equals that of leipzig and in variety of interest surpasses it to the observer it offers a wonderful collection of different types of humanity there you may see assembled all the strange races of the east elbowing russians and jews and cossacks and the traders of almost every european nation among the shows and spectacles madame du bourboulon was most struck by a performance of shakespeare's otello in which the hero was played by a black actor from the west indies ira aldridge who spoke in english 
while all the other actors delivered their speeches in Russian. The result was a curious cacophony. She thought the Othello good, nay, very good, for she observes, on returning from China one is not very hard to please. From Ninji Novgorod our travellers proceeded to Moscow by rail, and thence to St. Petersburg, returning to Paris through Prussia and Belgium. In four months they had accomplished a journey of very great length, having traversed from Shanghai to Paris some 8,000 miles without accident. We regret to add that Madame de Bourboulon did not long survive her return home. She died at the Chateau of Clairaut in Loire on the 11th of November, 1865, at the early age of 37. End of section 13. Section 14 of Celebrated Women Travellers of the 19th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Celebrated Women Travellers of the 19th Century by W. H. Davenport Adams. Section 14. Lady Hester Stanhope. Lady Hester Stanhope was born in 1776. She came of a good stock. Her father was that democratic and practical nobleman who invented an ingenious printing press and erased his armorial bearings from his plate and furniture. Her mother was the eldest daughter of William Pitt, the great Earl of Chatham. It was at Burton Pinesent, her illustrious grandfather's country seat, she spent her early years displaying that boldness of spirit and love of independence which marked her later career, training and riding the most unmanageable horses, and shocking society not a little by her disregard of its conventionalities. She inherited from her parents great force of character, intellectual faculties of no common order, and something, probably, of her eccentricity of disposition. A large and liberal education developed these natural powers, which were in themselves remarkable, and as she grew up to womanhood, her sagacious estimates of policy and her sound judgment of men and things secured her respect in the highest political circles. To her cousin, the younger Pitt, the pilot who weathered the storm, in the language of poetry, who died when it was at its height, in the language of fact. Her advice was always acceptable. It was always freely given, for her admiration of her distinguished kinsman was unbounded. In the last months of his life, when he was stricken by a mortal disease and sinking under the burden of political disaster, she was assiduous in her attendance upon him and it was to her, after the memorable battle of Austerlitz, he addressed those historic words, so pathetic in their expression of failure. Roll up that map, the map of Europe. It will not be wanted these two years. After the death of Mr. Pitt, Lady Hester abandoned the gay and polished society of which she had been an acknowledged ornament, and quitted England. This defection society was by no means able to understand, that a woman of high birth and rank and wealth, the niece of one great minister and the kinswoman of another, should deliberately renounce the advantages of her position, was a circumstance unintelligible to ordinary minds, and thenceforth she shared with Lord Byron the curiosity and speculation of the public. Her singular independence of thought and character had already invested her with a fatal reputation for eccentricity, and to eccentricity her action was very generally attributed. Some, indeed, were pleased to cast upon it a gleam of romance, and protested that it was brought about by her sweet sorrow for a young English officer of high rank who had perished on one of the battlefields of the peninsula. 
Others, who were nearer the truth, ascribed it to a love of adventure. But, in plain truth, the ruling motive was pride, a colossal and all-absorbing pride which could be satisfied only by power and influence and a foremost place. Her great kinsman's death had necessarily excluded her from the councils of ministers and closed upon her the doors of cabinets. The ordinary pursuits of society afforded her no gratification, opened up no channel in which her restless energies could expend themselves. She was of too strong a mind, of too clear an intellect, to value the ephemeral influence enjoyed by wealth or beauty. She wanted to reign, to rule, to govern, and as that was no longer a possibility in the political world, she resolved upon seeking some new sphere where she would always be first. It was this illimitable pride, this uncontrolled ambition, which weakened and obscured the elements of true greatness in her character, a character which cannot fail to possess an extraordinary interest for the psychological public. After traversing Europe with impetuous feet, she visited Athens in company with Mr. Bruce. Here she made the acquaintance of Lord Byron. In the language of Mr. Moore, one of the first objects that met the eyes of the distinguished travellers on their approaching the coast of Attica was the noble poet, disporting in his favourite element under the rocks of Colonna. They were afterwards introduced to each other by Lord Sligo, and it was in the course of their first interview at Lord Sligo's table that Lady Hester, with that lively eloquence for which she was remarkable, briskly assailed the author of Child Harold for the depreciating opinion he was supposed to entertain of all female intellect. Being but little inclined, were he even able, to sustain such a heresy, against one who was in her own person such an irresistible refutation of it, Lord Byron had no other refuge from the fair orator's arguments than in assent and silence, and this well-bred deference being, in a sensible woman's eyes, equivalent to concession, they became thenceforward most cordial friends. At Constantinople, which she next visited, Lady Hester remained for several years. There was much in the gorgeous life of the East to charm her fancy and gratify her besetting weakness. She delighted in the implicit submission to her orders, in the almost servile obedience which Orientals pay to their superiors, in the sharp contrast between the old and the new civilization. After a while, however, she wearied even of the golden city, it was not remote enough from Western ideas, nor did it offer that solitary and independent throne which her ambitious and restless spirit coveted. She resolved on seeking it amid the glowing plains of Syria, and with this view embarked on board an English merchant vessel, which she had loaded with her property, with pearls of considerable value, and with a large amount of costly presents, designed to purchase the homage or allegiance of the Syrian tribes. Caught in a violent storm, the ship was wrecked on a reef near the island of Rhodes. The waves swallowed up Lady Hester's treasures, and she herself barely escaped with life. On a small desert island she remained for four and twenty hours without food or shelter, until happily discovered by some Levantine fishermen who conveyed her to Rhodes. Returning to England, she hastened to collect the remains of her scattered fortune, sold a portion of her estates, chartered another vessel, and a second time sailed for the east. The voyage was not marked by any contrary incident, and Lady Hester safely disembarked at Latakia, a small port of Syria, between Tripoli and Alexandretta. In the neighbourhood she hired a house and began the study of Arabic, while busily preparing for her Syrian travels. Having acquired a tolerable knowledge of the language, customs, and manners of the people, 
Lady Hester organised a numerous caravan, and proceeded to visit every part of Syria. She halted in succession at Jerusalem, Damascus, Aleppo, Baalbek, and Palmyra, everywhere maintaining an almost regal state, and by the stateliness of her demeanour and the splendour of her pretensions, producing a powerful impression on the wandering Arab tribes, who proclaimed her Queen of Palmyra and paid her an enthusiastic homage. After several years of migratory enterprise, during which her pretensions gradually grew bolder and stronger, as her own faith in them increased, she at length fixed her abode in an almost inaccessible solitude of the wild Lebanon, near Syed, the ancient Sidon, a concession of the ruined convent and village of Joan, a settlement of the Druzes, having been granted by the pastor of St. Jean d'Arc. There she erected her tent. The convent was a broad grey mass of irregular building, which, from its position, as well as from the gloomy blankness of its walls, gave the idea of a neglected fortress. It had, in fact, been a convent of great size, and like most of the religious houses in this part of the world, had been made strong enough for opposing an inert resistance to any mere casual band of assailants who might be unprovided with regular means of attack. This she filled with a large retinue of dragomen, women, slaves, and Albanian guards. She lived like an independent princess, with a court of her own, a territory of her own, and it must be added, laws of her own, carrying on political relations with the port, with Bashir, the celebrated emir of the Lebanon, and the numerous sheikhs of the Syrian deserts. Over these sheikhs and these tribes, she exercised at one time a singular influence. Mr. Kinglake reports that her connection with the Bedouin began by her making a large present of money, five hundred pounds, an immense sum in piastres, to the chief whose authority was recognised between Damascus and Palmyra. The prestige, he says, created by the rumours of her high and undefined rank, as well as of her wealth and corresponding magnificence, was well sustained by her imperious character and dauntless bravery. Lady Hester, in conversation with the European visitors, would occasionally mention some of the circumstances that assisted her to secure an influence amounting almost to sovereignty. The Bedouin, so often engaged in irregular warfare, strains his eyes to the horizon in search of a coming enemy just as habitually as the sailor keeps his bright lookout for a strange sail. In the absence of telescopes, a far-reaching sight is highly valued, and Lady Hester had this power. She told me that on one occasion, when there was good reason to expect hostilities, a far-seeing Arab created great excitement in the camp by declaring that he could distinguish some moving objects upon the very farthest point within the reach of his eyes. Lady Hester was consulted, and she instantly assured her comrades in arms that there were indeed a number of horses within sight, but that they were without riders. The assertion proved to be correct, and from that time forth her superiority over all others in respect of far sight remained undisputed. We may quote another anecdote, because it has a double significance, illustrating not only the character of Lady Hester, but the temperament of the wandering race over whom she sought to rule. She was marching one day along with the military array of the tribe. Observing that they were making preparations for an engagement, she inquired the reason, and after some attempt at mystification on the part of the sheikh, was informed that war had been declared against the tribe on account of its alliance with the English princess, and they were consequently exposed to attack by a highly superior force. The sheikh contrived to let Lady Hester see that she was the Teterima Causa Belli, and that the contention would readily be appeased but for his recognition of the sacredness of the duty 
of protecting the Englishwoman whom he had received as his guest. At the same time, his tribe would probably experience a crushing disaster. Lady Hester's resolution was immediately taken. She would not for one moment suffer a calamity to fall upon her friends, which it was in her power to avert. She could go forth alone, trusting in herself and her ability to encounter and overcome danger. Of course, the sheikh professed his objection to her determination, and candidly told her that though, if she left them, they would be instantly able to negotiate the conditions of an arrangement, yet they could do nothing for her, and that the enemy's horsemen would sweep the desert so closely as to render impossible her escape into any other district. No fear of danger, however, could move the calm, courageous soul of Lady Hester. She bade farewell to the tribe, turned her horse's head, and rode away into the wilderness alone. Hour after hour passed away, and still, with the hot sun overhead, and round her the solitude of the desert, she rode onward. Suddenly her keen eye sighted some horsemen in the distance. They drew nearer and nearer. Evidently they were making direct towards her, and eventually some hundreds of fully armed Bedouin galloped up to her with fierce hoarse shouts, brandishing their spears as if they thirsted for her blood. Her face, at the time, was covered, as is the eastern custom, with her yashmak. But just as the spears of the foremost horsemen glittered close to her horse's head, she raised her stately figure in her stirrups, drew aside the yashmak that veiled her majestic countenance, waved her arm slowly and disdainfully, and with a loud voice cried, Avaunt! The horsemen, we are told, recoiled from her glance, but not in terror. The threatening yells of the assailants were suddenly changed for loud shouts of joy and admiration at the bravery of the stately Englishwoman, and festive gunshots were fired on all sides around her honoured head. The truth was that the party belonged to the tribe with which she had allied herself, and that the threatened attack, as well as the pretended apprehension of an engagement, had been contrived for the mere purpose of testing her courage. The day ended in a great feast, prepared to do honour to the heroine, and from that time her power over the minds of the people grew rapidly. This was probably the happiest, or at least the most successful, period of her career. Her ambition was satisfied. She felt herself a power. Her pride received no wounds, and her will no check. But, by degrees, clouds gathered on the horizon. Her subjects, if ever they were her subjects, grew impatient of a rule which did not fulfil their longings after military empire. Her immense expenditure told upon her fortune, and its gradual diminution compelled her to withhold the presents she had formerly bestowed with so lavish a hand. She awoke at last to a perception of the hollowness of her authority. Meanwhile, many of the attendants who had accompanied her from Europe died. Others returned to their native country. She was left almost alone in her Lebanon retreat with only the shadow of her former power. The sense of failure must have been very bitter, but she bore herself with all her wanted pride, and made neither complaint nor confession. Without bestowing a regret on the past, she encountered misfortune and ingratitude with a composed countenance, facing them as fearlessly as she had faced the Bedouin of the desert. She yielded nothing, either to the old age which was creeping upon her, or the desertion of the ungrateful wretches who had profited so largely by her generosity. Alone she lived, with the great mountain peaks closing in upon her remote abode, without books, without friends, attended by a few young negresses, a few black slaves, and a handful of Arab peasants, who took charge of her gardens and stables, and watched over the safety of her person. 
the love of power however was still strong within her and as her worldly authority slipped away she endeavoured to replace it by a spiritual the energy of her temper and the extraordinary force of her character found expression in exalted religious ideas in which the illuminationism of europe was strangely blended with the subtleties of the oriental faiths and the mysteries of medieval astrology to what extreme they carried her it is difficult to say it has been hinted that she dreamed of being united in a nuptial union with her saviour reviving the old illusion of st catherine of siena there is no doubt that at times she claimed to be the possessor of divine power there is no doubt that she was not always a believer in her own claims her intellect was too strong for her imagination as miss martineau remarks she saw and knew things which others could not see or know she had curious glimpses of prescience but she could not depend upon her powers nor always separate realities from mere dreams occasionally a visitor from the active world of the west broke in upon her loneliness but only by permission and if he were a man of quick sympathies would draw her out of herself her revelations under such circumstances were always of deep interest alphonse de lamartin the french poet orator and man of letters obtained admission to her presence though not without difficulty in eighteen thirty two when she was standing on the threshold of old age he has left us a graphic record of the interview it was three o'clock in the afternoon when he was informed that lady hester was ready to receive him after traversing a court a garden a day kiosk with jasmine hangings then two or three gloomy corridors a small negro boy introduced him into her cabinet so profound an obscurity prevailed there that at first he could scarcely distinguish the noble grave sweet yet majestic features of the white figure which clothed in oriental costume rose from her couch and extended to him her hands to her visitor lady hester seemed about fifty years of age she was really fifty-six she was still beautiful beautiful with that beauty which lies in the form itself in the purity of the lines in the majesty the thought which irradiate the countenance on her head she wore a white turban from her forehead a veil or yashmak of purple wool fell down to her shoulders a long shawl of yellow cashmere an ample turkish robe of white silk with hanging sleeves enveloped her whole person in their simple and majestic folds so that you could but catch a glimpse when this outer tunic opened on the bosom of a second robe of persian stuff which was fastened at the throat by a clasp of pearls turkish boots of yellow morocco embroidered in silk completed her costume you have come a great distance said lady hester to her visitor to see a hermit you are welcome i receive few strangers but your letter pleased me and i felt anxious to know a person who like myself loved god and nature and solitude something told me moreover that our stars were friendly and that our sympathies would prove a bond of union be seated and let us converse you are one of those men she said whom i await whom providence sends to me who have a great part to accomplish in the work that fate is getting ready you will shortly return to europe well europe is worn out france alone has a great mission before her in this you will participate though i know not how but i can tell you this evening if you wish it after i have consulted the stars as yet she continued evidently her keen perception had detected her visitor's vanity and she skilfully played upon it as yet i do not know the names of all i see more than three however i can distinguish four 
perhaps five, and, who knows, still more? One of them is certainly Mercury, which bestows clearness and colour upon intelligence and speech. You will become a poet, I see it in your eyes, and in the upper part of your face. In the lower, you are under the sway of widely different stars, almost all of them of opposite characters. I discern, too, the influence of the sun in the pose of your head, and in the manner in which you throw it back on the left shoulder. What is your name? Lamartin, who had already won distinction as a poet, told her. I had never heard it, she exclaimed with a convincing accent of sincerity. But, poet or not, I like you, and have hope for you. Go, she added. Dinner is served. Dine quickly, and return soon. I go to meditate upon you, and to see more clearly into the confusion of my ideas respecting your person and your future. Lamartin had scarcely concluded his dinner when Lady Hester sent for him. He found her smoking a long oriental pipe, the fellow of which she ordered to be brought for his own use. Accustomed to see the most graceful women of the East, with their chibouks, he was neither surprised nor shocked by the gracious, nonchalant attitude, or the light wreaths of perfumed smoke issuing from Lady Hester's finely curved lips, interrupting the conversation without chilling it. They conversed together for a long time upon the favourite subject, the unique, mysterious theme of that extraordinary woman, or the modern Circe of the desert, who so completely recalled to mind the famous female magicians of antiquity. The religious opinions of Lady Hester seemed to her guest a skilful, though confused mixture of the various creeds among which she was condemned or had condemned herself, to live. Mystical as the Druses, with whose mysterious secrets she alone, perhaps in the world, was acquainted, resigned like the Mussulman, and as fatalistic, with the Jew, expectant of the Messiah's coming, with the Christian, a worshipper of Christ, whose beneficent morality she practised, she invested the whole in the fantastic colours and supernatural dreams of an imagination steeped in the light of the east and it would seem the revelations of the arabian astrologists a strange and yet sublime medley which it is much easier to stigmatize as lunatic than to analyze and comprehend but lady hester stanhope was no lunatic madness which reveals itself only too clearly in the victim's eyes was not to be detected in her frank, direct look. Madness, which invariably betrays itself in conversation, which it involuntarily interrupts by sudden, irregular and eccentric outbreaks, was nowhere discernible in Lady Hester's exalted, mystical and cloudy, but sustained, connected and vigorous monologues. If, adds Monsieur de la Martin, I were to offer an opinion, I should rather say it was a voluntary and studied madness, which knew what it was about, and had its own reasons for posing as madness. The patent admiration which her genius has excited, and still excites, among the Arab tribes, is a sufficient proof that this pretended insanity is only a means to an end. In the course of conversation, Lady Hester suddenly said to her guest, I hope you are an aristocrat, but I cannot doubt it when I look at you. You are mistaken, madam, replied the man of sentiment. I am neither aristocrat nor democrat. I have lived long enough to see both sides of the medal of humanity and to find them equally hollow. No, I am neither aristocrat nor democrat. I am a man and an ardent partisan of all which can ameliorate and perfect the whole man, whether he be born at the summit or at the foot of the social ladder. I am neither for the people nor the great, 
but for all humanity, and I am unable to believe that either aristocratic or democratic institutions possess the exclusive virtue of raising humanity to the highest standard. This virtue lies only in a divine morality, the fruit of a perfect religion, the civilization of the peoples. It is their faith. We shall shortly see that Lady Hester, with her quick insight into character, an insight sharpened by long and varied experience, took the measure of her visitor very accurately, and lightly estimated the vanity, self-consciousness, and inflated sentimentality which weakened the genius of Lamartin, and marred his career, both for his country and himself. She invited him to visit her garden, a sanctuary into which the profanum vulgus were never allowed to penetrate. Here is his description of it, somewhat exaggerated in colouring. Gloomy trellises, the verdurous roofs of which bore, like thousands of lustres, the gleaming grapes of the promised land. Kiosks, where carved arabesques were intertwined with jasmines and climbing plants, the lianas of Asia. Basins, into which the waters, artificial they are here, flowed from afar to leap and murmur in the marble jets of alleys lined with all the fruit trees of England, of Europe, and of the sunny eastern climates, green leaves besprinkled with blossoming shrubs and marble beds enclosing sheaves of flowers. She also exhibited to her famous guest, if indeed he may be implicitly credited, the noted mare which realised ancient prophecy in which nature had accomplished all that is written on the animal destined to the honour of carrying the Messiah. She will be born ready saddled, he says. And in truth I saw, on this beautiful animal, a freak of nature, rare enough to encourage the illusion of a vulgar credulity among half-barbarous peoples. Instead of shoulders, she had a cavity so broad and deep and so exactly imitating the shape of a Turkish saddle that one might truthfully say she was born ready saddled, and, with stirrups at hand, one might readily have amounted her without a saddle. This magnificent bay mare was the object of profound respect and admiration on the part of Lady Stanhope and her slaves. She had never been ridden, and a couple of Arab grooms cared for her and watched her carefully, never losing sight of her. A few years later, and the brilliant author, Eothan, Mr. A. W. Kinglake, while travelling in the East, made his way to Lady Hester's Lebanon retreat. She had been the friend of his mother, and consequently he had no difficulty in obtaining admission. In the first court which he entered, a number of fierce-looking and ill-clad Albanian soldiers were hanging about the place, a couple of them smoking their chibouks, the remainder lying torpidly upon the flat stones. He rode on to an inner part of the building, dismounted, and passed through a doorway that led him at once from an open court into an apartment on the ground floor. There he was received by Lady Hester's doctor, with a command from the doctor's mistress that her visitor would rest and refresh himself after the fatigues of the journey. After dinner, which was of the usual oriental kind, but included the wine of the Lebanon, he was conducted into a small chamber where sat the lady prophetess. She rose from her seat very formally, uttered a few words of welcome, pointed to a chair placed exactly opposite to her sofa, at two yards' distance, and remained standing up to the full of her majestic height, perfectly still and motionless, until he had taken his appointed position. She then resumed her seat, not after the fashion of the Orientals, but allowing her feet to rest on the floor or footstool, and covering her lap with a mass of loose white drapery. 
the woman before him had exactly the person of a prophetess, not indeed of the divine Sibyl, imagined by Damicino, but of a good, business-like, practical prophetess, long used to the exercise of her sacred calling. Her large, commanding features reminded him of the great statesman, her grandfather, as he is seen in Copley's famous picture. Her face was of surprising whiteness. She wore a very large turban, composed of pale cashmere shawls, and so arranged as to conceal the hair. Her dress, from the chin down to the point of which it was concealed by the drapery on her lap, was a mass of white linen, loosely folding, an ecclesiastical sort of affair, more like a surplice than any of those blessed creations which our souls love under the names of dress, and frock, and bodice, and collar, and habit shirt, and sweet chemisette. Such was the outward seeming of Lady Hester Stanhope, the granddaughter of Chatham, the adviser of Pitt, the Queen of Palmyra, the prophetess of the Lebanon, she who, in her life, had played so many parts, but in all had given full rein to her master passion, pride. And assuredly the moralist who, commenting on the disastrous effect of this passion, should need an illustration to point his moral and adorn his tale, could find none more striking than Lady Hester Stanhope's career affords. End of section 14section 15 of celebrated women travelers of the 19th century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer painter celebrated women travelers of the 19th century by w h davenport adams section 15 Lady Hester Stanhope, Part Two. A couple of black slaves appeared at a signal and supplied their mistress and her visitor with lighted chibouks and coffee. The custom of the East sanctions and almost commands some moments of silence whilst you are inhaling the first few breaths of the fragrant pipe. The pause was broken, I think, by my lady who addressed to me some inquiries respecting my mother, and particularly as to her marriage. But before I had communicated any great amount of family facts, the spirit of the prophetess kindled within her, and presently, though with all the skill of a woman of the world, she shuffled away the subject of poor dear Somersetshire, and bounded onward into other spheres of thought. For hours and hours this wondrous white woman poured forth her speech, for the most part concerning sacred and profane mysteries, but every now and then she would stay her lofty flight and swoop down upon the world again. Whenever this happened, I was interested in her conversation. In reference to her mode of life, she informed her guest that for her sin, or sins, she had subjected herself during many years to severe penance, and that her self-denial had not been without reward. Vain and false, she declared, was all the pretended knowledge of the Europeans. Their doctors asserted that the drinking of milk gave yellowness to the complexion. Yet milk was her only food, and was not her face white? Her intellectual abstemiousness was not less severe than her physical self-denial. Upon book or newspaper she never cast a glance, but trusted wholly to the stars for her sublime knowledge. Her nights she usually spent in absorbed communion with these silent but eloquent teachers, and took her rest during the daytime. She spoke contemptuously of the frivolity and benighted ignorance of the modern Europeans, and gave as a proof of their ignorance not only of astrology, but of the common 
and everyday phenomena produced by the magic art. She evidently desired her hearer to believe that she had at her command all the spells which exercised control over the creatures of the unseen world, but refrained from employing them because it would be derogatory to her exalted rank in the heavenly kingdom. She said that the charm by which the face of an absent person is thrown upon a mirror lay within the reach of the humblest magicians, but that the practice of such arts was unholy as well as vulgar. Reference was made to the divining rod or twig, Virgil's Aurea Virga, by means of which precious metals may be discovered. In relation to this, says Kinglake, the prophetess told me a story rather against herself, and inconsistent with the notion of her being perfect in her science. But I think that she mentioned the facts as having happened before she attained to the great spiritual authority which she now arrogated. She told me that vast treasures were known to exist in a situation which she mentioned, if I remember rightly, as being near Suez, that Napoleon, profanely brave, thrust his arm into the cave containing the coveted gold, and that instantly his flesh became palsied. But the youthful hero, for she said he was great in his generation, was not to be thus daunted. He fell back characteristically upon his brazen resources and ordered up his artillery. Yet man could not strive with demons, and Napoleon was foiled. In latter years came Ibrahim Pasha, with heavy guns and wicked spells to boot, but the infernal guardians of the treasure were too strong for him. It was after this that Lady Hester passed by the spot, and she described, with animated gesture, the force and energy with which the divining twig had suddenly leaped in her hands. She ordered excavations, and no demon opposed her enterprise. The vast chest in which the treasure had been deposited was at length discovered, but, lo and behold, it was full of pebbles. She said, however, that the times were approaching in which the hidden treasure of the earth would become available to those who had true knowledge. Among the subjects on which Lady Hester discoursed, with equal fluency and earnestness, were religion and race. On the first head she announced that the Messiah was yet to come. On the second, she expressed her low opinion of Norman and her high opinion of ancient French blood. Occasionally she descended to inferior topics and displayed her conspicuous abilities as a mimic and satirist. She spoke of Lord Byron and ridiculed his petty affectations and sham orientalism. For Lamartin, she had still less mercy. His morbid self-consciousness and exaggerated refinement of manner had excited her contempt. Indeed, she seems to have cherished an abundant scorn of everything approaching to exquisiteness or aestheticism. Next day, at her request, he paid her a second visit. Really, said she, when he had taken his seat and his pipe, we were together for hours last night, and still I have heard nothing at all of my old friends. Now do tell me something of your dear mother and her sister. I never knew your father. It was after I left Burton Pinsent that your mother married. Kinglake began to furnish the desired particulars, but his questioner could not long attend to them. She soared away to loftier topics, so that the second interview though it lasted two or three hours, was all occupied by her mystical, theological, transcendental, necromantical discourse, in which she displayed the expressiveness, if not the glowing eloquence, of a Coleridge. In the course of the afternoon, the captain of an English man-of-war arrived at June, and Lady Hester resolved on receiving him, for the same reason as that which had governed her reception of Mr. Kinglake, namely, an early intimacy with his family. He proved to be a pleasant and amusing guest, 
and all three sat smoking until midnight, conversing chiefly upon magical science. Lady Hester's unholy claim to supremacy in the spiritual kingdom was, no doubt, the suggestion of fierce and inordinate pride, most perilously akin to madness, but I am quite sure, says Mr. Kinglake, that the mind of the woman was too strong to be thoroughly overcome by even this potent feeling. I plainly saw that she was not an unhesitating follower of her own system, and I even fancied that I could distinguish the brief moments during which she contrived to believe in herself from those long and less happy intervals in which her own reason was too strong for her. As for the lady's faith in astrology and magic science, you are not for a moment to suppose that this implied any aberration of intellect. She believed these things in common with those around her, and it could scarcely be otherwise, for she seldom spoke to anybody, except crazy old dervishes, who at once received her arms and fostered her extravagances, and even when, as on the occasion of my visit, she was brought into contact with a person entertaining different notions, she still remained uncontradicted. This entourage and the habit of fasting from books and newspapers was quite enough to make her a facile recipient of any marvellous story. After Lady Hester's death, a visit was paid to the place which had been her residence for so many years by Major Elliot Warburton, the accomplished author of The Crescent and the Cross. He speaks of the buildings that constituted the palace as of a very scattered and complicated description, covering a wide space, but only one story in height. Courts and gardens, stables and sleeping rooms, halls of audience and ladies' bowers, all strangely intermingled. Heavy weeds clambered about the open portals, and a tangle of roses and jasmine blocked the way to the inner court, where the flowers no longer bloomed, and the fountains had ceased to play in the marble basins. At nightfall, when Major Warburton's escort had lighted their watch-fires, the lurid gleam fell strangely upon masses of honeysuckle and woodbine, on the white mouldering walls beneath, and the dark waving trees above while the quaint picture seemed appropriately filled up by the group of wild mountaineers with their long beards and vivid dresses who gathered around the cheerful blaze. Next morning, Major Warburton explored the spacious gardens. Here, many a broken arbour and trellis bending under masses of jasmine and honeysuckle showed the care and taste that were once lavished on this wild but beautiful hermitage a garden-house, surrounded by an enclosure of roses run wild, stood in the midst of a grove of myrtle and bay-trees. This was Lady Hester's favourite resort during her lifetime, and now, within its silent enclosure, after life's fitful fever she sleeps well. It is painful to know that in her last illness she was shamefully deserted. Mr. Moore, the English consul at Beirut, on hearing that she was stricken, rode across the mountains to visit her, accompanied by Mr. Thompson, the American missionary. It was evening when they arrived, and silence reigned in the palace. No attendants met them. They lighted their own lamps in the outer court, and passed unquestioned through court and gallery until they reached the room where she lay, dead. A corpse was the only inhabitant of the palace, and the isolation from her kind, which she had sought so long, was indeed complete. That morning, thirty-seven servants had watched every motion of her eye. Its spell once darkened by death, every one fled with such plunder as they could secure. A little girl, adopted by her and maintained for years, took her watch and some papers on which she had set peculiar value. Neither the child nor the property was ever seen again. Not a single thing was left in the room where she lay dead, except the ornaments upon her person. 
no one had ventured to take these. Even in death she seemed able to protect herself. At midnight, her countrymen and the missionary carried her out by torchlight to a spot in the garden that had been formerly her favourite resort, and there they buried the self-exiled lady. Some curious particulars of Lady Hester Stanhope's mode of life in its closing years are recorded by her physician. She seldom rose from her bed until between two and five in the afternoon, and seldom retired before the same hours in the morning. It was sunset before the day's business really began. Not that the servants were permitted to remain idle during daylight. On the contrary, their work was assigned to them overnight, and their mistress employed the evening hours in arranging their occupations for the following day. When this was done, she wrote her letters and plunged into those endless conversations which seemed to have been her soul, or at all events her chief pleasure. She always showed a reluctance, an air of unwillingness to retire. Not an unusual characteristic in persons of her peculiar temperament. When the room was ready, one of her two girls, Zeziform or Falum, would precede her to it, bearing wax tapers in their hands. Her bedstead might have suited a veteran campaigner. It consisted simply of a few planks nailed together on low trestles. On these planks, which sloped slightly towards the foot, were spread a mattress, seven feet long and about four and a half feet broad. Instead of sheets, she had Barbary blankets, which are like the finest English, two over and one under her. There was no counterpane, but as occasion required, a woollen abac or cloak would be used, or a fur pelisse. Her pillowcase was of Turkish silk, and under it was another covered with coloured cotton. Behind this were two more of silk, ready at hand if needed. Her dress for the night was a chemise of silk and cotton, a white quilted jacket, a short pelisse, a turban on her head, and a kefaya tied under her chin in the same manner as when she was up, with a shawl over the back of her head and shoulders. It is rather a puzzle how she could enjoy in this full panoply any sound or refreshing repose. No man is said to be a hero to his valet. I suppose the proverb may be applied in the case of his physician. Certainly, Lady Hester Stanhope's medical attendant does not forget to expose her weaknesses. As it had become, he says, a habit with her to find nothing well done, when she entered her bedroom, it was rare that the bed was made to her liking, and generally she ordered it to be made over again in her presence. Whilst this was doing, she would smoke her pipe, then call for the sugar basin, to eat two or three lumps of sugar, then for a clove, to take away the mawkish taste of the sugar. The girls, in the meantime, would go on making the bed, and be saluted every now and then, for some mark of stupidity, with all sorts of appellations. The night lamp was then lighted. A couple of yellow wax lights were placed ready for use in the recess of the window, and all things being apparently done for the night, she would get into bed, and the maid whose turn it was to sleep in the room, for latterly she always had one, having placed herself, dressed as she was, on her mattress behind the curtain which ran across the room, the other servant was dismissed. But hardly had she shut the door and reached her own sleeping room, flattering herself that her day's work was over, when the bell would ring and she was told to get broth or lemonade or orgiat directly. This, when brought, was a new trial for the maids. Lady Hester Stanhope took it on a tray placed on her lap as she sat up in bed, and it was necessary for one of the two servants to hold the candle in one hand and shade the light from her mistress's eyes with the other. The contents of the basin were sipped once or twice and sent away, or, if she ate a small bit of dried toast, it was considered badly made, and a fresh piece was ordered. 
perhaps not to be touched. In what follows, we are almost inclined to suspect a degree of exaggeration. Dr. Merion said that the dish being removed, the maid would again depart and throw herself on her bed, and as she wanted no rocking, in ten minutes would be asleep. But meanwhile, her mistress would feel a twitch in some part of her body, and the bell would again be rung. As servants, when fatigued, sleep sometimes so soundly as not to hear, and sometimes are purposely deaf, Lady Hester Stanhope had got in the quadrangle of her own apartments a couple of active fellows, a part of whose business it was to watch by turns during the night, and see that the maids answered the bell. They were, therefore, sure to be roughly shaken out of their sleep, and in going, half stupid, into her ladyship's room, would be told to prepare a fomentation of chamomile, or elderflowers, or mallows, or the like. The gardener was to be called, water was to be boiled, and the house again was all in motion. During these preparations, the mistress would recollect some order she had previously given about some honey, flour, or letter, no matter however trivial, and the person charged with its execution would be summoned from his bed, whatever might be the time, and questioned respecting it. Nobody in Lady Hester's establishment was suffered to enjoy an interval of rest. A description of the bedchamber, which, for most purposes, was Lady Hester's principal apartment, we shall now subjoin. It bore no resemblance to an English or a French chamber, and, independent of its furniture, was scarcely better than a common peasant's. The floor was of cement. Across the room was hung a dirty red cotton curtain to keep off the wind when the door opened. There were three windows. One was nailed up by its shutter on the outside, and one closed up by a bit of felt on the inside. Only the third, which looked on the garden, was reserved for the admission of light and air. In two deep niches in the wall, which was about three feet thick, were heaped on a shelf, equidistant from the top and bottom, a few books, some bundles tied up in handkerchiefs, writing paper, with sundry other articles of daily use, such as a white plate, loaded with several pairs of scissors, and two or three pairs of spectacles, and another white plate with pins, sealing wax, and wafers. Also, a common white inkstand, and the old parchment cover of some merchant's day book, with blotting paper inside, on which, spread on her lap, as she sat up in bed, she generally wrote her letters. She had neither watch, clock, nor timepiece, and when her physician asked her why she had never purchased one, as a thing so essential to good order in a household, she replied, "'Because I cannot bear anything that is unnatural. "'The sun is for the day, and the moon and stars for the night, "'and by them I like to measure time.' "'A wooden stool by her bedside served for a table, "'and upon it stood a variety of things "'to satisfy any sudden want or fancy, "'such as a little strawberry preserve in a saucer, "'lemonade, chamomile tea, "'epecacuana lozenges,' a bottle of cold water. Of these she would take one or other in succession, almost constantly. In a day or two, fresh remedies or concoctions would take their place. There would be a bottle of wine, or a violet syrup, anise seeds to masticate instead of cloves, quince preserve, orgiat, a cup of cold tea, a pill-box, her bed was without curtains or mosquito net. An earthenware brick or jug with a spout stood in one of the windows with a small copper basin, and this constituted her washing appliances. There was no toilet table, and when she washed herself, the copper basin was held before her as she sat up in bed. Near the foot of the bed stood an upright, ill-made, walnut-wood box, with a piece of green calico depending before it. The windows were curtainless, and the felt with which one of them was covered 
was held in its place by a faggot stick stuck tightly in from corner to corner diagonally such was the chamber of lord chatham's granddaughter diogenes himself could not have found fault with its appointments but the thoughtful observer will regret the indulged self-will and the exaggerated egotism which placed in such a position a woman whose powerful intellect might have been applied to the benefit of the community it is impossible not to see and feel that hers was a wasted life it was this self-will this colossal egotism that led her to spend so much of her time in conversation if those could be called conversations in which one of the talkers insisted upon a monopoly of attention it would be more accurate to describe them as monologues with occasional interpolations of assent on the part of the listener we have no wish to underrate their charm though from the reports transmitted to posterity they would hardly seem to have deserved the very warm eulogy pronounced by the physician who says her conversations lasted eight and ten hours at a time without moving from her seat so that although highly entertained instructed or astonished at her versatile powers as the listeners might be it was impossible not to feel the weariness of so long a sitting everybody he adds who visited lady hester stanhope in her retirement will bear witness to her unexampled colloquial powers to her profound knowledge of character to her inexhaustible fund of anecdotes to her talents for mimicry to her modes of narration as various as the subjects she talked about to the lofty inspiration and sublimity of her language when the subject required it and to her pathos and feeling whenever she wished to excite the emotions of her hearers there was no secret of the human heart however studiously concealed that she could not discover no workings in the listener's mind that she would not penetrate no intrigue from the low cunning of vulgar intrigue to the vast combinations of politics that she would not unravel no labyrinth however tortuous that she would not thread it was this comprehensive and searching faculty this intuitive penetration which made her so formidable for under imaginary names when she wished to show a person that his character and course of life were unmasked to her view she would in his very presence paint him such a picture of himself in drawing the portrait of another that you might see the individual writhing on his chair unable to conceal the effect the words had on his conscience everybody who heard her for an hour or two retired humbled from her presence for her language was always directed to bring mankind to their level to pull down pride and conceit to strip off the garb of affectation and to shame vice immorality irreligion and hypocrisy we have admitted lady hester stanhope's great mental powers but we can find no trace in the records of her conversation of such extraordinary genius as is here indicated no doubt she talked very well but like all great talkers she sometime talked very ill the great attraction of her conversation was its reflection of one strange personality she glassed herself in it as in a mirror and as she had seen much and known many great men and gone through a vast variety of experience she had always something to tell which was interesting but how largely it was informed by egotism and how narrowly at times it escaped the reproach of silliness may be understood i think from the following specimen doctor one day she said to her physician you have no religion what i mean by religion is adoration of the almighty religion as people profess it is nothing but a dress one man puts on one coat and another another but the feeling that i have is quite a different thing and i thank god that he has opened my eyes you will never learn of me because you cannot comprehend my ideas and therefore it is of no use teaching you 
Nobody opens a book to an idiot that would foam and splutter over it, for you could never make him read. Ah, I see my way a little before me, and God vouchsafes to enlighten me perhaps more than other people. It was ever an object with me to search out why I came into the world, what I ought to do in it, and where I shall go to. God has given me the extraordinary faculty of seeing into futurity, for a clear judgment becomes matter of fact. It has ever been my study to know myself. I may thank God for my sufferings, as they have enabled me to dive deeper into the subject than, I believe, any person living. The theory of the soul, Doctor, what an awful thing! My religion is to try to do as well as I can in God's eyes. That is the only merit I have. I try to do the best I can. Some of the servants sometimes talk about my religion. Dine seat, as they call it. And I let them talk, for they explain it to people by saying it is to do what is right and to avoid all uncleanliness. My views of the Creator are very different. I believe that all things are calculated, and what is written is written. But I do not suppose that the devil is independent of God. He receives his orders, not that God goes and gives them to him, any more than the big my lord goes and gives orders to his shoeblack. There is some secondary being that does that, some intendant. There are angels of different degrees, from the highest down to the devil. It must be an awful sight to see an angel. There is something so transcendent and beautiful in them that a person must be half out of his senses to brave the sight. For, when you are looking down and happen to raise your head and there is the angel standing before you, you can't say whether it came up through the earth or down from the sky or how. There he is and may go in the same way. But angels don't appear to everybody. You know, Doctor, you can't suppose that if you were a dirty little apothecary keeping a shop in a narrow street, a Prime Minister would waste his time in going to call on you, or that, if a man is sitting over his glass all the evening, or playing whist, or lounging all the morning, an angel will come to him. But where there is a mortal of high rectitude and integrity, then such a being may be supposed to condescend to seek him out. God is my friend, that is enough, and if I am to see no happiness in the world, my share of it, I trust, will be greater in the next, if I am firm in the execution of those principles which he has inspired me with. In reference to her inveterate love of smoking, her physician says, Much has been written in prose and verse on the advantages and mischief of smoking tobacco. All I can say is, that Lady Hester gave her sanction to the practice by the habitual use of the long oriental pipe, which use dated from the year 1817 or thereabouts. In her bed, lying with her pipe in her mouth, she would talk on politics, philosophy, morality, religion, or on any other theme with her accustomed eloquence, and closing her periods with a whiff that would have made the Duchess of Richmond stare with astonishment could she have risen from her tomb to have seen her quondam friend the brilliant ornament of a london drawing-room clouded in fumes so that her features were sometimes invisible now this altered individual had not a covering to her bed that was not burnt into twenty holes by the sparks and ashes that had fallen from her pipe and had not these coverings been all woollen it is certain that, on some unlucky night, she must have been consumed, bed and all. Her bedroom, at the end of every twenty-four hours, was strewn with tobacco and ashes, to be swept away and again strewed as before, and it was always strongly impregnated with the fumes. The finest tobacco the country could produce, and the cleanest pipes, for she had a new one almost as often as a fop puts on new gloves, could hardly satisfy her fastidiousness, and I have known her footman get as many scoldings as there were days in the week on that score. 
From curiosity, I once counted a bundle of pipes, thrown by after a day or two's use, any one of which would have fetched five or ten shillings in London, and there were a hundred and two. The wood she most preferred were jessamine, rose, and cork. She never smoked cherry wood pipes from their weight, and because she liked cheaper ones, which she could renew oftener. She never arrived at that perfectibility, which is seen in many smokers, of swallowing the fumes, or of making them pass out at her nostrils. The pipe was to her what a fan was, or is, in a lady's hand, a means of having something to do. She forgot it when she had a letter to write, or any serious occupation. It is not so with the studious and literary man, who fancies it helps reflection or promotes inspiration. End of section 15section 16 of celebrated women travelers of the 19th century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org celebrated women travelers of the 19th century by w h davenport adams section 16 lady brassy part 1 lady brassy most of our readers will be familiar with the exciting story of voyages round the world. With that famous circumnavigation by Magellan, which first found an ocean way between the west and the east, and carried a furrow across the broad waters of the Pacific, that scarcely less famous circumnavigation of Drake's, which made the English flag known on the southern seas, that great voyage of Cook's, which added so many lands hitherto unknown to the map of the inhabited globe, down to later circumnavigations, accomplished for scientific objects by ships equipped with the most perfect appliances. Storm and wreck and calm, intercourse with savages who look with wonder on the white sails that have come up from the underworld, the wash of waters upon coral reefs, the shadow of green palms upon lonely isles, strange seaweeds floating on the deep green wave, and flying fish hunted by voracious foes, Long days and nights spent under glowing skies, without a glimpse of land, the breathless eagerness with which some new shore is sighted. With such incidents as these we English are necessarily familiar, possessing as we do a vast and various literature of the sea. And yet our appetite never grows weary of the old, old tale. There is a romance about it which never seems to fade. Like the sea itself, it seems ever to present some fresh and novel aspect and such an aspect it certainly wears when it is told by a woman as it has been told by Lady Brassey, one of the most adventurous and agreeable of lady voyagers. Told, too, with a literary skill and a refined taste which have greatly charmed the public and given a permanent value to her rapid record. There is no affectation of high-wrought adventure or heroic enterprise about it. Lady Brassey describes only what she has seen, and she saw a great deal. She invents nothing and she magnifies nothing. Her narrative is as plain and unvarnished as a ship's log book. The yacht sunbeam in which Lady, she was then simply Mrs. Brassy, accomplished her voyage round the world was a screw three-masted schooner of 530 tons with engines of 35 horsepower and a speed of 10 to 13 knots an hour. She was 157 feet in length, with an extreme breadth of 27 and a half feet. Belonging to a wealthy English gentleman, she was richly appointed and fitted up with a luxurious splendor which would have driven wild with envy and admiration the earlier circumnavigators. Leaving Chatham on the 1st of July, 1876, she ran off Beachy Head on the following evening, dropped anchor off cows the next morning, and early on the 6th passed through the needles. We were 43 on board, all told, says Mrs. Brassey, the party then including her husband and herself and their four children, some friends, a sailing master, boatswain, carpenter, able-bodied seamen, engineers, firemen, stewards, cooks, nurse, stewardess, and ladies' maid. On the 8th they were fairly away from old England. Next day in the afternoon they rounded a shant at the distance of a mile and a half, 
The sea was tremendous, the waves breaking in columns of spray against the sharp needle-like rocks that formed the point of the island. Two days later, Mrs. Brassey had her first rough experience of the sea. We were all sitting or standing, she says, about the stern of the vessel, admiring the magnificent dark blue billows following us, with their curling white crests, mountains high. Each wave, as it approached, appeared as if it must overwhelm us, instead of which it rushed grandly by, rolling and shaking us from stem to stern, and sending fountains of spray on board. Tom, Mr. Brassey, was looking at the stern compass, Alnut being close to him. Mr. Bingham and Mr. Freer were smoking, halfway between the quarter-deck and the after-companion, where Captain Brown, Dr. Potter, Muriel, and I were standing. Captain Lecky, seated on a large coil of rope, placed on the box of the rudder, was spinning Maybell a yarn. A new hand was steering, and just at the moment when an unusually big wave overtook us, he unfortunately allowed the vessel to broach a little. In a second the sea came pouring over the stern above Allnut's head. The boy was nearly washed overboard, but he managed to catch hold of the rail, and, with great presence of mind, stuck his knees into the bulwarks. Kindred, our boatswain, seeing his danger, rushed forward to save him, but was knocked down by the return wave from which he emerged gasping. The coil of rope on which Captain Lecky and Maybell were seated was completely floated by the sea. Providentially, however, he had taken a double turn round his wrist with a reefing point, and throwing his other arm round Maybell, held on like grim death. Otherwise, nothing could have saved them. She was perfectly self-possessed, and only said quietly, "'Hold on, Captain Lecky, hold on,' to which he replied, "'All right.' I asked her afterwards if she thought she was going overboard, and she answered, "'I did not think at all, Mamma, but felt sure we were gone.' Captain Lecky, long accustomed to very large ships, had not in the least realized how near we were to the water in our little vessel, and was proportionately taken by surprise. All the rest of the party were drenched, with the exception of Muriel, whom Captain Brown held high above the water in his arms, and who lost no time in remarking, in the midst of the general confusion, "'I'm not at all wet. I'm not!' Happily, the children don't know what fear is. The maids, however, were very frightened, as some of the sea had got down into the nursery, and the skylights had to be screwed down. Our studding sail boom, too, broke, with a loud crack when the ship broached, too, and the jaws of the foreboom gave way. Soon after this adventure we all went to bed, full of thankfulness that it had ended as well as it did, but alas, not so far as I was concerned, to rest in peace. In about two hours I was awakened by a tremendous weight of water, suddenly descending upon me and flooding the bed. I immediately sprang out, only to find myself in another pool on the floor. It was pitch dark and I could not think what had happened, so I rushed on deck and found that, the weather having moderated a little, some kind sailor, knowing my love of fresh air, had opened the skylight rather too soon, and one of the angry waves had popped on board, deluging the cabin. I got a light and proceeded to mop up as best I could, and then endeavored to find a dry place to sleep in. This, however, was no easy task, for my own bed was drenched and every other berth occupied. The deck, too, was ankle-deep in water, as I found when I tried to get across to the deckhouse sofa. At last I lay down on the floor, wrapped up in my ulster, and wedged between the foot stanchions of our swing bed and the wardrobe athwart ship, so that, as the yacht rolled heavily, my feet were often higher than my head. Consequently, what sleep I snatched turned into a nightmare, of which the fixed idea was a broken head from the three hundred weight of lead at the bottom of our bed, swinging wildly from side to side and up and down as the vessel rolled and pitched, suggesting all manner of accidents." When morning came at last, the weather cleared a good deal, though the breeze continued. All hands were soon busily employed in repairing damages, and very picturesque the deck and rigging of the sunbeam looked, with the various groups of men occupied upon the ropes, spars, and sails. Towards evening, the wind fell light, and we had to get up steam. The night was the first really warm one we had enjoyed, and the stars shone out brightly. The sea, which had been of a lovely blue color during the day, showed a slight phosphorescence after dark. The voyage, which opened in this stirring manner, proved not less prosperous than pleasant, and was unmarked by any striking adventures, though not devoid of interesting incidents. By way of the Cape de Verde Islands and Madeira, the sunbeam kept southward to the equator, and gradually drew near the coast of South America. 
until it touched at the Brazilian capital, Rio de Janeiro. Thence it ran southward to the river plate, skirted the Patagonian shores, and, threading its way through the defiles of the Magellan Strait, emerged into the southern ocean. A northerly course took it to the great seaport of Chile, Valparaiso, whence it reached across the Pacific to the beautiful group of the Society Islands, visiting Tahiti, the Eden of the Southern Seas. The Sandwich Islands are almost the same distance north as the Society are south of the equator. Here Lady Brassey was received with great hospitality, and surveyed the new and rising civilization of Hawaii with much interest. In the track of the trade winds, the voyagers crossed the Pacific, which, so far as they were concerned, justified its name, to Japan, thence they proceeded to Hong Kong, and through the Straits of Malacca to Penang. Ceylon lies on the farther side of the Bay of Bengal. From Ceylon they sailed to Aden, at the mouth of the Red Sea, one of those strong strategical points by which England keeps open the ocean highways to her commercial fleets. Through the Suez Canal the sunbeam passed into the Mediterranean, whose shores are empires, touching at Malta and at the Rock, which the enterprise of Sir George Rourke gave, and the patient courage of General Elliot preserved to England. Entering the familiar waters of the Atlantic, it put into Lisbon, and afterwards fell into the track for home, sighting the first English land, the start, very early in the morning of the 26th of May. At midnight the voyagers reached Bishi Head, and could see the lights of Hastings in the distance. At half-past six on the 27th they landed there, and were warmly greeted by a multitude of well-wishers. In our limited space it would be impossible for us to follow up very closely a voyage which covered so large a part of the world's surface, nor is it necessary, since Lady Brassley's charmingly written narrative is now well known to every reader, but we shall permit ourselves the pleasure of seeing, as Lady Brassey saw, a picture here and there of beautiful scenery or foreign manners, that we may judge of the impression it produced on so accomplished an observer. Lady Brassey evidently belongs not to the nil admirari school, but enjoys keenly and heartily everything that is fresh and new, a bright bit of color or a picturesque detail. It is this which makes her book so enjoyable. There is no affectation in its pages, no airs of conscious superiority, and we feel that we are in the company of a woman with a woman's heart, of a woman with broad sympathies and a happy nature. Our first visit with Lady Brassey as our guide shall be to the market at Rio de Janeiro. The greatest bustle and animation prevailed, and there were people and things to see and observe in endless variety. The fish market was full of finny monsters of the deep all new and strange to us, whose odd Brazilian names would convey to a stranger but little idea of the fish themselves. There was an enormous rockfish, weighing about three hundred pounds, with hideous face and shiny back and fins, large ray and skate and cuttlefish. The octopus, or pirve, described with so much exaggeration in Victor Hugo's Travelers de la Mer, to say nothing of the large prawns for which the coast is famous. Prawns eight or ten inches long, with antennae of twelve or fourteen inches in length. Such prawns suit those only who care for quantity rather than for quality. They are of indifferent flavor, whereas the oysters, which are particularly small, are remarkable for their delicious taste. Mackerel are here in abundance, also a good many turtle and porpoises, and a few hammer-headed sharks. In the fruit market were many familiar bright-colored fruits, fat, jet-black negresses wearing turbans on their heads, strings of colored beads on their necks and arms, and single long white garments, which appeared to be continually slipping off their shoulders, presided over glittering piles of oranges, bananas, pineapples, passion fruit, tomatoes, apples, pears, capiscum and peppers, sugar cane, cabbage palms, cherimoyas, and breadfruit. In another part of the market all sorts of live birds were for sale, with a few live beasts such as deer, monkeys, pigs, guinea pigs in profusion, rats, cats, dogs, marmosets, and a dear little lion monkey, very small and rather red, with a beautiful head and mane, who roared exactly like a real lion in miniature. There were cages full of small flamingos, snipe of various kinds, 
and a great many birds of smaller size with feathers of all shades of blue red and green and metallic hues of brilliant luster besides parrots macaws cockatoos innumerable and torches on stands the torcha is a bright colored black and yellow bird about as big as a starling which puts its little head on one side and takes flies from one's fingers in the prettiest and most enticing manner. While the sunbeam was lying in the river plate, Lady Brassy and her party made an excursion to the Pampas, those broad, league-long, undulating plains of verdure on which civilization as yet has made but a limited advance. Miles and miles of gold and green, where the sunflowers blow in a solid glow, and to break now and then the screen, black neck and eyeballs keen, up a wild horse leaps between. R. Browning According to Lady Brassey, the first glimpse of the far-spreading prairie was most striking in all its variations of color. The true shade of the pampas grass, when long, is a light dusty green, when short, it is a bright fresh green, but it frequently happens that, owing to the numerous prairie fires, either accidental or intentional, nothing is visible but a vast expanse of black charred ground, here and there relieved by a few patches of vivid green, where the grass is once more springing up under the influence of the rain. The road, or rather track, was in bad condition, owing to the recent wet weather, and on each side of the five cañadas, or small rivers, which we had to ford, there were deep morasses, through which we had to struggle as best we could, with the mud up to our axle-trees. Just before arriving at the point where the stream had to be crossed, the horses were well flogged and urged on at a gallop, which they gallantly maintained until the other side was reached. Then we stopped to breathe the horses and to repair damages, generally finding that a trace had given way, or that some other part of the harness had shown signs of weakness. On one occasion we were delayed for a considerable time by the breaking of the splinter bar, to repair which was a troublesome matter. Indeed, I don't know how we should have managed if we had not met a native lad, who sold us his long lasso to bind the pieces together again. It was a lucky rencontre for us, as he was the only human being we saw during the whole of our drive of thirty miles, except the peon who brought us a change of horses halfway. In the course of the journey we passed a large estancia, the road to which was marked by the dead bodies and skeletons of the poor beasts who had perished in the late droughts. Hundreds of them were lying about in every stage of decay, those more recently dead being surrounded by vultures and other carrion birds. The next cañada that we crossed was choked up with the carcasses of the unfortunate creatures who had struggled thus far for a last drink and had then not had sufficient strength left to extricate themselves from the water. Herds of miserable-looking half-starved cattle were also to be seen, the cows very little larger than their calves, and all apparently covered with the same rough shaggy coats. The pasture is not fine enough in this part of the country to carry sheep, but deer are frequently met with. The natives of these parts pass their lives in the saddle, Horses are used for almost every conceivable employment, from hunting and fishing to brick-making and butter-churning. Even the very beggars ride about on horseback. I have seen a photograph of one, with a police certificate of mendicancy hanging round his neck. Every domestic servant has his or her own horse as a matter of course, and the maids are all provided with habits, in which they ride about on Sundays, from one estancia to another, to pay visits. In fishing, the horse is ridden into the water as far as he can go, and the net or rod is then made use of by his rider. At Buenos Aires, I have seen the poor animals all but swimming to the shore, with heavy carts and loads, from the ships anchored in the inner roads, for the water is so shallow that only very small boats can go alongside the vessels, and the cargo is therefore transferred directly to the carts to save the trouble and expense of transshipment. In out-of-the-way places, on the pampas, where no churns exist, butter is made by putting milk into a goatskin bag, attached by a long lasso to the saddle of a peon, who is then set to gallop a certain number of miles, with the bag bumping and jumping along the ground after him. When on her way to the Straits of Magellan, Lady Brassy saw something of one of the most terrible of disasters at sea, a ship on fire. 
The bark proved to be the Monkshaven, from Swansea, with a cargo of smelting coal for Valparaiso. The Sunbeam, on discovering her, hove to and sent a boat, which, as it was found impossible to save the burning vessel, brought her captain and crew on board, and afterwards saved most of their effects, with the ship's chronometers, charts, and papers. The poor little dinghy belonging to the Monkshaven had been cast away as soon as the crew had disembarked from her, and there was something melancholy in seeing her slowly drift away to leeward, followed by her oars and various small articles, as if to rejoin the noble ship she had so lately quitted. The latter was now hove to, under full sail, an occasional puff of smoke alone betraying the presence of the demon of destruction within. The sky was dark and lowering, the sunset red and lurid in its grandeur, the clouds numerous and threatening, the sea high and dark, with occasional streaks of white foam. Not a breath of wind was stirring, everything portended a gale. As we lay slowly rolling from side to side, both ship and boat were sometimes plainly visible, and then again both would disappear, for what seemed an age, in the deep trough of the South Atlantic rollers. Something Lady Brassy has to say about the Patagonians, of whom the early voyagers brought home such mythical accounts. They owe their name to the fanciful credulity of Magellan, who thus immortalized his conviction that they were of gigantic proportions, patagons, or pentagons, that is, five cubits high. Sir Thomas Cavendish speaks of them as averaging seven to eight feet in stature, in truth, they are a fine, robust race, well-limbed, of great strength, and above six feet in height, not giants, but men cast in a noble mould, and physically not inferior to the household regiments of the British army. They live the true nomadic life, being almost constantly on horseback, and dashing at headlong speed across their wide and open plains. Both men and women wear a long, flowing mantle of skins, which reaches from the waist to the ankle, with a large loose piece dependent on one side, ready to be thrown over their heads whenever necessary. This is fastened by a large flat pin, hammered out either from the rough silver or from a dollar. They are no believers in cleanliness, but daub their bodies with paint and grease, especially the women. Their only weapons are knives and bolas, the latter of which they throw with a surprising accuracy of aim. That they possess even the rudest form of religious belief or perform any religious ceremonies has never yet been ascertained. Their food consists chiefly of the flesh of mares, and troops of these animals accompany them always on their excursions. They also eat ostrich flesh, as an exceptional bon bouche, and bird's eggs and fish, which the women catch. Low as they are in the scale of humanity, from the standpoint of Western civilization, the Fugians, or canoe Indians, as they are generally called, because they live so much on the water and have no fixed abodes on shore, sink much lower. They are cannibals, and, according to an old writer, magpies in chatter, baboons in countenance, and imps in treachery. Whenever it is seen that a ship is in distress, or that a shipwrecked crew have been cast ashore, signal fires blaze on every prominent point, to convey the good news to the whole island population, and immediately the natives assemble, like the clans at Roderick Dew's bedding in Scott's Lady of the Lake. But if all goes well, a vessel may pass through Magellan's Straits without discerning any sign of human life, the savages in their canoes lying hidden beneath the leafy screen of overhanging boughs. Those who frequent the eastern part of Fireland, Tierra del Fuego, are clothed, in so far as they cover their nakedness at all, in a deerskin mantle descending to the waist. Those at the western end wear cloaks made from the skin of the sea otter, but most of them are quite naked. Their food is of the scantiest description, consisting almost wholly of shellfish, sea eggs, and fish generally, which they train their dogs to assist them in catching. These dogs are sent into the water at the mouth of a narrow creek or a small bay, where they bark and flounder about until the fish are frightened into the shallows. Lady Brassy had an opportunity of seeing some Fuegans closely. When the sunbeam was in English reach, a canoe suddenly appeared on her port bow, and as she seemed making direct for the yacht, Sir Thomas ordered the engines to be slowed. Thereupon her occupants plied their paddles more furiously than before, shouting and gesticulating violently, one man waving a skin round his head with an energy of action that threatened to capsize his frail craft 
frail in truth, for it was made only of rough planks, rudely fastened together with the sinews of animals. A rope was thrown to them, and they came alongside, shouting, Tobacco, galleta, biscuit, a supply of which they received in exchange for the skin they had been waving. Whereupon the two men stripped themselves of the skin mantles they were wearing, made of eight or ten sea otter skins, sewed together with finer sinews than those used for the boat, and handed them up, clamoring for more tobacco, which we gave them, together with some beads and knives. Finally, the woman, influenced by so fair an example, parted with her sole garment, in return for a little more tobacco, some beads, and some looking-glasses, which were thrown into the canoe. The party consisted of a man, a woman, and a lad, and, I think, says Lady Brassy, I never saw delight more strongly depicted than it was on the faces of the two latter, when they handled for the first time in their lives, probably, some strings of blue, red, and green glass beads. They had two rough pots made of bark in the boat, which they also sold, after which they reluctantly departed, quite naked but very happy, shouting and jabbering away in the most inarticulate language imaginable. It was with great difficulty we could make them let go the rope when we went ahead, and I was quite afraid they would be upset. They were all fat and healthy-looking, and, though not handsome, their appearance was by no means repulsive. The countenance of the woman especially wore quite a pleasing expression, when lighted up with smiles at the sight of the beads and looking-glasses. The bottom of their canoe was covered with branches, amongst which the ashes of a recent fire were distinguishable. Their paddles were of the very roughest description, consisting simply of split branches of trees, with wider pieces tied on at one end with a sinew of birds or beasts. A fine contrast to these gloomy scenes is presented by Lady Brassey's description of a coral island, one of those almost innumerable gems which stud the broad bosom of the Pacific, like emeralds embossed on a shield of azure and silver. It was the first land she touched in the great South Sea. A reef of glowing coral enclosed a tranquil lagoon, to which the green shores of the island gently sloped. The beauty of this lagoon would need a Ruskin's pen to reproduce it in all its exquisite and manifold coloring. Submarine coral forests of every hue, enriched with sea flowers, anemones, and a chinidae of unimaginable brilliancy. Shoals of the brightest fish flashing in and out like rainbow gleams, shells of gorgeous luster moving slowly along with their living inmates. Very foliage of fantastic seaweed stirred into tremulous motion by the gliding wave. Upon these the enchanted gaze dwelt in the depths of the lagoon, while the surface glowed with every possible and exquisite tint, from the palest aquamarina to the brightest emerald, from the pure light blue of the turquoise to the deeply, darkly, beautifully blue of the sapphire while here and there the glassy wave was broken up by patches of red, brown, and green coral rising from the mass below. A rich growth of tropical vegetation encumbered the shore, stretching down to the very border of the ribbed sands. Palms and coconuts lifted high their slender, shapely trunks, while in and out flitted the picturesque figures of native women in red, blue, and green garments, and of men in motley costumes, loaded with fish, fowls, and bunches of coconuts. On the 2nd of December, the sunbeam arrived at the Queen of the Pacific, the lovely island of Tahiti, or, as it was first called, Otahite. Here, Lady Brassy found herself in the midst of a fairy-like drama, to describe which is almost impossible, so bewildering was it in the brightness and variety of its coloring. The magnolias and yellow and scarlet hibiscus overshadowing the water, the velvety turf onto which one steps from the boat, the white road running between rows of wooden houses whose little gardens are a mass of flowers, the men and women clad in the gayest robes and decked with flowers, the piles of unfamiliar fruit lying on the grass waiting to be transported to the coasting vessels in the harbor, the wide-spreading background of hills clad in verdure to their summits. These are but a few of the objects which greet the newcomer on his first contact with the shore. The impression produced by the first view was deepened by all that Lady Brassy saw afterwards. On sea and shore or in the heart of the island groves, all was new, beautiful, striking. 
there was a strange light in the firmament above a glow in the wave beneath such as she had not seen elsewhere for it was with open hands that nature poured out her dower upon tahiti she went for a ride the path carried her through a thick growth of palm orange guava and other tropical trees some of which were thickly draped with luxuriant creepers conspicuous among the latter shone a gorgeous passion flower with orange-coloured fruit as big as pumpkins that overspread everything with its vigour the path was everywhere narrow and sometimes steep and frequently the horsemen had almost to creep under the close thick crop of interlacing boughs crossing several bright little streams it climbed to the summit of an eminence which commanded on the one side a prospect of a picturesque waterfall on the other side of a deep ravine a river issuing from a narrow cleft in the rock takes but one mad leap from the edge of the precipice into the valley below a leap of six hundred feet first one sees the rush of blue water gradually changing in its descent to a cloud of white spray which in its turn is lost in a rainbow of mist imagine that from beneath the shade of feathery palms and broad-leaved bananas through a network of ferns and creepers you are looking upon the Staubach in Switzerland, magnified in height and with a background of verdure-clad mountains, and you will have some idea of the fall of Watawa. With no spot that she touched at in her long ocean wanderings does Lady Brassey seem to have been so delighted as with Tahiti. Sometimes, she says, I think that all I have seen must be only a long vision, and that too soon I shall awaken to the cold reality the flowers the fruit the colours worn by every one the whole scene and its surroundings seem almost too fairy-like to have an actual existence human nature is of course the same everywhere vice and sorrow prevail at tahiti as in the reeking slums and lanes of great cities it is only of the outward aspect of things that lady brassey speaks for she saw none other and assuredly at tahiti that is fair exceedingly and well calculated to charm a cultivated taste to fill a refined mind with memories of beauty end of section sixteen recording by Devi cross taos new mexico section seventeen of celebrated women travelers of the nineteenth century this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Women Travelers of the Nineteenth Century by W. H. Davenport Adams. Section 17, Lady Brassey, Part 2. From Tahiti we pass on to Hawaii, the chief island of the sandwich group, and the center of a civilization that may one day influence the direction of the great currents of commerce in the Pacific. The sunbeam arrived there on the 22nd of December. It was a clear afternoon. The mountains, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, could be plainly seen from top to bottom, their giant crests rising nearly 14,000 feet above our heads, their tree and fine-clad slopes seamed with deep gulches or ravines, down each of which a fertilizing river ran into the sea. Inside the reef, the white coral shore, on which the waves seemed too lazy to break, is fringed with a belt of coconut palms, amongst which, as well as on the hillside, the little white houses are prettily dotted. All are surrounded by gardens, so full of flowers that the bright patches of color were plainly visible, even from the deck of the yacht having landed we went for a stroll among neat houses and pretty gardens to the suspension bridge over the river followed by a crowd of girls all decorated with wreaths and garlands and wearing almost the same dress that we had seen at tahiti a colored long-sleeved loose gown reaching to the feet the natives here appear to affect duller colors than those we have lately been accustomed to lilac drab brown and other dark prints being the favorite tints whenever i stopped to look at a view one of the girls would come behind me and throw a lay of flowers over my head fasten it round my neck and then run away laughing to a distance to judge of effect 
The consequence was that, before the end of our walk, I had about a dozen wreaths of various colours and lengths hanging round me, till I felt almost as if I had a fur tippet on. They made me so hot, and yet I did not like to take them off for fear of hurting the poor girl's feelings. Wherever she went, Lady Brassey seems to have commanded special attention, partly no doubt due to her own personal qualities, and partly to the fact that English ladies are rare visitors in the Polynesian Islands, and especially an English lady, the wife of a member of Parliament, who sails round the world in her husband's yacht. Lady Brassey made, of course, an excursion to the great volcano of Kilauea, of which Miss Bird has furnished a singularly fine description. Lady Brassey's sketch is not so elaborate or powerful or fully coloured, but it has a charm of its own in its unassuming simplicity. Let us go with her on a visit to the two craters, the old and the new. And, first of all, we descend the precipice, three hundred feet in depth, which forms the wall of the original crater, but now blooming with a prodigal vegetation. In many places the incline is so steep that zigzagging flights of wooden steps have been inserted here and there in the face of the cliff in order to facilitate the descent. At the bottom we step on to a surface of cold, boiled lava, and even here, in every chink where a little soil has collected, nature asserts her robust vitality, and delicate little ferns put forth their green fronds to feel the light. An extraordinary appearance did that vast lava field present, contorted as it was into every imaginable shape and form, according to the temperature it had attained and the rapidity with which it had cooled. Here and there a patch looked not unlike the contents of a cauldron, which had been petrified in the very act of boiling. Elsewhere the iridescent lava had congealed into wave-like ridges, or huge coils of rope closely twisted together. Again it might be seen in the semblance of a collection of organ pipes, or accumulated into mounds and cones of various dimensions. As our travellers moved forward, they felt that the lava grew hotter and hotter, and from every fissure issued gaseous fumes which seriously affected their noses and throats, till, at last, when passed to leeward of the lava river rolling from the lake, they were almost suffocated by the vapour, and it was with difficulty they pursued their advance. The lava was more glassy and had a look of greater transparency, as if it had been fused at an exceptionally high temperature, and the crystals of alum, sulphur, and other minerals with which it abounded reflected the light in bright prismatic colors. In some places the transparency was complete, and beneath it might easily be seen the long streaks of that fibrous kind of lava connected with a superstition of the natives, which is known as Pyle's hair. Lady Brassey and her companions reached, at last, the foot of the present active crater, whence the molten contents of the terrestrial interior are continually pouring forth in a lurid flood. With some difficulty they gained the summit, to stand, silent and spellbound, in contemplation of a spectacle which more than realizes the terrors of the ancient Phlegathon. The precipice overhung a basin of molten fire, measuring nearly a mile across. With a clang, a clash, and a roar, like that of breakers on a rocky coast, waves of blood-red, fiery liquid lava dashed against the opposing cliffs and flung their spume high up in the air, waves which were never still but rolled onwards incessantly to the charge, and as incessantly retired, hustling one another angrily, and hissing and boiling and bubbling, like a sea chafed by adverse wind and current. A dull dark red, like that of the lees of wine, seems the normal color of the surging lava, which was covered, however, with a thin gray scum. This scum or froth, being every moment and everywhere broken by eddies and jets and whirlpools of red and yellow fire, and occasionally thrown back on either side by the force and rush of swift golden-tinted rivers. On one side of the lake, the principal object of attack was an island, dark and craggy, against which the lava waves rolled with impetuous fury. On the other, they swept precipitately into a great cavern, carrying away the gigantic stalactites which hung at its entrance, and filling it with a thunderous roar like that of contending armies. Scenes there are many in this wide world of ours which neither the craft of the scribe nor the skill of the painter can hope to reproduce, and this is one of them. It is awful in its grandeur, terrible in its sublimity. 
like Milton Satan. It fascinates and yet repels, charms the eye while it chills the heart. One trembles with the sense of a dire, terrific power, which at any moment may leap into the clay and sweep the shattered island into destruction. But dreadful as it is by day, a deeper dread attaches to it by night, when the glare of those leaping fountains and rolling billows of molten lava is reflected athwart the darkness of heaven. And as the night advances and the darkness increases, a wonderful phantasmagoria of color invests the fiery lake. Jet black merges suddenly into palest gray. The deep maroon changes through cherry and scarlet into the exquisitest hues of pink and blue and violet. The richest brown pales through orange and yellow into a delicate straw. Lady Brassy adds that there was yet another shade, which can be described only by the term molten lava color. The wreaths and wheeling clouds of smoke and vapor were by all these borrowed lights and tints translated into beautiful gleaming mist-like creations, belonging neither to earth nor air, but born of the molten flame and seething fire, which seemed splendidly and appropriately displayed against the amphitheater of black peaks, pinnacles, and crags rising in the background. Of these great pieces would sometimes break off, and with a crash fall into the burning lake, there to be remelted and in due time thrown up anew. The time spent at Honolulu by Lady Brassie was by no means wasted. She kept both eyes and ears well open, and suffered nothing to escape her which could throw any light on the manners and customs of the Hawaiian population. Though not a deep, she was a close and an accurate observer, and her book may advantageously be consulted by others than the general reader. The Hawaiians, as a people with a good deal of leisure, upon whose shoulders as yet civilization has laid none of its heavier burdens, are naturally prone to amusement and cultivate their numerous national sports with a good deal of energy and skill. Foremost amongst these is the well-known pastime of surf swimming, a pastime the origin of which is not difficult to understand. It is one in which both men and women join. Armed with a surfboard, a flat piece of wood about four feet long by two feet wide, pointed at each end, which they put edgewise in front of them, they swim out into the broad and beautiful bay and dive under the surf-crested billows of the Pacific. When at a certain distance from the land, a distance regulated by the swimmer's measure of strength and address, he chooses a large wave, and either astride or kneeling or standing upon his board, allows himself to be swept in shore upon its curling crest with headlong speed. The spectator might almost fancy him to be mounted upon the seahorse of ancient myths, and holding its grey curling mane, as it snorts and champs and plunges shoreward, wrapped in spray and foam. To this vigorous sport the Hawaiians are exceedingly partial. They are almost to the manner born, for from their earliest childhood they live an amphibious life, and never seem happier than when they are diving, swimming, bathing, or playing tricks in the bright emerald waters that wash the smiling shores of their favorite isle, or in those of the pleasant river that flows by the groves and gardens of Hilo. On a sunny afternoon, half the population of the latter town may be seen disporting themselves in, upon, and beneath the water. Climbing the steep and rugged rocks that form the opposite bank, they take headers and footers and siders from any elevation under five and twenty feet, diving and swimming in every imaginable attitude, and with a kind of easy and spontaneous grace that commands admiration. One of their great feats is thus described. A couple of natives undertake to jump from a precipice, 100 feet high, into the river below, clearing in their descent a rock, which, at about a distance of 20 feet from the summit, projects as far from the face of the cliff. The two men, lithe, tall, and strong, are seen standing on the green height, their long hair confined by a wreath of leaves and flowers, while a similar wreath is twisted round the waist. With a keen, quick glance, they measure the distance and fall back some yards in order to run and acquire the needful impetus. Suddenly one of them reappears, takes a flying leap from the rock, executes a somersault in mid-air, and feet foremost plunges into the pool beneath to rise again almost immediately and climb the steep river bank with an air of serene indifference. 
his companion having performed the same exploit the two clambered up to the projection of which we have spoken and again dropped into the river waters a less wonderful feat than their former but still one requiring both pluck and skill among the games mentioned by lady brassey are spear throwing transfixing an object with a dart kona an elaborate kind of draughts and talu which consists in hiding a small stone under one of five pieces of cloth placed in front of the players one hides the stone and his companions have to guess where it is hidden and it generally happens that however skilfully the hider may glide his arm under the cloth and shift from one piece to another a clever player detects where he lets go the stone by the movement of the muscles of the upper part of his arm another game tarau resembles the canadian sport of tobogganing only it is carried upon the grass instead of upon the frozen surface of the snow the performers stand erect on a narrow plank turned up in front which they guide with a kind of paddle starting from the summit of a hill or a mountain they sweep down the grassy slopes at a furious pace preserving their balance with admirable dexterity for the game of pahe which is also very popular a specially prepared smooth floor is necessary and along this the javelins of the players glide like snakes on the same kind of floor they play maita or uru maita two sticks are fixed in the ground only a few inches apart and from a distance of thirty or forty yards the player seeks to throw a stone the uru between them the uru being circular in shape three or four inches in diameter and an inch in thickness except at the middle where it is thicker we pass on to japan and accompany lady brassey to a japanese dinner in a japanese tea-house the dinner took place in an apartment which as an exact type of room in any japanese house may be fitly described the roof and the screens which form the sides are all made of a handsome dark polished wood resembling walnut the exterior walls under the veranda as well as the partitions between the other rooms are simply screens of wooden lattice work covered with white paper and sliding in grooves so that a person walks in or out at any part of the wall he thinks proper to select or finds convenient this arrangement necessarily dispenses with doors and windows if you wish to look out you open a little bit of your wall or a larger bit if you step out instead of carpets the floor is strewn with several thicknesses of very fine mats each about six feet long by three feet broad deliciously soft to walk upon all japanese mats are of the same size and they constitute the standard by which everything connected with house building or house furnishing is measured once you have prepared your foundations and woodwork of the dimensions of so many mats you may go to a shop and buy a ready-made house which you can then set up and furnish in the light japanese fashion in a couple of days but then such a house is fitted only for a japanese climate in the room into which lady brassey was introduced was raised on one side a slight dais about four inches from the floor as a seat of honor a stool a little bronze ornament and a china vase in which a branch of cherry blossom and a few flag leaves were gracefully arranged occupied it on the wall behind hung pictures which are changed every month according to the season of the year four comely japanese girls brought thick cotton quilts for the visitors to sit upon and braziers full of burning charcoal that they might warm themselves in the center they placed another brazier protected by a square wooden grating with a large silk eiderdown quilt laid over it to keep in the heat this is the way in which all the rooms even bedrooms are warmed in japan and the result is that fires are of very frequent occurrence the brazier is kicked over by some restless or careless person and in a moment the whole place is in a blaze in due time the brazier and quilt are removed and dinner makes its appearance before each guest is placed a small lacquer table about six inches high with a pair of chopsticks a basin of soup a bowl of rice a sake cup and a basin of hot water while in the middle sat the four japanese hebes with fires to keep the sake hot and light the long pipes they carried from which they wished their visitors to take a whiff after each dish sake is a kind of spirit distilled from rice always drunk hot out of small cups it is not unpleasant in this state but when cold few european palates can relish it 
The Japanese cookery was very good, though some of the dishes were compounded of ingredients not generally mixed together by the cooks of the West. Here is the bill of fare. Soup, shrimps and seaweeds, prawns, egg omelet, and preserved grapes, fried fish, spinach, young rushes, and young ginger, raw fish, mustard and cress, horseradish, and soy, thick soup of eggs, fish, mushrooms, and spinach, grilled fish, fried chicken and bamboo shoots, turnip tops and root pickled, rice ad libitum in a large bowl, hot sake, pipes, and tea. The last dish presented was an enormous lacquer box of rice from which all the bowls were filled, the rice being thence carried to the mouth of each guest by means of chopsticks, in the use of which it is only practice that makes perfect. Between each course a long interval occurred, which was filled up with songs, music, and dancing, performed by professional singing and dancing girls. The music was somewhat harsh and monotonous, but a word of praise may be given to the songs and to the dancing, or rather posturing, for there was little of that agility of foot practiced by European dancers. The girls, who were pretty, wore peculiar dresses to indicate their calling, and seemed of an entirely different stamp from the quiet, simply-dressed waitresses, whom we found so attentive to our wants. Still, they all looked cheery, light-hearted, simple creatures, and appeared to enjoy immensely the little childish games they played amongst themselves between whiles. This voyage round the world, from which we must now turn aside, does not sum up Lady Brassey's achievements as a traveller. She accompanied her husband in 1874 on a cruise to the Arctic Circle, but has published no record of this enterprise. On their return, the indefatigable couple started on a voyage to the east, visiting Constantinople, the city of gilded palaces and mosques, of harems and romance, and skimming the sunny waters of the Bosphorus and the Golden Horn. In 1878, they made a second excursion to the Mediterranean, revisiting Constantinople and seeing it in storm and shadow as they had previously seen it in sunshine, and exploring Cyprus, which then had been but recently brought under British domain. Lady Brassey's narrative of her Mediterranean cruises and Oriental experiences has the distinctive merits of her former work, the same unpretending simplicity and clearness of style, the same quick appreciation of things that float upon the surface, but it necessarily lacks its interest and special value. It goes over familiar, nay, over hackneyed ground, and thus inevitably comes into comparison with the works of preceding travellers, such as Miss Martineau and the author of Eothen, to whose high standard Lady Brassey would be the first to acknowledge that she has no pretensions to attain. There is a certain amount of freshness in the following brief sketch of Athens. We drove first to the Temple of Theseus, the most perfectly preserved temple of the ancient world. The situation has sheltered it from shot and shell, but without doubt it owes its escape from destruction in part to the circumstance that in the Middle Ages it was consecrated as a church. It is a beautiful building, with its double row of columns, bas-reliefs, and roof all perfect, and now contains an interesting collection of antiquities, gathered from its immediate neighborhood. Thence we drove up the hill to the Acropolis, passing on our way the modern observatory on the Hill of the Nymphs. The Hill of Nymphs rose on our right, and the Aeropagus, where St. Paul preached, on our left. We entered the gates, and passing among ruins of all kinds, statues, bas-reliefs, columns, capitals, and friezes, soon approached the Propylia. Then we went to the little temple of victory, closed with iron gates, and full of most exquisite bits of statues and bas-reliefs, specially to dancing girls, graceful in attitude and full of life and action. After these preliminary peeps at loveliness and art, we went up the long flight of steps, past the Panarthica, and soon stood on the top of the hill of the Acropolis, and in full view of all its glories. On one side was the splendid Parthenon, on the other the Erechtheum, with the porch of Caryatides, called Beautiful, and right well it deserves its name. Six noble columns are still standing. We strolled about for a long time, took some photographs, admired the lovely panoramic view from the top, over the town of Athens to Eleusis, 
Salamis, and Corinth on one side, and from Mount Pentilicus and Mount Hymettus to the Elysian fields, till our eyes wandered round by the ancient harbours of Felicium and Piraeus, back again by the street of tombs to Athens, looking more dusty and more grey than ever, as we gazed down on its grey tiled roofs. Even the gardens and palm trees hardly relieved it. It was nearly three o'clock before we could tear ourselves away. This is very natural and simple, though it is hardly what we should expect from a cultivated woman after visiting the memorials of Greek art and history, and the great and beautiful city of the Violet Moon. A greater enthusiasm, a more living sympathy, might surely have been provoked by the sight of the blue sea where Themistocles repulsed the navies of Persia, and the glorious hill on whose crest St. Paul spake to the wandering Athenians, and the monuments of the genius of Praxiteles and Phidias. Lady Brassy, however, is not at her best when treating of the places and things which antiquity has hallowed. It is the aspects of the life of to-day, and the picturesque scenes of savage lands that arrest her attention most firmly, and are reproduced by her most vividly. She is more at home in the Hawaiian market than among the ruined temples of Athens. The reader may not be displeased to take a glance at Nicosia, the chief town of Cyprus, of that famous island which calls up such stirring memories of the old chivalrous days when Richard I and his crusaders landed here, and the lion-hearted king became enamored of Berengaria, the daughter of the Cypriot prince. The town is disappointing inside, she says, although there are some fine buildings still left. The old cathedral of St. Sophia, now used as a mosque, is superb in the richness of its design and tracery, and the purity of its Gothic architecture. Opposite the cathedral is the church of St. Nicholas, now used as a granary. The three Gothic portals are among the finest I have ever seen. Every house in Nicosia possesses a luxuriant garden, and the bazaars are festooned with vines, but the whole place wears, notwithstanding, an air of desolation, ruin, and dirt. Government House is one of the last of the old Turkish residences. From the Turkish prison we pass through a narrow, dirty street, with ruined houses and wasted gardens on either side, out into the open country again, when a sharp canter over the plain and through a small village brought us to the place where the new government house is in course of erection. This spot is called Snake Hill, from two snakes having once been discovered and killed here, a fact which shows how idle are the rumors of the prevalence of poisonous reptiles in the island. It is a rare thing to meet with them, and I have seen one or two collectors who had abandoned in despair the idea of doing so. The site selected for government house is a commanding one, looking over river, plain, town, mountain, and what were once forests. Leaving the walls of the city behind, we crossed a sandy, stony plain. For about two hours we saw no signs of fertility, but we then began to pass through vineyards, cotton fields, and pomegranates, olive and orange tree plantations, till we reached the house of a rich Armenian, whose brother is one of the interpreters of the camp. His wife and daughters came out to receive us, and conducted us along a passage full of girls picking cotton, and through two floors stored with sesame, grain of various kinds, cotton, melons, gourds, etc., to a suite of spacious rooms on the upper floor, opening into one another, with windows looking over a valley. Oh, the delight of reposing on a Turkish divan, in a cut, stone-built house, after that long ride in the burning heat! Truly the son of Cyprus is as a raging lion, even in this month of November. What, then, must it be in the height of summer? The officers all agree in saying that they have never felt anything like it, even in the hottest parts of India or the tropics. After that we mounted fresh mules and rode up the valley by the running water to the point where it gushes from the hill, or rather mountainside, a clear stream of considerable power. It rises suddenly from the limestone rock at the foot of Pentadactylon, nearly 3,000 feet high in the northern range of mountains. No one knows whence it springs, but from the earliest times it has been celebrated, and some writers have asserted that it comes all the way under the sea from the mountains of Caramania in Asia Minor. The effect produced is magical, trees and crops of all kinds flourishing luxuriantly under its fertilizing influence. The village of Kithraya itself nestles in fruit trees and flowering shrubs, 
and every wall is covered with maidenhair fern, the fronds of which are frequently four and five feet long. The current of the stream is used to turn many mills, some of the most primitive character, but all doing their work well, though the strong water power is capable of much fuller development. It was nearly dark when we started to return, and it was with many a stumble, but never a tumble, that we galloped across the stony plain and reached the camp about 7 p.m. Here we found a silk merchant from Nicosia waiting to see us, with a collection of the soft silks of the country, celebrated since the days of Boccaccio. They look rather like poplin, but are really made entirely of silk, three-quarters of a yard in width, and costing about three shillings a yard, the piece being actually reckoned in piastres for price and pies for measurement. The prettiest, I think, are those which are undyed and retain the natural color of the cocoon, from creamy white to the darkest gold. Some prefer a sort of slaty gray, of which a great quantity is made, but I think it is very ugly. In this easy gossiping manner, Lady Brassy ambles on, not telling one anything that is particularly new, but recording what really met her eye in the most unpretending fashion. As a writer, she scarcely calls for criticism. She writes with fluency and accuracy, but never warms up into eloquence, and her reflections are not less commonplace than her style. As a traveler, she deserves the distinction and popularity she has attained. It would seem that in her various cruises she has accomplished some 12,000 miles, in itself no inconsiderable feat for an English lady, but the feat becomes all the more noteworthy when we find that instead of being, as we would naturally suppose, at home on the sea, and wholly untouched by the suffering it inflicts on so many, she has always been a victim. Entering the harbor of Valletta on her homeward voyage, she writes, I think that at last the battle of eighteen years is accomplished, and that the bad weather we have so continually experienced since we left Constantinople, comprising five gales in eleven days, has ended by making me a good sailor. For the last two days I have really known what it is to feel absolutely well at sea, even when it is very rough, and have been able to eat my meals in comfort, and even to read and write, without feeling that my head belonged to somebody else. End of section 17. Recording by Debbie Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Section 18 of Celebrated Women Travellers of the 19th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Celebrated Women Travellers of the 19th Century by W. H. Davenport Adams. Section 18. Lady Morgan and Others Among literary travellers, a place must be assigned to Lady Morgan, born 1777, the novelist, who in her books of travel exhibits most of the qualities which lend a characteristic zest to her fictions. She and her husband, Sir Charles Morgan, visited France in 1815 and compounded a book upon it which, as France had been for so many years shut against English tourists, produced a considerable sensation, and was eagerly read. Its sketches are very bright and amusing, and its naive egotism was pardonable, considering the flatteries which Parisian society had heaped upon its author. Its liberal opinions, which the conservatives of today would pronounce milk and water, fluttered the dovecots of Toryism, under the regime of Lord Liverpool, and provoked Wilson Croker, the Rigby of Lord Beaconsfield's Coningsby, to fall upon it tooth and nail. Lady Morgan revenged herself by putting her scurrilous attaché into her next novel, Florence McCarthy, where he figures as Crawley. In 1819, the bookmaking couple repaired to Italy, and of course, a sojourn in Italy meant a book upon Italy, which Lord Byron declared to be very faithful. It is said to have produced a greater impression than even the book upon France, and as a tolerably accurate representation of the moral and political condition of Italy at the period of the Bourbon Restoration, it has still some value. 
In 1830, Lady Morgan's fecund pen compiled a second book upon France, which, indeed, seemed to exist in order that Lady Morgan might write upon it. This second book, like its predecessor, is cleverly and smartly written. It contains many lively descriptions and some just criticisms upon men and things. Names appear upon each page with a personal sketch or a mot which makes the reader at once of their society. There is a visit to Beranger, the great French lyrist, in the prison of La Force, and there are two memorable dinners, one at the Comte de Ségur's, with a record of the conversation, as graphic and amusing as if it were not on topics half a century old. The other is a dinner at Baron Rothschild's, dressed by the great Carême, who had erected a column of the most ingenious confectionery architecture, and inscribed Lady Morgan's name upon it in spun sugar. Very complimentary, but unfortunately sadly prophetic. It is only upon spun sugar that her name was inscribed by herself or others. Mrs. Mary Somerville, the illustrious astronomer and physicist, would not have claimed for herself the distinction of traveller, nor has she written any complete book of travel, but there are sketches of scenery in her personal recollections, which make one wish that she had done so. And, indeed, the fine colouring of the pictures which occur in her physical geography show that she had the artist's eye and the artist's descriptive faculty, both so essential to the full enjoyment of travel. Much clear and forcible writing, with many vivacious observations, will be found in the Sketches and Characteristics of Hindustan, published by Miss Emma Roberts in 1835. More minute and exact are the details which Mrs. Postans has collected in reference to the mode of life, the religion, and the old forms of society and government in one of the northwestern provinces of India under the title of Kutch. It includes a very animated account of a sati, that cruel mode of compulsory self-sacrifice which the British government has since prohibited. On this occasion, the widow, a remarkably handsome woman, apparently about thirty, seems really to have been a willing victim and behaved with the utmost composure. Accompanied by the officiating Brahmin, the widow walked seven times round the pyre, repeating the usual mantras or prayers, strewing rice and cowries on the ground, and sprinkling water from her hand over the bystanders, who believe this to be efficacious in preventing disease and in expiating committed sins. She then removed her jewels and presented them to her relations, saying a few words to each, with a calm, soft smile of encouragement and hope. The Brahmins then presented her with a lighted torch, bearing which, fresh as a flower just blown, and warm with life her youthful pulses playing, she stepped through the fatal door and sat within the pile. The body of her husband, wrapped in rich kinkob, was then carried seven times round the pile and finally laid across her knees. Thorns and grass were piled over the door, and the European officers present insisted that free space should be left, as it was hoped the poor victim might yet relent and rush from her fiery prison to the protection so freely offered. The command was readily obeyed, the strength of a child would have sufficed to burst the frail barrier which confined her, and a breathless pause succeeded. But the woman's constancy was faithful to the last. Not a sigh broke the death-like silence of the crowd, until a slight smoke curling from the summit of the pyre, and then a tongue of fame darting with bright and lightning-like rapidity into the clear blue sky, told us that the sacrifice was complete. Fearlessly had this courageous woman fired the pile, and not a groan had betrayed to us the moment when her spirit fled. 
At sight of the flame, a fiendish shout of exultation rent the air. The tom-tom sounded, the people clapped their hands with delight as the evidence of their murderous work burst on their view. Whilst the English spectators of this sad scene withdrew, bearing deep compassion in their hearts, to philosophise as best they might on a custom so fraught with horror, so incompatible with reason, and so revolting to human sympathy. The pile continued to burn for three hours, but from its form it is supposed that almost immediate suffocation must have terminated the sufferings of the unhappy victim. There is a very charming book, brightly written, and dealing with an interesting people, which reaches very high in the literature of travel. We refer to Lady Eastlake's Residence on the Shores of the Baltic, described in a series of letters, in which, with a polished pen and a quick observation, she sets before us the patriarchal simplicity of life and honest character of the Estonians. Travel books by ladies were rare at the time that Lady Eastlake, then Miss Rigby, wrote, and the success of her work was influenced, no doubt, by this rarity, but its reputation may well rest upon its genuine merit. Only, justice compels us to say, that writing of almost equal merit, sometimes of superior, is now poured out every year, nay, every month, by adventurers of the other sex. A female traveller has ceased to be a rara avis. Delicately nurtured women now climb Mont Blanc, or penetrate into the Norwegian forests, or cross the Pacific, or traverse sandy deserts, or visit remote isles, in company with their husbands and brothers, or unprotected. This great and rapid increase in the number of female travellers is partly due, no doubt, to the greater facilities of locomotion, but we believe it is also due to the greater freedom which women of late years have successfully claimed, and to the consequent development of powers and faculties, their possession of which was long ignored or denied. End of section 18「Section 19 of Celebrated Women Travellers of the 19th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Celebrated Women Travellers of the 19th Century by W. H. Davenport Adams. Section 19 Mrs. Trollope. Frances Milton, so well known in English literature under her married name of Trollope, was born at Heathfield Parsonage in Hampshire in 1787. She received, under her father's supervision, a very careful education and developed her proclivities for literary composition at an early age. She was but 18 and she accepted the hand of Mr. Thomas A. Trollope, a barrister, and the cares and duties of married life for some years diverted her energies into a different channel. The true bent of her talents, a sharp, bold, and somewhat coarse attire, she did not discover until after her visit to the United States, 1829-1831. to 1831. There she conceived an antipathy to American manners and customs, which seems to have awakened her powers of sarcasm, and resorted in her first publication, Domestic Life of the Americans. The peculiarities she had found so obnoxious, she sketched with a strong, rough hand, and the truth of her drawing was proved by the wrathful feelings which it provoked in the breasts of its victims. Reading it now, we are naturally inclined to think it a caricature and an exaggeration, but it is only fair to remember that, since its appearance half a century ago, a great change has come over the temper of American society. The great fault of Mrs. Trollope is that she is always a critic and never a judge. 
she looks at everything through the magnifying lens of a microscope and again it must be admitted that she is often vulgar whatever the want of refinement in american society it is almost paralleled by the want of refinement in her lively but coarsely coloured pages for the rest she is a shrewd observer has a considerable insight into human nature especially on its seamy side and if a hard hitter generally keeps her good temper and does not resent a fair stroke from an antagonist as a humorist she takes high rank there are scenes in her novels as well as in her records of travel which are marked by a real and vigorous if somewhat masculine fun perhaps some of her defects are due to the influences among which she lived that ultra toryism of the castle school which resented each movement of reform each impulse of progress as a direct revolutionary conspiracy against everything approved and established by the wisdom of our ancestors that narrowness of thought and shallowness of feeling which resisted all change even when its necessity was most apparent that mrs trollope's prejudices sometimes prevail over her sense of justice is apparent in the ridicule she lavishes upon the rigid observance of the sabbath by the american people she forgot that they inherited it from the english puritans if her evidence may be accepted it amounted in her day to a bigotry as implacable as that of the straitest sect of the scotch presbyterians a generation ago she tells an anecdote to the following effect a new york tailor sold on a sunday some clothes to a sailor whose ship was on the point of sailing the guild of tailors immediately made their erring brother the object of the most determined persecution and succeeded in ruining him a lawyer who had undertaken his defence lost all his clients the nephew of this lawyer sought admission to the bar his certificates were perfectly regular but on his presenting himself he was rejected with a curt explanation that no man bearing the name of f his uncle's name would be admitted we need hardly add that such a fanaticism as this would not be possible now in the united states mrs trollope's animadversions are obsolete on many other subjects much of her indignation was necessarily and very justly bestowed on the then flourishing institution of domestic slavery but that foul blot on her scutcheon america wiped out in blood the blood of thousands of her bravest children a criticism upon manners and social customs has also to a great extent lost its power of application of its liveliness and pungency we may give however a specimen a description of the day's avocations of a philadelphian lady of the first class this lady she says shall be the wife of a senator and a lawyer in the highest repute and practice she has a very handsome house with white marble steps and door-posts and a delicate silver knocker and door-handle she has very handsome drawing-rooms very handsomely furnished there is a sideboard in one of them but it is very handsome and has very handsome decanters and cut glass water jugs upon it she has a very handsome carriage and a very handsome free black coachman she is always very handsomely dressed and moreover she is very handsome herself she rises and her first hour is spent in the scrupulously nice arrangement of her dress she descends to her parlour neat stiff and silent her breakfast is brought in by her free black footman she eats her fried bean and her salt fish and drinks her coffee in silence while her husband reads one newspaper and puts another under his elbow and then perhaps she washes the cups and saucers her carriage is ordered at eleven till that hour she is employed in the pastry room her snow-white apron protecting her mouse-coloured silk twenty minutes before her carriage should appear she retires to her chamber as she calls it shakes and folds up her still snow-white apron smooths her rich dress and with nice care sets on her elegant bonnet and all the handsome etc then walks down stairs just at the moment that her free black coachman announces to her free black footman that the carriage awaits she steps into it and gives the word 
drive to the dorcas society her footman stays at home to clean the knives but her coachman can trust his horses while he opens the carriage door and his lady not being accustomed to a hand or an arm gets out very safely without though one of her own is occupied by a work-basket and the other by a large roll of all those indescribable matters which ladies take as offerings to dorcas societies she enters the parlour appropriated for the meeting and finds seven other ladies very like herself and takes her place among them she presents her contribution which is accepted with a gentle circular smile and her parings of broad cloth her ends of ribbon her gilt paper and her minikin pins are added to the parings of broad cloth the end of ribbon the gilt paper and the minikin pins with which the table is already covered she also produces from her basket three ready-made pincushions four ink wipers seven paper matches and a pasteboard watch case these are welcomed with acclamations and the youngest lady present deposits them carefully on shelves amid a prodigious quantity of similar articles she then produces her thimble and asks for work it is presented to her and the eight ladies all stitch together for some hours their talk is of priests and of missions of the profits of their last sale of their hopes from the next of the doubt whether young mr this or young mr that should receive the fruits of it to fit him out for siberia of the very ugly bonnet seen at church on sabbath morning of the very handsome preacher who performed on sabbath afternoon and of the very large collection made on sabbath evening this lasts till three when the carriage again appears and the lady and her basket return home she mounts to her chamber carefully sets aside her bonnet and its appurtenances puts on her scalloped black silk apron walks into the kitchen to see that all is right then into the parlour where having cast a careful glance over the table prepared for dinner she sits down work in hand to await her spouse he comes shakes hands with her spits and dines the conversation is not much and ten minutes suffices for the dinner fruit and toddy the newspaper and the work-bag succeed in the evening the gentleman being a savant goes to the worcester society and afterwards plays a snug rubber at a neighbour's the lady receives at ten a young missionary and three members of the dorcas society and so ends her day a harmless day after all no doubt such days were spent by philadelphian ladies exactly as mrs trollope describes them no doubt such days are possible in american society now and for that matter in english society also but it is not less certain that then and now many women in philadelphia spent and spend their time with a wiser activity and more to the advantage of themselves and their fellow creatures the fault of the satirist is that he reasons from particulars to generals whereas the sagacious observer will reason from generals to particulars the manners and customs the idiosyncrasies of a class will probably be the manners and customs and idiosyncrasies of most of its members but it by no means follows that from two or three individuals we can safely predict the general characteristics of the class to which they belong in a regiment famous for its bravery we may unquestionably conclude that the majority of the rank and file will be brave men but a few may be composed of less heroic stuff would it be just to take these as the types of the regiment after an unsuccessful attempt to make a home in america mrs trollope returned to england with a world to begin again a husband incapacitated for work by ill health and children who needed aid and were too young to give any in such circumstances many would have appealed to the sympathy of the public but mrs trollope was a courageous woman and preferred to rely upon her own resources she followed her first book the success of which was immediate and very great by a novel entitled the refugee in america in which the plot is ill-constructed and the characters are crudely drawn but the writer's caustic humour lends animation to the page the abbess a novel 
was her third effort and then in the following year came another record of travel belgium and west germany in eighteen thirty three her conservative instincts found less to offend them in continental than in american society and her sketches therefore while not less vivid are much better humoured than in her american book some offences against the minor morals incur her condemnation but the evil which most provokes her is the incessant tobacco smoking of the germans against which she protests as vehemently as did james i in his celebrated counterblast three years later she produced her paris and the parisians of which m Courtambre speaks as crowning her reputation and as receiving almost as warm a welcome in france as in england the character customs and literature of the french furnish the theme of a series of letters in which the clever and vivacious writer never fails to charm even those whom she does not convince it is curious to read this book published in eighteen thirty six and to compare the state of society in those days with that which now exists what changes in half a century have been wrought in the national character there seems in the present a certain dullness greyness and indifference or is it rather an acquired reticence and self-control which contrast very strikingly with a feverish agitated tumultuous past so partial to fantastic crotchets but but so sympathetic also with great doctrines and generous ideas mrs trollope recalls as an historical and noteworthy phase much in vogue in eighteen thirty five young france and describes it as one of those cabalistic formulae which assumed to give expression to a grand terrible sublime and volcanic idea what shall we say nowadays of these two brief monosyllabic words in which the strong generation of the revolution and the first empire reposed so haughty a confidence what shall we say of them to a disillusioned youth who no longer believe in anything and know neither faith nor culture except in one thing money for whom sport and the bourse have replaced the literature which strengthened and developed the faculties and the politics which made men citizens mrs trollope preserves two other words which first rose into popularity in eighteen thirty five the words rococo and decousu all things which bore the stamp of the principles and sentiments of former generations were branded as rococo whatever partook of the extravagance of the romantic school was termed decousu eventually this latter word was abandoned as wanting in vigour and at first that of de Braille was substituted afterwards that of bohemian which despite the interest insinuation it conveyed has been accepted and adopted by a considerable school mrs trollope avers that when she visited france it was impossible for two persons to carry on a conversation for a quarter of an hour without introducing the words rococo and decousu a score of times they turned up as frequently as the head of charles i in mr dick's discourse and she adds with her usual causticity that if one were to classify the population into two great divisions it would be impossible to define them more expressively than by these two words that mrs trollope had no sympathy with the romantic school will not excite surprise la Menet and victor hugo she stigmatizes as decousu of the worst kind and places them in the same rank as robespierre the genius victor hugo so vast so elevated and so profound she could not understand she could see only its irregularities like a certain aesthete who when contemplating the water floods of niagara directed his attention to a supposed defect in their curve her methodical matter-of-fact mind was wholly unable to measure the proportions of the gigantic genius of the author of notre dame and when she discharges at him 
a volley of denunciatory epithets borrowed always from the severest classic style the champion of vice the chronicler of sin the historian of shame and misery she could not believe that in all his writings it was possible to discover a single disgusting portraits which he passed his life in painting this was plain speaking but mrs trollope attacked victor hugo is one of those rebellions on the part of the infinitely little against the infinitely great which move the laughter of gods and men in truth she is seldom happy in her literary criticisms she speaks of Beranga as a meteor yet of no french poet has the renown more steadily increased she is constrained to admit that the great people's poet whose fame will endure when that of most of his contemporaries has passed into dull oblivion is a man of a fine genius but she will not yield to him that foremost place which posterity nevertheless has adjudged to belong to him of Thiers and minette she admits the merits as historians but characterises their philosophy as narrow and shabby but from literature let us turn to society in which he is easier to please whether it belongs to the character of the people or whether it is but a transitory feature in the physiognomy of the age she declares herself unable to determine but nothing strikes her so forcibly as the air of gaiety and indifference with which the french discuss those great subjects that involve the world's destinies we are inclined to think however that of late years a more serious spirit has prevailed on the other hand we cannot recognise as in existence now that exquisite courtesy of the french husband towards his wife which moved mrs trollope's admiration unless recent observers err greatly and unless the stage has ceased to reflect the tone and manners of society a great change for the worst has taken place in this respect due perhaps to the combined influence of speculation on the balls smoking and the coarser code of morals introduced from the north that elaborate and delicate gallantry was a kind of blague for the whole nation it made every frenchman a knight of chivalry no doubt it served as a cloak for many vices but we have the vices still without the cloak i should be surprised says mrs trollope if i heard it said that a frenchman of good education had ever spoken rudely to his wife to one of the worst enemies of the old-fashioned courtesy she makes a passing illusion while hoping cordially that the ladies will easily conquer it we mean positivism if the women of france she says remain true to their vocation they will eventually combat with success the ever-increasing partiality of their compatriots for the positive and will prevent each salon from becoming like the boulevard of the cafe tortoni a petite bourse under the second empire however women were scarcely less guilty than the men and the mania of speculation raged in almost every boudoir it is too early to decide dogmatically whether in this all-important branch of morals the republic has effected an improvement but assuredly the improvement if it has begun has not extended very far or very deep in eighteen thirty five the parisians sometimes fell to blows in support of a philosophical principle and would incur almost any hazard to hear a favourite orator or to assist at the representation of a drama by one of their own pet authors half a century later and they hurry to horse races and fight one another for a caprice in eighteen thirty five they committed suicide through love or sentiment now they blow out their brains when their speculations have suddenly collapsed some bubble burst of the numerous suicides which half a century ago were recorded in the newspapers mrs trollope furnishes an example two young people scarcely out of their childhood went into a restaurant and ordered a dinner of extraordinary delicacy and not less extraordinary cost returning at the appointed time to partake of it they finished it with a good appetite 
and with the enjoyment natural to their age they called for champagne and emptied the bottle holding each other's hand not the slightest shadow of sadness obscured their gaiety which was prolonged almost noisy and apparently genuine after dinner came coffee a mouthful of brandy and the bill one of them with his finger pointed at the total to the other and both at the same time broke out into a fit of laughter after they had drunk the coffee they told the waiter that they wished to speak to the proprietor proprietor who came immediately supposing that they wished to complain of some article as overcharged but instead the elder of the two began by declaring that the dinner was excellent and went on to say that this was the more fortunate because it would assuredly be the last they should eat in this world that as for the bill he must be good enough to excuse payment inasmuch as neither of them possessed a farthing he explained that they would never have played him so sorry a joke had it not been that finding themselves overwhelmed by the troubles and anxieties of the world they had resolved to enjoy a good meal once more and then to take leave of existence the first portion of their project they had satisfactorily carried out thanks to the excellence of monsieur's cuisine and cellar and the second would not be long delayed since the coffee and the brandy had been mixed with a drug which would help them to pay all their debts the landlord was furious he did not believe a word of the young man's oration and declared he would hand them over to the commissary of police eventually he allowed them to leave on their furnishing him with their address the following day impelled half by a wish to get his money and half by a fear that they might have spoken in earnest he repaired to the address they had given him and learned that the two unfortunate young men had been found that morning lying on a bed which one of them had tired some weeks before they were dead and their bodies already cold on a small table in the room lay several papers covered with writing all of them breathed the desire to attain renown without difficulty and without work and expressed the utmost contempt for those who consented to gain their livelihood by the sweat of their brow there were several quotations from victor hugo and a request that their names and the manner of their death might be published in the newspapers it is a pity that their yearning for posthumous notoriety was gratified inasmuch as these sentimental articles written to order by dexterous pens and the verses composed in honour of the two lunatics by byranger in which a romantic halo is thrown over that audacious crime et vers le ciel s'effrayant un chemin ils sont partis et se donnant la main encouraged it is to be feared a suicidal mania we have hinted that mrs trollope's strength lay in her faculty of observation and her strong pungent humour occasionally however she ventures on a vein of reflection and not without success for instance her observations upon the elevation of louis philippe to the french throne are marked by a clear cool judgment when she diverts her thoughts she says from the dethroned and banished king to him whom she saw before her walking without guards and with an assured step she could not but recall the vicissitudes he had experienced and the conclusion forced itself upon her that this earth and all its inhabitants were but the toys of children which changed their name and destination according to the moment's whim it seemed to her that all men must be classed in the order which it was good for them to hold and that everything would be thrown into the greatest confusion if they were cast down in order to be raised up again and thus they were perpetually held from side to side with all this so powerless in themselves and so completely governed by chance she felt humbled by the sight of human weakness and turned her eyes from the monarch to meditate on the insignificance of men how vain are all the efforts which man is able to make to direct the course of his own existence 
there is nothing in truth but confidence in an exalted wisdom and an immovable power which can enable us from the greatest to the smallest to traverse with courage and tranquillity a world subject to such terrible convulsions in the opinion of one french critic the book upon paris and the parisians is one of the most interesting works which has dealt with the subject of french society it reflects with wonderful accuracy the physiognomy of the reign of louis philippe those outbreaks which so frequently troubled the city those political discussions which every evening transformed the salons into so many clubs the romantic aspirations of young france the turbulence of the people and the general want of respect for the monarchy everywhere moreover as one of her translators has said this literary amazon marches armed with a bold and vivid criticism which gathered around her eager readers and bitter foes do not expect that she will relate to you as lady morgan does the tittle-tattle of the boudoirs of the country she visits in which she resides for from the particularity and range of her observations it is clear that she made no flying visit that her masculine mind penetrated below the surface when she arrived in a new land she planted there her flag and with pen upraised set forth to attack or energetically praise according to her sympathies or her hatreds the social and political manners exposed to her searching gaze france was not the only field of study which she found in europe in eighteen thirty eight she published her vienna and the austrians in which her old antipathies and causticities reappeared and in eighteen forty three a visit to italy which was far from being a success the classic air of italy was not favourable to the development of her peculiar powers and among the antiquities of rome the humour which sketched so forcibly the broad features of american society was necessarily out of place our business in these pages is with mrs trollope the traveller but of the industry of mrs trollope the novelist we may reasonably give the reader an idea in eighteen thirty six she published the adventures of jonathan jefferson whitlaw in which she renewed her attacks on american society and drew a forcible sketch of the condition of the coloured population of the southern states some of the scenes may fairly be credited with having suggested to dickens the tone and sentiment of his american pictures in martin chuzzlewit her best novel the vicar of rexhill a highly coloured portrait of an anglican tartuffe bitter in its prejudices but full of talent appeared in eighteen thirty seven the romance of vienna an attack on caste distinctions in eighteen thirty eight to the same year belongs her michael armstrong in which her ishmael hand fell heavily on the narrow-mindedness of the manufacturing class anticipating in some degree dickens's hard times one fault a satire upon romantic exaggeration and the coarse but clever widow barnaby a racy history of the troubles of a vulgar genteel bourgeois in search of a second husband were published in eighteen thirty nine and in the following year appeared its sequel the widow married which is quite as coarse as its predecessor but not so amusing with indefatigable pen she produced in eighteen forty three 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 volume novels hargreave jesse phillips and the lorringtons the first a not very successful sketch of a man of fashion the second an unfair and exaggerated delineation of the action of the new poor law and the third a forcible and lively satire upon superior people in which some of the passages are in her best style in eighteen forty four the industrious satirist who would have been more generally successful had she selected the objects of her attacks with greater discretion withdrew to florence from the host of enemies her free hitting had provoked burying herself in an almost absolute seclusion 
but her active mind could not long enjoy repose and in eighteen fifty one she resumed her pen selecting the roman catholic church for her target in father eustace this was followed in eighteen fifty two by uncle walter it is unnecessary however to enumerate the titles of her later works as they lacked most of the qualities which secured the popularity of her earlier and have already passed into oblivion it is doubtful indeed whether even her better work is much known to the reading public of the present day this clever and industrious woman died at florence on the sixth of october eighteen sixty three in the eighty-fifth year of her age her name has been highly honoured in her two surviving sons antony and thomas adolphus trollope both of whom have attained to a place of distinction in english literature End of section nineteen section twenty of celebrated women travellers of the nineteenth century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by laura langston celebrated women travellers of the nineteenth century by w h davenport adams section twenty harriet martineau one of the best books on eastern life in english literature we owe to the pen of a remarkable woman whose reputation based as it is on many other works of singular ability we may take to be of a permanent character miss harriet martineau she was born in eighteen o two her father was a manufacturer in norwich where his family originally of french origin had resided since the revocation of the edict of nantes to her uncle a surgeon in norwich she was mainly indebted for her education her home life was not a happy one and unquestionably its austere influences did much to develop in her that colossal egotism and self-sufficiency which marred her character and has left its injurious impress on her writings she tells us that only twice in her childhood did she experience any manifestation of tenderness once when she was suffering from earache and her parents were stirred into unwanted compassion and once from a kind-hearted lady who witnessed her alarm at a magic lantern exhibition much more care was shown in inducing her intellectual faculties than in cultivating her affections she learned french and music thoroughly and attained to such proficiency in the classics that she could not only write latin but think in latin she took a great delight in reading and of course read omnivorously with a special preference for history poetry and politics her inquisitive and abnormally active mind early began its inquiries into the mysteries of religious faith but as these were not conducted in a patient or reverent spirit it is no wonder perhaps that they proved unsatisfactory she got hold of the works of dugald stewart hartley and priestley plunged boldly into the maze of metaphysics and grappled unhesitatingly with the mysterious subjects of foreknowledge and free will but in philosophy as in religion her immense egotism led her astray she accepted nothing for the existence of which she could not account by causes intelligible to her own mind naturally she became a necessarian and adopted strenuously the dogma of the invariable and inevitable action of fixed laws we may be allowed perhaps to think of this singular woman as yearning and aspiring after a lofty ideal throughout a sensitive and timorous childhood and in wayward musings and visionary reflections finding that consolation which should have been but was not provided by maternal love as she grew older and grew stronger both in mind and body she grew bolder aspiration gave way to self-satisfied conviction morbid self-reproach was replaced by an extravagant self-consciousness and thenceforth she went on her solitary way acting up always to a high standard of moral rectitude but putting aside the faiths and hopes and judgments of the many as baubles beneath the notice of a mature and well-balanced intellect her taste for literary pursuits she has herself ascribed to the extreme delicacy of her health and childhood to the infirmity of deafness which while not so complete as to debar her from all social intercourse yet compelled her to seek occupations and pleasures not dependent upon others and to the affection which subsisted between her and the brother nearest her own age the rev james martineau 
so well known for his fine intellectual powers. The death of the father having involved the family in the discomfort of narrow circumstances, the pen she had hitherto wielded for amusement she took up with the view of gaining an independent livelihood, and she conceived the idea of employing fiction as a vehicle for the exposition and popularization of the principles of social and political economy. The idea was as new as it was happy, nor could it have been realized at a more opportune time than when the English public was beginning to awake from its long political lethargy and to assert the rights of the nation against the dominant class interests. It was desirable that its newborn activity should be guided by an intelligent apprehension of the cardinal truths by which reform is differentiated from revolution, and to contribute to this result became Harriet Martineau's purpose. Accordingly, in 1826, she wrote, and after conquering the difficulty of finding a publisher, gave to the world her tale of the rioters, the first of a long series of illustrations of political economy, which had a very considerable influence, if not quite so great an influence, as she herself supposed. The series comprises eighteen tales, of which the best, perhaps, are Ella of Gerlach, Life in the Wilds, and The Hamlets. Their true merit consists in their having quickened and strengthened the interest of the reading classes in economic questions. In their day they did an useful work, but they are already forgotten, and, as Sarah Coleridge predicted, their political economy has proved too heavy a ballast for vessels that were expected to sail down the stream of time. In 1834, Miss Martineau qualified, so to speak, for a place among female travelers by visiting the United States. She spent nearly two years in traversing the territories of the great Western Republic and was everywhere received with an enthusiastic welcome. Returning to England in 1836, she recorded her impressions of American society and her views of American institutions in her Society in America and her retrospect of Western travel. These are discriminative and thoughtful, while sufficiently cordial in their praise to satisfy even the most exacting American, and at the time of their appearance these books unquestionably did much to soothe the irritation which Mrs. Trollope's hard-hitting had provoked. It is but just, however, to commend the honesty with which she avowed her anti-slavery opinions, which could not then be enunciated without exciting the anger even of the people of the North. It brought upon her no small amount of abuse and contumely many of those who had previously received her, with professed admiration, joining in the clamor raised against her by the slaveholders and their partisans. Her literary activity, meanwhile, knew no stint. In 1839 she published Deerbrook, her best novel, which the critic will always value as a vigorous picture of some aspects of English life. The tone is high and sustained. As for the characters, they are not very strongly individualized, but on the other hand, the descriptions are clear and forcible, while the interest of the plot is deep and wholesome. John Sterling's criticism of it says, It is really very striking, and parts of it are very true and very beautiful. It is not so true or so thoroughly clear and harmonious among delineations of English middle-class gentility as Miss Austen's books, especially as Pride and Prejudice, which I think exquisite. While traveling on the continent in the spring of 1838, Miss Martineau was seized with a very serious illness. By slow stages, she returned to England, where she settled down near Newcastle-upon-Tyne to be under the care of her brother-in-law. She resided there for a period of nearly six years. Neither suffering of mind or body, however, was allowed to interfere with her literary work. She gave to the world in 1840 her second novel, The Hour and the Man, founded on the romantic career of Toussaint Louverture, and composed the admirable series of children's tales known by the general title of The Playfellow. These four volumes, Settlers at Home, The Picnic, Feats on the Fjord, and The Crofton Boys, show her at her very best. They are full of bold and picturesque descriptions, and the story is told with unflagging energy. Her peculiar position suggested a book that has won a well-deserved popularity, Life in the Sick Room, 1844. Its delicate and judicious reflections and its pleasing sketches cannot be read without a touch of sympathy. Restored to health in 1845, she removed to Ambleside, among the lakes and mountains, settling in the immediate neighborhood of the poet Wordsworth. In the autumn she published her forest and game laws, and in the following year she made a journey to the east and ascended the River Nile, recording her experiences in the book which has led us to introduce her among our female travelers. 
Eastern Life, Past and Present, a remarkable book, giving a fresh interest to the beaten track of Eastern travel and research, and breathing vitality into the dry bones of Champollini, Wilkinson, and Lane. Putting aside its crude notions of Egyptology and its wild speculations on religious topics, we must be prepared to admire its fresh and finely colored word pictures, the glow and power of which are surprising. Miss Martineau went up the Nile to Philae. She afterwards crossed the desert to the Red Sea, landed in Arabia, and ascended Mount Sinai and Horeb, and finally explored a portion of the shores and islands of the Mediterranean. We must pause in our rapid narrative to give a specimen or two of the sketches she made on the way. They will show how a strong and vivid genius can deal with the incidents of travel, and what a record of it may become in the hands of a skillful and accomplished artist. Let us take her description of the Sphinx, the Sphinx that for some thousands of years has held mute companionship with the great pyramids. The full serene gaze of its round face, rendered ugly by the loss of the nose, which was a very handsome feature of the old Egyptian face, this full gaze and the stony calm of its attitude almost turn one to stone, so lifelike, so huge, so monstrous, it is really a fearful spectacle. I saw a man sitting in a fold of the neck, as a fly might settle on a horse's mane. In that crease he reposed, while far over his head extended the vast penthouse of the jaw, and above that the dressed hair on either side the face, each bunch a mass of stone which might crush a dwelling-house. In its present state its proportions cannot be obtained. But Sir G. Wilkinson tells us, Pliny says it's measured from the belly to the highest part of the head sixty-three feet, its length was one hundred and forty-three, and the circumference of its head round the forehead one hundred and two feet, all cut out in the natural rock and worked smooth. Fancy the long, well-opened eyes in such proportion as this, eyes which have gazed unwinking into vacancy, while mighty pharaohs and Hebrew lawgivers, and Persian princes and Greek philosophers, and Antony with Cleopatra by his side, and Christian anchorites and Arab warriors, and European men of science, have been brought hither in succession by the unpausing ages to look up into those eyes, so full of meaning, though so fixed. At Damascus she visited a Turkish harem, and her account of the visit the reader will find some interest in comparing with Madame Homer de L.'s narrative of a similar experience. She and her companions saw the seven wives of three gentlemen, besides a crowd of attendants and visitors. Of the seven, two had been the wives of the head of the household who was dead. Three were the wives of the eldest son, aged twenty-two, and the remaining two were the wives of his second son, aged fifteen. The youngest son, aged thirteen, was not yet married, but he would be thinking about it soon. The pair of widows were elderly women, as merry as girls, and quite at their ease. Of the other five, three were sisters, that is, we conclude, half-sisters, children of different mothers in the same harem. It is evident, at a glance, what a tragedy lies under this, what the horrors of jealousy must be among sisters, thus connected for life, three of them between two husbands in the same house. And we were told that the jealousy had begun, young as they were, and the third having been married only a week. This young creature, aged twelve, was the bride of the husband of fifteen. She was the most conspicuous person in the place, not only for the splendor of her dress, but because she sat on the divan, while the others sat or lounged on cushions on the raised floor. The moment Miss Martineau took her seat, she was struck with compassion for this child, who looked so grave, sad, and timid, while the others romped and giggled, and indulged in laughter at their own silly jokes. She smiled not, but looked on listlessly. Miss Martineau was resolved to make her laugh before she went away, and at length she did somewhat relax, smiling and in a moment growing grave, but after a while she really and truly laughed, and when the whole harem was shown to the visitors, she slipped her bare and dyed feet into her pattens, inlaid with mother-of-pearl, and joined them in the courts, nestling to them and apparently losing the sense of her new position for a time, but there was less of the gaiety of a child about her than in the elderly widows. Her dress was superb, a full skirt and bodice of geranium-colored brocade, embossed with gold flowers and leaves, and her frill and ruffles were of geranium-colored gauze. Her eyebrows were frightful, joined together and extended by black paint. A silk net, bedizened with jewels and natural flowers, covered her head, which thus resembled a bouquet sprinkled with diamonds. Her nails were dyed black, and her feet dyed black in checkers. 
her complexion called white was of an unhealthy yellow indeed not a healthy complexion was to be seen among the whole company how should it be otherwise among women secluded from exercise and pampered with all the luxuries of oriental life besides the seven wives a number of attendants came in to look at the european visitors and serve the pipes and sherbet also a few ladies from a neighbouring harem and a party of jewesses with whom miss martineau and her friends had some previous acquaintance mrs g we are told was compelled to withdraw her lace veil and then to remove her bonnet the street she was informed was the place where the veil should be worn and not the interior of the house then her bonnet went round and was tried on many heads one merry girl wearing it long enough to surprise many newcomers with the joke miss martineau's gloves were stretched and pulled in a variety of ways and their attempts to thrust their large broad brown hands into them one after another but it was the ear trumpet rendered necessary by her deafness which afforded the greatest entertainment the eldest widow who sat near her asked for it and put it to her ear whereupon miss martineau exclaimed bo when she had done laughing the lady of the harem placed it to her next neighbor's ear and shouted bo and in this way it returned to its possessor but in two minutes it was asked for again and went round a second time everybody laughing as loud as ever at each bo so that the joke was repeated a third time the next joke was connected with the jewesses four or five of whom sat in a row in the divan almost everybody else was puffing away at a chibouk or nagali and the place was one cloud of smoke the poor jewesses were obliged to decline joining us for it happened to be saturday and they must not smoke on their sabbath they were naturally much pitied and some of the young wives did what was possible for them drawing in a long breath of smoke they puffed it forth in the faces of the jewesses who opened mouth and nostrils eagerly to receive it thus was the sabbath observed to shouts of laughter a pretty little blue-eyed girl of seven was the only child says miss martineau we saw she nestled against her mother and the mother clasped her closely lest we should carry her off to london she begged we would not wish to take her child to london and said she would not sell her for much money one of the wives was pointed out to us as particularly happy in the prospect of becoming a mother and we were taken to see the room which she was to lie in which was all in readiness though the event was not looked for for more than half a year she was in the gayest spirits and sang and danced while she was lounging on her cushions i thought her the handsomest and most graceful as well as the happiest of the party but when she rose to dance the charm was destroyed for ever the dancing is utterly disgusting a pretty jewess of twelve years old danced much in the same way but with downcast eyes and an air of modesty while the dancing went on and the smoking and drinking coffee and sherbet and the singing to the accompaniment of a tambourine some hideous old hags came in successively looked and laughed and went away again some negresses made a good background to this thoroughly eastern picture all the while romping kissing and screaming went on among the ladies old and young at first i thought them a perfect rabble but when i recovered myself a little i saw that there was some sense in the faces of the elderly women in the midst of all this fun the interpreters assured us that there is much jealousy every day jealousy of the favored wife that is in this case of the one who was pointed out to us by her companions as so eminently happy and with whom they were romping and kissing as with the rest poor thing even the happiness of these her best days is hollow for she cannot have at the same time peace in the harem and her husband's love with these specimens we must be content though we are well aware as heracles has taught us that we cannot judge of a house from a single brick they fairly illustrate however miss martineau's style and manner in her record of eastern travel a record which the narratives of later travellers may have rendered obsolete in some particulars but have certainly not superseded her brief career as a traveller terminated with her visit to the east but a reference to the incidents of her later life may be possibly convenient for the reader in eighteen forty nine to eighteen fifty she published her history of england during the thirty years peace a thoroughly good bit of historical work not less admirable for the general fairness of its tone than for the lucidity of its narrative this was followed by her introduction to the history of the peace from eighteen hundred to eighteen fifteen the careful english condensation of comte's positive philosophy appeared in eighteen fifty three meanwhile she was a constant contributor to mr charles dickens household words and to the columns of the daily news 
in the midst of all this activity she was suddenly struck down by disease of the heart and her doctors announced that she might die at any moment she resigned herself to her fate with her usual calm courage and proceeded to draw up and print her autobiography strange to say she lived for twenty years longer the damocles sword suspended over her head forbore to fall and as soon as her health was to some extent re-established she resumed her literary labors among her latest works which present abundant evidence of the clearness and practical character of her intellect we may mention a treatise on the factory controversy eighteen fifty three a history of the american compromise eighteen fifty six a picturesquely written historical sketch of british rule in india also england and her soldiers health handicraft and husbandry and household education as years passed by her infirmities increased but she retained her force and freshness of intellect almost to the last it was not until the beginning of eighteen seventy six that her mental condition underwent any serious change even then her strong will seemed to stay and strengthen her failing mind she kept her household books and superintended the household economy to the very end though suffering under a burden of pain which weaker natures would have found intolerable writing to a friend six weeks before her death she exclaims i am very ill the difficulty and distress to me are the state of the head i will only add that the condition grows daily worse so that i am scarcely able to converse or read and the cramp in the hands makes writing difficult or impossible so i must try to be content with the few lines i can send till the few days become none we believe that time to be near and we shall not attempt to deceive you about it my brain feels under the constant sense of being not myself and the introduction of this new fear into my daily life makes each day sufficiently trying to justify the longing for death which grows upon me more and more this longing was fulfilled on the twenty seventh of june eighteen seventy six when harriet martineau closed in peace her long and active life End of section twenty Recording by Laura Langston Section 21 of Celebrated Women Travellers of the Nineteenth Century This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Avai in May 2018 Celebrated Women Travellers of the Nineteenth Century by W. H. Davenport Adams Section 21 Miss Isabella Bird The climate of Colorado is the finest in North America, and consumptives, asthmatics, dyspeptics, and sufferers from nervous diseases are here in hundreds and thousands, either trying the camp cure for three or four months, or settling here permanently people can safely sleep out of doors for six months of the year the plains are from four thousand to six thousand feet high and some of the settlers parks or mountain valleys are from eight thousand to ten thousand the air besides being much rarefied is very dry the rainfall is far below the average dews are rare and fogs nearly unknown the sunshine is bright and almost constant and three-fourths of the days are cloudless. This is not Eden, but Colorado, yet seeing it reproduces as nearly as possible what we may suppose to have been the primary characteristics of that first garden, to us dwellers in a land where mists and fogs are frequent and sunbeams are rare, Miss Bird's description of it reads like an effort of the imagination miss bird traversed a portion of colorado in 1878 on her way to explore the recesses of the rocky mountains starting from san francisco she traveled by railway to truckee here she hired a horse and for greater convenience assumed what she styled her hawaiian riding dress that is a half-fitting jacket a skirt reaching to the ankles and full turkish trousers gathered into frills which fell over the boots, a thoroughly serviceable and feminine costume for mountaineering and other rough travelling in any part of the world. Throwing over these habiliments a dust cloak, she rode through Truckee, and then followed up the windings of the Truckee River, a loud-tongued, rollicking mountain stream, 
flowing between ranges of great castellated and embattled sierras. Through the blue gloom of a pine forest she gallantly made her way, charmed by the magic of the scenery that opened out before her. Crested blue jays darted through the dark pines, squirrels in hundreds scampered through the forest, red dragonflies flashed like living light, exquisite chipmunks ran across the track, but only a dusty blue legion here and there reminded one of earth's fairer children. Then the river became broad and still, and mirrored in its transparent depths legal pines, straight as an arrow, with rich yellow and green lichen clinging to their stems, and firs and balsam pines filling up the spaces between them. The gorge opened, and this mountain-girded lake lay before me, with its margin broken up into bays and promontories, most picturesquely clothed by huge sugar pines. From Lake Tabor, Miss Bird returned to Truckee and started on another excursion which brought her within view of the Great Salt Lake and the Mormon town of Ogden, and thence to Cheyenne in the state of Wyoming. Having thus crossed the mountain range of the Sierras and descended into the plains, she entered upon the region of the boundless prairies, great stretches of verdure, generally level, but elsewhere rolling in long undulations, like the waves of a sea which had fallen asleep. Their monotony is broken by large villages of the so-called prairie dogs, the Wishton Wish, a kind of marmot, which owes its misleading name to its short, sharp bark. The villages are composed of raised circular orifices, about 18 inches in diameter, from which a number of inclined passages slope downwards for five or six feet. Hundreds of these burrows are placed together. On nearly every rim a small, furry, reddish-buff beast sat on his hind legs, looking, so far as head went, much like a young seal. These creatures were acting as sentinels and sunning themselves. As we passed, each gave a warning yelp, shook its tail, and, with a ludicrous flourish of his hind legs, dived into his hole. The appearance of hundreds of these creatures, each eighteen inches long, sitting like dogs begging, with their paws down and all turned sunwards, is most grotesque. At Greeley, Miss Bird entered Colorado, which she describes, as we have seen, in such a manner as to suggest that it rivals Dr. Richardson's imaginary Hygeia in all essential particulars. From Greeley she hastened to Fort Collins, with the great masses of the Rocky Mountains facing her as she advanced. Still across the boundless sea-like prairie struck the indefatigable traveller, until she came to a sort of tripartite valley with a majestic crooked canyon, two thousand feet deep, and watered by a roaring stream, where in a rude log cabin she abode for several days. Having obtained a horse, she rode across the highlands, and striking up the St. Rain Canyon, ascended to Esteo Park, 7,500 feet above the sea level. To understand the majesty of the Rocky Mountains, the reader must think of them as a mass of summits, frequently 200 and 250 miles wide, stretching, with scarcely any interruption of continuity, almost from the Arctic Cycle to the Straits of Magellan. At the point ascended by Miss Bird, their scenery was of the grandest description, wonderful ascents, wild fantastic views, cool and bowery shades, romantic glens echoing melodiously with the fall of waters. But it is only fair that Miss Bird should be heard on her own account. A tremendous ascent among rocks and pines to a height of 9,000 feet brought us to a passage seven feet wide through a wall of rock, with an abrupt descent of 2,000 feet, and a yet higher ascent beyond. I never saw anything so strange as looking back. It was a single gigantic ridge which we had passed through, standing up knife-like, built up entirely of great brick-shaped masses of bright red rock, piled one on another by titans. Pitch pines grew out of these crevices, but there was not a vestige of soil. Beyond, wall beyond wall of similar construction, 
and range above range rose into the blue sky. Fifteen miles more over great ridges, along passes dark with shadow, and so narrow that we had to ride in the beds of the streams which had excavated them, round the bases of colossal pyramids of rock crested with pines, up into fair upland parks, scarlet in patches with the poison oak, parks so beautifully arranged by nature that I momentarily expected to come up some stately mansion. But that afternoon, crested blue jays and chipmunks had them all to themselves. Here, in the early morning, deer, bighorn, and the stately elk come down to feed, and there, in the night, prowl and growl the rocky mountain lion, the grizzly bear, and the cowardly wolf. There were chasms of immense depth, dark with the indigo gloom of pines, and mountains with snow gleaming on their splintered crests, loveliness to bewilder and grandeur to awe, and still streams and shady pools, and cool depths of shadow. Mountains again, dens with pines, among which patches of aspen gleamed like gold, valleys where the yellow cottonwood mingled with the crimson oak, and so on and on through the lengthening shadows till the track, which in places had been hardly legible, became well defined, and we entered a long gulch with broad swellings of grass belted with pines. Long's Peak, the American Matterhorn, 14,700 feet high, has seldom been ascended, and Miss Bird is the first woman who has had the courage and resolution to reach its summit. Her party consisted of herself, two youths, the son of a certain Dr. H., and Mountain Jim, one of the famous scouts of the plain, an expert in Indian border warfare who acted as guide. The ride at first was one long series of glories and surprises, of peak and glade, of lake and stream, and of mountain upon mountain, culminating in the shivered pinnacles of Long's Peak. And as the sun slowly sank, the pines stood out darkling against the golden sky, the grey peaks took upon their crests a glory of crimson and purple, a luminous mist of changing colours filled every glen, gorge and canyon, while the echoes softly repeated that peculiar sough or murmur which accompanies the departing day. Our adventurer, with heart touched by the magical beauty and magnificence of the scene, crossed a steep wooded incline into a deep hollow, where, embosomed in the mountain solitude, slept a lily-covered lake, cradling white, pure blossoms and broad green leaves, and aptly named the Lake of the Lilies. Calm on its amethyst-coloured waters lay the tremulous shadow of the great dark pine woods. Thence she and her companions passed again into the leafy wilderness which clothes the mountainside up to a height of about eleven thousand feet, cheered as they climbed slowly upwards on the laborious path, by delightful vistas of golden atmospheres and rose-lit summits, such as broke upon the dreams of him who created in his fancy the garden of Armida, upward and onward through the dusky shade, which in itself may well impress a quick imagination. It is the silence of the forest that makes its mystery. The only sounds are those of the branches swaying in the breeze, or of a bough crashing to the ground through decay, or the occasional voices of the wandering birds, and these seem but to increase the silence by their inadequateness of contrast. Alone in this profundity of gloom, it is difficult for the traveller to resist the sense and feeling of a supernatural presence, and he comes to understand in what way such eerie legends and grim traditions have grown up about the forest, and why, to the early races, its still depths seemed haunted by the creatures of another world. Silence and twilight here, twin sisters, keep their noonday watch and sail among the shades like vaporous shapes half seen. And the forest is peopled with the phantoms that are born of silence and twilight. As they ascended, they found that the pines grew smaller and more sparse, and the last stragglers wore a tortured, waning look. 
the forest threshold was crossed but yet a little higher a slope of mountain meadow dipped to the southwest towards a bright stream trickling under ice and icicles and there in a grove of the beautiful silver spruce our travellers resolved to encamp for the night the trees were small of size but so exquisitely arranged that one might well ask what artist's hand had planted them scattering them here grouping them there and training their shapely spires towards heaven hereafter says miss bird when i call up memories of the glorious the view from this camping ground will come up looking east gorges opened to the distant plains there fading into purple gray mountains with pine-clothed skirts rose in ranges or solitary uplifted their gray summits while close behind but nearly three thousand feet above us towered the bald white crest of long's peak its huge precipices red with the light of a sun long lost to our eyes close to us in the caverned side of the peak was snow that owing to its position is eternal soon the afterglow came on and before it faded a big half-moon hung out of the heavens shining through the silver-blue foliage of the pines on the frigid background of snow and turning the whole into fairyland this passage shows what indeed is sufficiently evident in every page of miss bird's travel books that she possesses as every traveller ought to possess the artist's temperament and that if she cannot transfer the scenes she loves to the canvas she knows how to reproduce them in words that have the glow of light and life a sense of the beautiful and a power of expressing that sense so as to make it felt by others is the primary and indispensable qualification of the traveller he must have eyes to see and ears to hear and that his fellow may be the wiser better and happier for his enterprise he must have the faculty of describing what he has seen and heard in language of adequate force and clearness with a great fire of pine logs to protect them against the rigour of the night for the thermometer marked twelve degrees below freezing point our travellers passed the hours of darkness when the sun rose they too arose and it was well to do so as sunrise from a mountain top is such a spectacle of glory as few eyes have the happiness to look upon from the chill grey peak above them with its eternal snows and pathless forests down to the plains which spread below like a cold and waveless sea everything underwent a strange and marvellously beautiful transformation for as the sun rose above the horizon in all the fullness of its orbit splendour the grey of the plains flushed into purple the wan peaks gleamed like rubies the pines shone like so many columns of gold and the sky reddened with rose hues like the blush on a fair face after breakfast the party resumed their ascent of the mountain and in due time arrived at the notch a literal gate of rock when they found themselves on the knife-like ridge or backbone of long's peak only a few feet wide covered with huge boulders and on the other side shelving in a snow-patched precipice of three thousand feet to a picturesque hollow brightened by an emerald lake passing through the notch says miss bird we looked along the nearly inaccessible side of the peak composed of boulders and debris of all shapes and sizes through which appeared broad smooth ribs of reddish coloured granite looking as if they upheld the towering rock mass above i usually dislike bird's eye and panoramic views but though from a mountain this was not one serrated ridges not much lower than that on which we stood rose one beyond another far as that pure atmosphere could carry the vision broken into awful chasms deep with ice and snow rising into pinnacles piercing the heavenly blue with their cold barren grey on on forever till the most distant range upbore unsullied snow alone there were fair lakes mirroring the dark pine woods canyons dark and blue black with unbroken expanses of pines snow-slashed pinnacles 
wintry heights frowning upon lovely parks watered and wooded lying in the lap of summer north park floating off into the blue distance middle park closed till another season the sunny slopes of esteo park and winding down among the mountains the snowy ridge of the divide the backbone or watershed of the rocky mountains whose bright waters seek both the atlantic and the pacific oceans there far below links of diamonds showed where the grand river takes its rise to seek the mysterious colorado with its still unresolved enigma and lose itself in the waters of the pacific the snow-born thompson bursts forth from the ice to begin its journey to the gulf of mexico nature rioting in her grandest mood exclaimed with voices of grandeur solitude sublimity beauty and infinity lord what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him at the notch the true character of the enterprise she had undertaken was forcibly brought home to miss bird's consciousness the peak towered above her two thousand feet of solid rock with smooth granite sides affording scarcely a foothold and patches of re-frozen snow presenting no ordinary obstacles to the advance she was by no means an expert mountaineer having neither head nor ankles and in reality she was dragged or hauled up the ascent by the patience skill and strength of mountain jim up a deep ravine they attained to the passage of the dog's lift through which they emerged on a narrow rugged shelf broken and uneven forming a kind of terrace or platform where they drew breath before attempting the last five hundred feet the terminal peak itself a smooth cone of pure granite with almost perpendicular sides the only foothold here was in narrow cracks or on minute projections of the granite to get a toe in these cracks or on one or other of these scarcely visible projections while crawling on hands and knees weary thirst tortured and gasping for breath this was to climb but at last the peak was won and miss bird rejoiced in the consciousness of being the first woman who had ever placed her feet on its lofty summit the descent as far as the notch was not less laborious or painful than the upward effort had been and when miss bird reached their former camping ground she was thoroughly exhausted with fatigue and thirst but a night's rest recruited her remarkable energies and when the morning dawned she was fresh and vigorous as ever and happy in the memory of her successful enterprise an enterprise such as few women have ever equalled and in recollections of the beauty and sublimity of long's peak which cannot fail to be joys for ever the parks of which we have spoken are broad grassy valleys lying at heights which vary from six thousand to eleven thousand feet they are the favorite retreats of innumerable animals wapiti bighorn oxen mountain lions the great grizzly the wary beaver the evil-smelling skunk the craven wolf coyote and lynx to say nothing of lesser breeds such as marten wild cat fox mink hare chipmunk and squirrel their features have been fully described by lord dunraven in his picturesque book the great divide miss bird's animated pages present so many delightful pictures of mountain scenery that we know not which to choose in illustration of her remarkable descriptive powers we have already alluded to her faculty of pictorial presentment it is one in which few of her sex surpass her she puts a scene before us with as much life and distinctness as a constable or a peter graham and the reader who would form a clear and well-defined conception of the rocky mountains in their picturesque aspects cannot do better than study her little but delightful book while reading it one seems to feel the pure keen mountain air around one to see the great peaks rising one above the other like the towers and spires of some vast cathedral of nature to watch the ever-shifting phantasmagoria of gorgeous colour that rolls over the landscape from sunrise to sunset and in the hush of the moonlit night disappears before the silver radiance of the nascent orb 
to hear the fall of the mountain streams and to catch the breath of the fragrant wind that comes from the pine forest loaded with fragrance and freshness and subtle odors traversing colorado in the neighborhood of the plate river she tells us that she rode up one great ascent where hills were tumbled about confusedly and suddenly across the broad ravine above the sunny grass and the deep green pines rose in glowing and shaded red against the glittering blue heaven a magnificent and unearthly range of mountains as shapely as could be seen rising into colossal points cleft by deep blue ravines broken up into shark's teeth with gigantic knobs and pinnacles rising from their inaccessible sides very fair to look upon a glowing heavenly unforgettable sight and only four miles off mountains they looked not of this earth but such as one sees in dreams alone the blessed ranges of the land which is very far off they were more brilliant than those incredible colors in which painters array the fiery hills of moab and the desert and one could not believe them for ever uninhabited for on them rose as in the east the similitude of stately fortresses not the gray castellated towers of feudal europe but gay massive saracenic architecture the outgrowth of the solid rock they were vast ranges apparently of enormous height their color indescribable deepest and reddest near the pine draped bases then gradually softening into wonderful tenderness till the highest summits rose all flushed and with an illusion of transparency so that one might believe that they were taking on the hue of sunset below these lay broken ravines of fantastic rocks cleft and canyoned by the river with a tender unearthly light over all the apparent warmth of a glowing clime while i on the north side was in the shadow among the pure unsullied snow with us the damp the chill the gloom with them the sunset's rosy bloom the dimness of earth with me the light of heaven with them here again worship seemed the only attitude for a human spirit and the question was ever present lord what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him i rode up and down hills laboriously in snowdrifts getting off often to ease my faithful birdie by walking down ice-clad slopes stopping constantly to feast my eyes upon that changeless glory always seeing some new ravine with its depths of color or miraculous brilliancy of red or fantasy of form then below where the trail was looked into a deep canyon where there was scarcely room for it and the river there was a beauty of another kind in solemn gloom there the stream curved and twisted marvelously widening into shallows narrowing into deep boiling eddies with pyramidal firs and a beautiful silver spruce fringing its banks and often falling across it in artistic grace the gloom chill and deep with only now and then a light trickling through the pines upon the cold snow when suddenly turning round i saw behind as if in the glory of an eternal sunset those flaming and fantastic peaks the effect of the combination of winter and summer was singular the trail rose on the north side the whole time and the snow lay deep and pure white while not a wreath of it lay on the south side where abundant lawns basked in the warm sun there is something in the majesty of mountain scenery in the lofty peaks the shadowy ravines and the tremendous precipices in the glow and light and glory which the sun pours out upon the heights and the strange gloom and haunted darkness which sleep in the mysterious depths that deeply impresses the imagination and the thoughts of men and appeals to that higher purer nature which too often lies dormant in us however unmoved we may be by the ordinary sights and sounds which fill up the landscapes we are most of us hushed and breathless among the mountains mutely acknowledging the manifestations of a presence and a power which are not of the earth earthy as the rose of dawn blushes on each waving crest in the birth hour of the day or the purple splendor invests them in regal robes when the sun goes down 
they seem to reveal to us a vision of the other world those changing lights that fall upon them are surely the passing gleams of wings of angels those mystic voices that linger among their echoes what can they be but the divine chords of that glorious harmony which forever goes up around the great white throne let us now glance at one or two of the personal experiences of miss bird who we need hardly say carried in her bosom a man's heart and was never wanting in courage or resolution among the rocky mountains one sometimes meets with strange companions and on her ride from hall's gulch to deer valley miss bird was joined by a horseman who would have made a fine hero of melodrama a picturesque figure he looked on his good horse with his long fair curls drooping from under a big slouch hat almost to his waist a fine beard good blue eyes a ruddy complexion a frank expression of countenance and a courteous respectful bearing he wore a hunter's buckskin suit ornamented with beads and a pair of very big brass spurs his saddle was elaborately ornamented what chiefly drew attention in his equipment was the number of weapons hung about him he was a small arsenal in himself two revolvers and a knife were thrust into his belt and across his back was slung a carbine in addition he had a rifle resting on his saddle and a pair of pistols in the holsters this martial rider was comanche bill whom gossip described as one of the most notorious desperadoes of the rocky mountains and the greatest indian exterminator on the frontier his father and family had been massacred at spirit lake by the hands of indians who carried away his sister a child of eleven since then he had mainly devoted himself to the double task of revenging the victims and searching for this missing sister riding from golden city a place which every day and every hour gave the lie to its gorgeous name miss bird lost her way on the prairie a teamster bade her go forward to a place where three tracks would be seen and then to take the best travelled one steering all the time by the north star following his directions she came to tracks but it was then so dark she could see nothing and soon the darkness so increased that she could not see even her horse's ears and was lost and benighted hour after hour our heroine for a lady who crosses the rocky mountains alone may surely claim the title rode onward in the darkness and solitude the prairie sweeping all around her and a firmament of frosty stars glittering overhead at intervals might be heard the howl of the prairie wolf and the occasional lowing of cattle gave her hope of the neighbourhood of man but there was nothing but the wild and lonely plain and she felt a keen desire to see a light or hear a voice the solitude was so oppressive it was very cold and a hard frost lay on the ground at last however she heard the bark of a dog and then the too common sound of a man swearing she saw a light and in another minute found herself at a large house eleven miles from denver where a hospitable reception cheered the belated traveller here is another and more startling episode which occurred during her journey from esteo park to longmount a ride of one hundred miles on a bitter cold december morning we all got up before daybreak on tuesday and breakfasted at seven i took only two pounds of luggage some raisins the mail bag and an additional blanket under my saddle the purple sun rose in front had i known what made it purple i should certainly have gone no farther these clouds the morning mist as i supposed lifted themselves up rose lighted showing the sun's disk as purple as one of the jars in a chemist's window and having permitted this glimpse of their king came down again as a dense mist the wind chopped round and the mist began to freeze hard soon birdie and myself were a mass of acicular crystals it was a true easterly fog i galloped on hoping to get through it unable to see a yard before me but it thickened and i was obliged to subside into a jog trot as i rode on about four miles from the cabin a human figure looking gigantic like the spectre of the brocken with long hair white as snow appeared close to me 
and at the same moment there was the flash of a pistol close to my ear, and I recognized Mountain Jim, frozen from head to foot, looking a century old with his snowy hair. It was ugly altogether, certainly a desperado's grim jest, and it was best to accept it as such, though I had just cause for displeasure. He stormed and scolded, dragged me off the pony, for my hands and feet were numb with cold, took the bridle, and went off at a rapid stride, so that I had to run to keep them in sight in the darkness, for we were off the road in a thicket of scrub, looking like white branch coral, I know not where. Then we came suddenly on his cabin, and the ruffian insisted on my going in, and he made a good fire, and heated some coffee, raging all the time. He took me back to the track, and the interview, which began with a pistol shot, ended quite pleasantly. It was an eerie ride, one not to be forgotten, though there was no danger. It would be difficult to point out any deficiency on Miss Bird's part in those qualifications which constitute a great traveller. Physically as well as mentally she seems to have proved herself the equal of men. Endurance, courage, promptitude, decision, the capacity for quiet and accurate observation, the ready adaptability to circumstances, she possessed all these high virtues. Her ride in the Rocky Mountains shows what may be accomplished by a brave, strong woman under very difficult conditions. In one respect, perhaps, her sex was an advantage. It appears to have ensured her a uniform courtesy of treatment and cordiality of reception in the most remote places and among the wildest and most reckless men. But it is obvious that in other respects it must frequently have been found an inconvenience and even a danger, had it not been for her true patience, her unfailing good humour, and her indomitable pluck. Miss Bird is also the author of a charming book on Hawaii, and a not less charming record of her wanderings in Unbeaten Tracks in Japan. End of section 21。Section 22 of Celebrated Women Travelers of the 19th Century。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Women Travelers of the 19th Century by W. H. Davenport Adams. Section 22, Miss Isabella Bird, Part 2. Time was, and not so very long ago, when a visit to the wilds of Patagonia on the part of an English lady would have been regarded as a wonderful achievement. Nowadays it excites but little comment. The interest excited by Lady Florence Dixie's book, Across Patagonia, was the legitimate interest inspired by her fresh and lively description of unexplored and untrodden ground, and not the idle curiosity which a sensational achievement sometimes excites. If one lady can make a voyage round the world, why should not another ride across Patagonia? To our grandmothers, a French or Italian tour was an event of novelty and importance. But nous avons change tout cela. It is quite understood that no terra incognita exists into which our female travellers would fear to penetrate. Lady Florence Dixie frankly tells us her reason for venturing into Patagonia, and no doubt it is the reason which has actuated many of her sisters in their world wanderings. She went to an outlandish place so many miles away, as her friends called it, precisely because it was an outlandish place and so far away. She adds, Palled for the moment with civilization and its surroundings, I wanted to escape somewhere where I might be as far removed from them as possible. Many of my readers have doubtless felt the dissatisfaction with oneself and everybody else that comes over one at times in the midst of the pleasures of life, when one wearies of the shallow artificiality of modern existence, when what was once excitement has become so no longer, and a longing grows up within one to taste a more vigorous unction than that afforded by the monotonous round of society's so-called pleasures. In this state of mind, she looked round for some country that would satisfy her requirements, and decided upon Patagonia, because nowhere else could she find an area of 100,000 square miles for equestrian exercise, where one would be free from the presence of savage tribes and obnoxious animals, 
as well as from the persecution of morning calls, invitations, garden parties, telegrams, letters, and all other resources of civilization. To these attractions was added the thought, always alluring to an active mind, that there she would be able to penetrate into vast wilds, untrod as yet by the foot of man. Scenes of infinite beauty and grandeur might be lying hidden in the silent solitude of the mountains which bound the barren plains of the Pampas, into whose mysterious recesses no one as yet had ever ventured, and I was to be the first to behold them. An egotistical pleasure, it is true, but the idea had a great charm for me, as it has had for many others. Accompanied by her husband, brothers, and three friends, Lady Florence left Liverpool on the 11th December, 1878. Early in January, they reached Rio de Janeiro, of which she furnishes a pleasantly graphic sketch that gives a true idea of her descriptive powers. Nowhere, she says, have the rugged and the tender, the wild and the soft, been blended into such exquisite union as at Rio, and it is this quality of unrivaled contrasts that, to my mind, gives to that scenery its charm of unsurpassed loveliness. Nowhere else is there such audacity, such fierceness even of outline, coupled with such multiform splendor of color, such fairy-like delicacy of detail. As a precious jewel is encrusted by the coarse rock, the smiling bay lies encircled by frowning mountains of colossal proportions and the most capricious shapes. In the production of this work, the most opposite powers of nature have been laid under contribution. The awful work of the volcano, the immense boulders of rock which lie piled up to the clouds in irregular masses, have been clothed in a brilliant web of tropical vegetation, purple and green, sunshine and mist. Here nature revels in manifold creation. Life multiplies itself a millionfold, the soil bursts with exuberance of fertility, and the profusion of vegetable and animal life beggars description. Every tree is clothed with a thousand luxuriant creepers, purple and scarlet blossomed, they, in their turn, support myriads of lichens and other verdant parasites. The plants shoot up with marvelous rapidity and glitter with flowers of the rarest hues and shapes, or bear quantities of luscious fruit, pleasant to the eye and sweet to the taste. The air resounds with the hum of insect life. Through the bright green leaves of the banana skim the sparkling hummingbirds, and gorgeous butterflies of enormous size float glowing with every color of the rainbow on the flower-scented breezes. But all over this beauty, over the luxuriance of vegetation, over the softness of the tropical air, over the splendor of the sunshine, over the perfume of the flowers, pestilence has cast her fatal miasmas, and, like the sword of Damocles, the yellow fever hangs threateningly over the heads of those who dwell among these lovely scenes. After touching at Montevideo, Lady Florence Dixie's party proceeded southwards towards the Straits of Magellan and landed at Sandy Point, a settlement belonging to the Chileans, who call it La Colonia de Magellanes. Here they procured horses and mules and four guides and, having completed all the necessary arrangements, rode along the shore of the famous strait to Cape Negro. On the opposite side they could distinctly see the Tierra del Fuego, and at different points tall columns of smoke rising up into the still air denoted the presence of native encampments. Just as Magellan had seen them four centuries ago, when he gave to the island on that account the name it still bears. At last they started into the interior and began their exploration of the wide region of the Pampas. Game was plentiful, and the fowling pieces of the party brought down numerous victims. As they advanced, they came into occasional contact with the Patagonians, and her observations of their physical character are important and valuable in relation to the marvelous accounts which we find in the old voyagers. I was not so much struck by their height, she says, as by their extraordinary development of chest and muscle. As regards their stature, I do not think the average height of the men exceeded six feet, and, as my husband stands six feet two inches, I had a favorable opportunity for forming an accurate estimate. One or two there were, certainly, who towered far above him, but these were exceptions. The women were mostly of the ordinary height, though I noticed one who must have been quite six feet, if not more. Lady Florence speaks of the features of the purebred Tualchi, or Patagonian Aboriginal, as extremely regular, and by no means unpleasant to look at. 
The nose is generally aquiline, the mouth well shaped and beautified by the whitest of teeth, the expression of the eye intelligent, while the form of the whole head indicates the possession of considerable mental capabilities. But such is not the case with the Tawalchis, in whose veins is a mixture of Fuegian or Araucanian blood. Of these latter, the flat noses, oblique eyes, and badly proportioned figures excite disgust, and they are as different from a purebred Tawalchi as a racer is from an ordinary cart horse. Their long coarse hair is worn parted in the middle and is prevented from falling over their faces by means of a handkerchief, or a fillet of some kind, bound round the forehead. They suffer no hair to grow on the face, and some extract even their eyebrows. Their dress is simple, consisting of a chirupa, or a piece of cloth, round the loins, and the indispensable guanaco cape, which is hung loosely over the shoulders and held round the body by the hand, though it would obviously seem more convenient to have it secured round the waist with a belt of some kind. Their horsehide boots are only worn for reasons of economy when hunting. The women dress like the men except as regards the chiripa, instead of which they wear a loose kind of gown beneath the cape, which they fasten at the neck with a silver brooch or pin. The children are allowed to run about naked till they are five or six years old, and are then dressed like their elders. Partly for ornament, partly also as a means of protection against the wind, a great many Indians paint their faces, their favorite color, as far as I could see, being red, though one or two, I observed, had given the preference to a mixture of that color with black, a very diabolical appearance being the result of this combination. We cannot follow Lady Florence Dixie through all her Patagonian experiences, which, in their infinite variety, must have fully satisfied her craving for new things. She hunted pumas, ostriches, guanacos, witnessed the wild and wayward movements of the wild horses on the plains, which for ages have belonged unto them, suffered from the burden of the heat and attacks of the gnats, explored the recesses of the cordilleras, and came upon a broad and beautiful lake on which, in all probability, no human eye before had ever looked, until at last she grew weary of adventure, and she and her companions turned their faces once more towards the commonplace comforts of civilization. All this and more she tells with much animation, quite unaffectedly, and in a style which, if marked by no special literary merit, is always clear and vigorous. One can do much worse than while away an hour by the fireside with Lady Florence Dixie's book in one's hand. One will close it with the conviction that the writer is a courageous, lively, and intelligent woman who can ride across country with a firm hand and hold her own in any dangerous or novel position. End of section 22. Recording by Dovey Cross. Taos, New Mexico. Section 23 of Celebrated Women Travelers of the 19th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Celebrated Women Travelers of the 19th Century by W. H. Davenport Adams Section 23, Miss Isabella Bird, Part 3 Not inferior to her in courage and endurance, and her superior in literary qualifications, is Miss Gordon Cumming, who, I think, among female travelers, has no rival except Ida Pfeiffer. The worthy representative of a name famous in the annals of adventure and enterprise, she has put a girdle round about the world with unfailing ardor, and plunged into the remote and almost inaccessible regions of the great Asiatic tableland. Her first book, From the Hebrides to the Himalayas, attracted a great deal of attention by the freshness of its sketches, the grace of its style, the unconventionality of its treatment, and by the space which its author devoted to popular superstitions and antiquities. Her picture of life in Tibet, of the scenery of the Himalayas, of the manners and customs of the Indian people, of Benares and Hurdvar and Agra, were all so bright and clear as to indicate the pencil of no ordinary artist. Miss Gordon Cumming next betook herself to the Pacific and spent two years at home in Fiji, two years which she utilized in the collection of much interesting material. She was preparing in 1880 to return to England when an opportunity was offered to her of effecting that return in a manner which could not but be delightful to a lady of adventurous disposition, with a proper scorn for social Mrs. Grundyism. A French man-of-war, 
the Seigneule, which was carrying a Roman Catholic bishop on a cruise round his Oceanic diocese, arrived at Lavaca, and its officers, making the acquaintance of Miss Cumming, courteously invited her to accompany them on the remainder of their cruise. There was a delightful originality in the invitation, and no less delightful originality in the acceptance of it. The French officers fitted up a pretty little cabin for her accommodation, and without more ado she took up her quarters on board the Seigneule, with no other escort or chaperonage than that of the good bishop. From Fiji, the Seigneule proceeded to Tonga, in the Friendly Islands, where, in the usages of the population and in the insular antiquities, Miss Cumming found much to interest her and her readers. As might be expected, the old picturesqueness of the native life is fast disappearing under the pressure of Western civilization, and we have reason to be thankful to those travelers who do their best to catch its waning features and transfer them as faithfully as may be to the printed page. The chief archaeological curiosities here are the tombs of the old Tongan kings, Cyclopean monuments built up of huge volcanic blocks, which seem to have been brought from the Wallace group of islands in open canoes, and erected on their present site with an immense expenditure of human labor. Scarcely less remarkable is the great solitary dolmen, which still exists intact, though of its origin nothing is known, even in tradition. But that it marks the last resting place of some great chief or hero may be inferred from the fact that until within the last few years an immense kana tent stood upon the transverse capstone of the dolmen, and that feasts were celebrated on the spot. As Miss Cummings reminds, similar celebrations take place in many parts of Britain and Brittany, at the Stones, to the present day. From Tonga, Miss Cumming was conveyed to Samoa, where she was very hospitably received by the Samoan notables, and might have enjoyed herself greatly but for the civil war in which the group is always plunged. It is to the credit of the inhabitants, however, that they agree to abstain from fighting on at least one day of the week. In their manners and customs, they retain more of the primitive simplicity than is found nowadays in most of the Polynesian islands. Her descriptions of Tahiti, the Eden of the Pacific, are not less glowing than those of her predecessors, from Wallace and Bougainville down to the Earl and the Doctor. They are full of warm, rich color, as might have been expected from one who is an artist as well as an author, and set before us such a succession of vivid and enchanting landscapes as hardly any other portion of this wide, wide world can parallel, for with the bold majesty of alpine peaks is combined the luxuriant grace of tropical forests, and valleys as beautiful as that of Tempe open out upon a boundless ocean as blue as the sky at glasses. Add to this that the vegetation has a charm of its own, the feathery palm and the breadfruit tree lending it quite a distinctive character. Here is a vignette which will give the reader some notion of this enchanting Tahitian scenery. We rode along the green glades, through the usual successions of glorious foliage, groves of magnificent breadfruit trees indigenous to those isles, next a clump of noble mango trees recently imported but now quite at home, then a group of tall palms or a long avenue of gigantic bananas, their leaves sometimes twelve feet long, meeting over our heads. Then came patches of sugar or Indian corn, and next a plantation of vanilla, trained to climb over closely planted tall coffee, or else over vermilion bushes. Sometimes it is planted without more ado at the root of pruned guava bushes. These grow wild over the whole country, loaded with large, excellent fruit, and moreover supply the whole fuel of the isles and good food for cattle. Amidst all this wealth of food-producing vegetation, I sometimes looked in vain, for any trees that were merely ornamental, and literally there were only the yellow hibiscus, which yields a useful fiber, and the candle nut, covered with clusters of white blossoms, somewhat resembling white lilac, and bearing nuts with oily kernels, whence the tree derives its name. Here is a larger picture, taken on one of the smaller islands of the Society Archipelago. I fear no description can possibly convey to your mind a true picture of the lovely woods through which we wander just where fancy leads us, knowing that no hurtful creature of any sort lurks among the mossy rocks or in the rich undergrowth of ferns. Here and there we come on patches of soft green turf, delightfully suggestive of rest, beneath the broad shadow of some great tree with buttressed roots, but more often the broken rays of sunlight gleam in ten thousand reflected lights, dancing and glancing as they shimmer on glossy leaves of every form and shade, 
from the huge silky leaves of the wild plantain or the giant arum to the waving palm fronds which are so rarely at rest but flash and gleam like polished swords as they bend and twist with every breath of air it has just occurred to me that probably you have no very distinct idea of the shape of a cocoa palm leaf which does not bear the slightest resemblance to the palmettes in the greenhouses it consists of a strong mid-rib about eight feet long which at the end next to the tree spreads out very much as your two clenched fists placed side by side do from your wrists the other end tapers to a point for a space of about two feet the stalk is bare then along the remaining six feet a regiment of short swords graduated from two feet to eighteen inches in length are set close together on each side of the midrib of course the faintest stir of the leaf causes these multitudinous swordlets to flash in the sunlight hence the continual effect of glittering light a little lower than these tall queens of the coral isles rise fairy-like canopies of graceful tree ferns often festooned with most delicate lianas and there are places where not these only but the larger trees are literally matted together by the dense growth of the beautiful large-leaved white convolvulus or the smaller lilac ipomea which twines round the tall stems of the palms and overspreads the light fronds like some green waterfall many of the larger trees are clothed with parasitic ferns huge bird's nest ferns grow in the forks of the branches as do various orchids the dainty children of the mist so that the stems are well nigh as green as everything else in that wilderness of lovely forms it is a very inanimate paradise however i rarely see any birds or butterflies only a few lizards and an occasional dragonfly and the voice of singing birds such as gladden our hearts in humble english woods is here mute so we have at least this compensation for the lack of all the wild luxuriance which here is so fascinating from miss cummings animated pages we might continue to borrow with advantage to our readers but we must rest satisfied with one more picture and this shall be a view of the tahitian marketplace at papete passing by roads which are called streets but are rather shady bowers of yellow hibiscus and breadfruit trees i entered the covered marketplace where was assembled as gay a throng as you could wish to see many of them dressed in flowing robes of the very brightest colours for the people here assembled are chiefly le peuple whose days of ceremonial mourning for their good old queen are drawing to a close so the long tresses of glossy black hair hitherto so carefully hidden within their jaunty little sailor hats are now again suffered to hang at full length in two silky plaits and hair and hats are wreathed with bright fragrant flowers of double cape jessamine orange blossom scarlet hibiscus or oleander many wear a delicate white jessamine star in the ear in place of an earring the people here are not so winsome as those in remoter districts too much contact with shipping and grog shops has of course gone far to deteriorate them and take off the freshness of life but a south sea crowd is always made up of groups pleasant to the eye and a party of girls dressed in long graceful sacks of pale sea green or delicate pink pure white or bright crimson chatting and laughing as they roll up minute fragments of tobacco in strips of pandemio or banana to supply the inevitable cigarette is always attractive the men all wear pouffs of manchester cotton stuff prepared expressly for these aisles and of the most wonderful patterns those most in favour are bright crimson with a large white pattern perhaps groups of red crowns on circles of white arranged on a scarlet ground or else rows of white crowns alternating with groups of stars a dark blue ground with circles and crosses in bright yellow or scarlet with yellow anchors and circles also find great favour and though they certainly sound loud when thus described they are singularly effective it is wonderful what a variety of patterns can be produced not one of which has ever been seen in england with these the men wear white shirts and sailors hats with bright coloured silk handkerchiefs tied over them and knotted on the ear or else a gay garland every one brings to the morning market whatever he happens to have for sale some days he has a large stock in trade sometimes next to nothing but be it little or be it much he divides it into two lots and slings his parcels or baskets from a light bamboo pole which rests across his shoulder and light as it is often weighs more than the trifles suspended from it 
perhaps a few shrimps in a green leaf are slung from one end and a lobster from the other, or it may be a tiny basket of new-laid eggs balanced by half a dozen silvery fishes. But often the burden is so heavy that the pole bends with the weight of perhaps two huge bunches of mountain bananas, and you think how that poor fellow's shoulder must have ached as he carried his spoil down the steep mountain path from the cleft in the rugged rock where the faces had contrived to take root. These resemble bunches of gigantic golden plums. As a bit of color, they are glorious, but as a vegetable, I cannot learn to like them, which is perhaps as well, as the native proverb says that the foreigner who does appreciate faces can never stay away from Tahiti. As you enter the cool, shady market, you see hundreds of those golden clusters hanging from ropes stretched across the building, and great bunches of mangoes and oranges. These last lie heaped in baskets among cool green leaves. Sometimes a whole laden bough has been recklessly cut off. Pineapples, breadfruit, coconut, all are there, and baskets of scarlet tomatoes, suggestive of cool salads. End of section 23 Recording by Debbie Cross, Taos, New Mexico. Section 25 of Celebrated Women Travelers of the 19th Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Schmidt. Celebrated Women Travellers of the Nineteenth Century by W. H. Davenport Adams, Section 25 Florence and Rosamond Hill, Lady Barker, Magyarland We must pass over, with a word of allusion, Mrs. McQuoid's entertaining records of her tours in Normandy and Brittany and the Ardennes, where she found the scenery which gives so much picturesqueness of character to some of her best fictions nor can we undertake to dwell on Mrs. Mullard's between the Amazon and the Andes, though it deals with a region not by any means familiarly known even to geographers, and is undoubtedly a valuable addition to the literature of South American travel. Mrs. Minto Elliot has written two pleasant volumes descriptive of the experiences of An Idle Woman in Sicily, but they contain nothing very new or striking. Of higher value is Lady Duffer's Hardy's Tour in America, and still higher value, Lady Anne Blunt's Pilgrimage to Night. Mrs. T. F. Hughes embodies much curious and suggestive information in her account of A Residence in China. Miss Gertrude Ford's Ladies' Tour in Corsica is an interesting supplement to previous works on that romantic island. What we saw in Australia is the journal of two sisters, Florence and Rosamond Hill, who, without servants or escort, accomplished the voyage to the great island continent, visited Adelaide, Melbourne and Sydney, with all the remarkable places in the vicinity of each, made a trip to Tasmania and returned home by way of Bombay, Egypt and Italy. We encountered, they say, no gales of any severity, have to record no alarming adventures and returned to England after sixteen months' absence, convinced by experience that to persons of average health and strength the difficulties of such a journey exist only in the imagination. It may, we feel sure, be accomplished with ease and comfort by ladies unprovided with servants or escort. The sisters were insatiable in the pursuit of information, and their book affords a tolerably comprehensive view of the economic and social conditions of the Australian colonies. Thus we are told that the number of post offices throughout South Australia is 348, employing 336 officials, besides 56 others who are also engaged in telegraph work. Mails are dispatched by every steamer to Melbourne and three times weekly overland, the latter journey occupying 96 hours. Mail omnibuses convey the country letters where the roads are good, which is the case for many miles out of town, in numerous directions. For more distant places, coaches are used, much resembling a box hung high upon four wheels. All the parts are very strong, and leathern curtains over the windows largely take the place of glass, the presence of which is undesirable in a breakdown or rollover. The interior is provided with straps to be clung to by the unhappy passengers as the vehicle pursues its bumping way. Orphan schools, institutes, reformatories, cabs, museums, hospitals, prisons, 
all attracted the attention of the two travellers, who are much to be commended for their scrupulous attention to accuracy, but they did not neglect the various aspects of Australian scenery, so far as they came within their purview, they did not penetrate into the interior, and their range was not very wide or novel, but what they saw they describe with characteristic and painstaking fidelity. Here is their description of Govertsleep, a remarkable valley, one of the lions of New South Wales, about five miles from Mount Victoria. We followed for a considerable distance the high road to Bathurst, cut through the bush. The mass of gum trees on either side looked beautiful in their fresh summer foliage. The young shoots are crimson, and when seen against the blue sky, the sunshine gleaming through them, the tree seems covered with gorgeous blossom. Leaving the road, we turned into the scrub, and drove over a sandy soil among small gum trees and smaller scrub. When at length we quitted the carriage and had followed our guide for a short distance, we suddenly came upon what appeared to be an enormous rift in the ground, which yawned beneath our feet. Far below was an undulating mass of foliage, the tops of a forest of gum trees which covered the whole bed of the valley. Vast was the height from which we looked down, so that the trees had the appearance of perfect stillness, forming in the glorious sunshine a lovely crimson-tinted carpet, the shadows cast upon them by the clouds giving continual variety to the colouring. At the upper end of the valley, towards the west, the cliffs on either side were somewhat depressed. Here a streamlet fell over the rocks, a sheer descent of 1,200 feet, but so gentle its fall appeared as we watched it obliquely across the valley that the water looked like marabou feathers softly floating downwards. Towards the bottom it vanished from our sight among large stones, and if in that dry season the stream made further progress, its course was hidden by the forest at its feet. Turning towards the south, the brown, grey and yellow rocks rose perpendicularly, the sunshine softening them into a delicious harmony of colour, and so great was the width of the valley that a waterfall on the opposite cliff looked, from where we stood, like a silver thread against its side. Beyond, the valley bore away in a southerly direction until it was closed in by ranges of overlapping hills of lovely blue, indigo or cobalt, as the blaze of the sun or the shadow of the clouds fell upon them. But for the faint murmur caused either by the falling of the water or the wind among the trees, the place was silent, and it was almost devoid of animal life. A bird or two overhead, and the noiseless lizards, who ran over our dresses as we attempted to sketch the scene, represented the whole animal life within sight or hearing. Lady Barker is a practised writer, and a good deal of literary skill is shown in her books of travel, Station Life in New Zealand, and a year's housekeeping in South Africa. Pleasanter reading one could hardly wish for. The sketches are vivid and the observations judicious. The style is fluent and flavoured by a genial and unobtrusive humour. Lady Barker looks at things, of course, with a woman's eye, and this womanliness is one of the charms of her books. She sees so much that no man would ever have seen, and sees it all in the light so different from that in which men would have seen it. To our knowledge of South Africa, Lady Barker has unquestionably made a very real and interesting contribution. She and her husband, who had been appointed to an official position of importance in Natal, arrived at Cape Town in October 1875, and after a brief rest, steamed along the coast to the little port of East London. Thence they proceeded to Port Durban, where they disembarked and, in wagons drawn by mules, jolted over the fifty-two miles that lie between Port Durban and their place of destination, Maritzburg. During her residence there, she made good use of her time and opportunities, studying the native ways and usages, sketching Zulus and Kafirs, interviewing witches and witch-finders, exploring the scenery of the interior, and accomplishing an expedition into the bush, the result being a book of some 320 pages, in which not one is dull or unreadable. Of her lightness and firmness of touch, we can give but one specimen, a sketch of a kaffir bride. She was exceedingly smart, and had one of the prettiest faces imaginable. The regular features, oval face, dazzling teeth, and charming expression, were not a bit disfigured by her jet-black skin. Her hair was drawn straight up from her head like a tiara, 
stained red, and ornamented with a profusion of bone skewers, a tuft of feathers being stuck coquettishly over one ear, and a band of bead embroidery, studded with brass-headed nails, worn like a fillet, where the hair grew low on the forehead. She had a kilt, or series of aprons, rather, of lynx skins, a sort of bodice of calfskin, and over her shoulders, arranged with ineffable grace, a gay table-cover. Then there were strings of beads on her pretty, shapely throat and arms, and a bright scarlet ribbon tied tightly around each ankle. All the rest of the party seemed immensely proud of this young person, and were very anxious to put her forward in every way. Indeed, all the other women, mostly hard-working, hard-featured matrons, prematurely aged, took no more part in the visit than the chorus of a Greek play, always excepting the old Luduna, or headman of the village, who came as escort and in charge of the whole party. This was a most garrulous and amusing individual, full of reminiscences and anecdotes of his fighting days. He was rather more frank than most warriors, who shoulder their crutch and show how fields are won. For the usual end of his battle stories was a naive confession. And then I thought I should be killed, and so I ran away. He and I used up a great many interpreters in the course of the visit, for he wearied every one out, and nothing made him so angry as any attempt to condense his conversation in translating it to me. But he was great fun, polite as became an old soldier, full of compliments and assurances that, now the happiest day of his life having come, he desired to live no longer, but was ready for death. The visit took place on the shady side of the veranda, and thither I brought a large musical box, and set it down on the ground to play. Never was there such a success. In a moment they were all down on their knees before it, listening with rapt delight, the old man telling them the music was caused by very little people inside the box, who were obliged to do exactly as I bade them. They were in a perfect ecstasy of delight for ever so long, retreating rapidly, however, to a distance, whenever I wounded up. The old Luduna took snuff copiously all the time, and made me affectionate speeches, which resulted in the gift of an old great coat, which he assured me he never would live to wear out, because he was quite in a hurry to die and go to the white man's land, now that he had seen me. Of all the European countries, Hungary, we think, is the one least represented in our English literature of travel, though to Englishmen it might seem to have peculiar attractions, in virtue of its romantic scenery, its historical associations, and the brave, independent, and vigorous character of its inhabitants. Its history is that of Greece, says a German writer. The same heroism lives within its borders, the names of its heroes alone have changed. We turn, therefore, with interest, while writing these last pages, to Magyarland, a lady's narrative of travels through the highlands and lowlands of Hungary. She entered Hungary on the side of its majestic Aljola, or plains, which extend over an area of 5,400 square miles, and in some places are inhospitable sandy wastes, in some highly cultivated, in others green and flowery pastures, where large herds of horses and cattle roam unfettered. These plains are inhabited by various races, the Magyars, who are the dominant people, the Wallachs, who dwell in the easternmost districts, the Germans, Saxons and Sheklas, Southwest of the Carpathians live the Slovaks, in Croatia and Serbia the Croat Serbs, and in the provinces southeast of the Carpathians are the Rusniaks or Ruthenians. About these races and their manners and customs, about Budapest and Semlin, and the ice caves of the snowy Tabri, the wines of Tokai, and the scenery of Romania, our authoress has much to say with equal liveliness and grace. End of section 25. End of The Celebrated Women Travelers of the 19th Century by W. H. Davenport Adams.